Infamous Relations, a Pride and Prejudice What If Tale by Catherine Bilson. Narrated by Catherine Bilson. Prelude. When I first saw the movie Sliding Doors, I was struck by the concept that just one small thing could change everything that happens from that point onwards. This concept is never more apparent than when applied by the many Jane Austen fan writers who examine Pride and Prejudice and ask the question, But what if? This is one of those what if stories. An inconveniently timed thunderstorm changes everything for Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy. Mr. Collins proves to be far worse than Elizabeth could ever have imagined, and Darcy is forced to confront both his feelings for her and his own flaws of character head Chapter on. One. Hunsford, Kent. I pray you will do me the courtesy of reading this letter. Before she could protest that she could not possibly accept any letter from him, the impropriety of such an action, he had stuffed it into her hand. Elizabeth stared at the folded paper in her hand, her name written clearly on the outside in Mr. Darcy's strong hand. She looked up to speak to him, to tell him that she could not accept such a letter, but his back was already retreating between the trees of the grove. Biting her lip, she looked back at the letter again. "'I dare say I may as well read it as not,' she muttered, and broke the seal with fingers that, she was surprised to note, trembled slightly. At that very instant... She was startled by a rumble of thunder. Looking up, she saw a line of black storm clouds advancing from the south, blotting out the fine day. The clouds were moving quickly, but she estimated that, if she hurried, she might just make it back to the safety of the parsonage before the storm broke. Tucking the as yet unread letter inside her spencer to keep it dry, she began to walk at her swiftest pace back along the path towards the parsonage. Excellent walker that she was, Elizabeth was still not fast enough to entirely beat the storm. Fat raindrops were falling from the sky before the parsonage was even in sight, and by the time she arrived at the gate, her spencer was very damp and her skirts muddied. Hurrying up the path as the rain beat down ever harder, Elizabeth rushed inside and almost collided with her cousin. "'Cousin Elizabeth!' Mr Collins stepped back, startled. "'Whatever are you doing? I thought you'd gone with Charlotte and Maria to visit Mrs Garman.' "'Surely they're not with you in the rain?' "'No, sir, I went out for a walk. "'I was not aware that they planned to go out,' Elizabeth replied, "'brushing past him and heading for the parlour, "'where she hoped to find a fire burning. "'She was quite wet, and her teeth were beginning to chatter. "'Tugging at the soggy ribbons of her bonnet, "'she finally managed to yank it off "'and dropped it on the table before approaching the fire. "'You must take more care, cousin,' Mr Collins said unctuously. "'Had you only asked me before going out,' I could have told you that there would likely be a storm this morning. Indeed, Lady Catherine predicted it yesterday at dinner, which you sadly missed. Elizabeth gritted her teeth, trying to ignore his foolish wittering. Unbuttoning her soaked spencer, she struggled to peel the sodden fabric off over her wet arms, not noticing for a moment the folded paper which fell to the floor. Mr Collins glanced down, frowning. He recognised the seal on the back instantly. Had Lady Catherine not shown him several letters from her nephew? and stooped to pick it up. "'How came you by this, Cousin Elizabeth? "'Did Mr Darcy drop it somewhere?' "'Turning over, he looked at the direction on the front. "'Miss Elizabeth Bennet. "'You trollop! "'Mr Collins!' "'Elizabeth gasped in horror, "'recoiling as she saw the letter in his hand. "'Lady Catherine warned me. "'Oh, she saw you casting your allurements his way. "'Mr Collins,' she said, have an eye to your cousin. She seeks to tempt good men from their duty. Mr. Collins, I have not... You will be silent, he thundered, towering over her. He was a tall, solid man, and the small, lightly built Elizabeth, who until that moment had never been intimidated in her life, was suddenly frightened that he would strike her. She shrank away. I knew it, Longbourn, when you refused me, dragging your tail like a bitch in heat. And then refusing me to increase my ardour, oh yes, but I was wise to your game. I chose a good and virtuous woman instead, and now you've turned your sights on a bigger prize. Well, you shall not have him. He would never marry you, Mr Collins sneered. The very fact that he writes to you should tell you that. A house in London or a cottage on his estate is all Mr Darcy or any other decent man would offer you. Pressed against the wall, shaking her head in a horrified, speechless denial, Elizabeth found her whole body trembling before her cousin's senseless rage as he paced before her. Well, Mr Collins turned around and stared at her. And 
then he paused, seemingly struck by something. Elizabeth looked around to see what had caught his attention. Checking the direction of his gaze, she realised that it was fixed on her bosom, heaving rapidly beneath the thin, damp bodice of her gown with her panicky, frightened breath. No! was all she had time to gasp before he was on her. Why should you give so freely to him that which you deny me? was all Mr Collins said before his mouth mashed down on hers, his hands tearing at her dress. Just a little taste, he panted, his breath hot against her cheek as Elizabeth fought to get away, snapping her head from side to side, unable to scream as she could not get her breath. He was crushing her against the wall, his hands brutally rough on her breasts, his leg forcing in between hers and rubbing hard at her. You can stay at Longbourn. We can all live there happily together, Mr Collins groaned, grinding his hips against her, lost in a sick fantasy. Elizabeth finally saw her chance and managed to jam one hand up hard under his chin, snapping his head back. He took his weight off her for the merest moment and she stamped on his foot. Ouch! What was that for? Elizabeth! He took a step back and she ran, out of the room, out of the house, going she knew not where, uncaring of the rain still pouring down. She clutched her torn bodice to her and ran until her breath gave out. Finally dropping to her knees, unable to run another step, she looked up and recognised that she was on a path where she had several times met Mr Darcy. Did I run here hoping to see him? She could not help but wonder. He would help her, of that she had no doubt, despite the harsh words that had passed between them the previous evening. She struggled to her feet and began to walk. Showing up at Rosings in this state would be a disaster, but she had nowhere else to go. She knew only that Darcy would help her. Putting one foot slowly in front of the other, another clap of thunder made her jump. Panicking, she looked behind her, expecting irrationally to see Mr Collins chasing after her, and her foot slipped in the mud on the path. Holding her dress up with both hands as she was, she could not save herself, and tumbled down the grassy bank beside the path. The stream at the bottom, burbling merrily over stones that always looked so inviting in the sunshine, suddenly looked cold and treacherous. With a shriek, Elizabeth fell helplessly in, head first. Her head struck a protruding rock, and suddenly... She was still. Chapter 2 It was some thirty minutes later when Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam came striding down the path, whistling a jaunty tune. The storm had blown over as fast as it came, leaving blue skies behind, and he thought that he might as well take his daily walk in the direction of the parsonage and bid farewell to the ladies there before their departure on the morrow. He had looked for Darcy to go with him, but Darcy had apparently been caught in the storm and needed a change of clothes. He waved Richard off, saying that he had already made his farewells. Purest chance caused the colonel to glance down into the stream he walked beside. He spotted a glimpse of white and squinted curiously, moving nearer to the edge of the bank to take a closer look. Realising suddenly that the white belonged to the dress of a lady, he let out a cry of horror and scrambled hastily down to the water. Elizabeth Bennet lay half in, half out of the water, her cheek on the muddy bank, blood trickling sluggishly from a laceration on the side of her head. Swiftly the colonel placed two fingers beneath her jaw, feeling for a pulse, letting out a gasp of relief as he found it. "'Thank God!' he said fervently, looked around and debated for a moment what to do. There would most likely be no one within earshot if he shouted for help, and he could not possibly leave Miss Bennet alone in this state. Swiftly he made a decision, leaning down to lift her limp body from the water. As he turned her over, her dress gaped away from her body, and he realised it was badly torn. Averting his eyes, the colonel carefully laid Elizabeth on the grass and stripped off his coat. Wrapping the thick woollen fabric around her exposed torso, he gently lifted her back into his arms before scrambling back up the bank again. "'Rosings may be slightly closer,' Colonel Fitzwilliam murmured, glancing both ways along the path, "'but considering how Lady Catherine will likely react to the situation, I think the parsonage to be the better option. Besides, the doctor's residence is the next house along the lane.' Looking down at the unconscious woman in his arms, he sighed and set off at a swift pace. She was light enough to be little burden for the fit, battle-hardened soldier. The colonel arrived at the parsonage just as Mrs Collins and her sister came walking along the lane together, returning from their morning call. Charlotte's eyes widened at the sight of Elizabeth unconscious in his arms. "'Lizzie! What in the world has transpired, sir?' She hurried to open the gate for him. "'I know not.' 
I came upon her fallen in the stream and feared she had drowned, but she breathes yet. Thank the good Lord you found her, Colonel. Please, if you will bring her inside. She hesitated at the parlour door. Would it not be easier for me to take her straight to her bedroom? Fitzwilliam inquired pragmatically. Surely she would need to be swiftly moved to a bed anyway. You're quite correct, sir. Charlotte shook off her misgivings and gestured to the stairs. This way, if you please. She glanced at Maria, who was standing in the hall wide-eyed. See if Mr Collins is in, if you please, Maria, and then ask Betsy to begin boiling water. Yes, Charlotte. Maria obeyed her older sister's commands instinctively. The stairs were narrow, but the colonel manoeuvred up them deftly, careful not to bump Elizabeth's head against the wall. In a moment he was laying her on the bed, backing hastily towards the door. I shall fetch the doctor directly, Mrs Collins. Thank you, sir. Charlotte was already grabbing a towel, dampening it at the ewer on the dresser, and tenderly wiping at Elizabeth's bloodied face. Fitzwilliam ran down the stairs, taking them two at a time, and rushed out through the still open front door. The doctor lived at the very next house along the lane. He had been there often enough to speak to the man regarding Anne's health, since Lady Catherine would never permit him to speak to the doctor at Rosings. He only hoped Dr Trent was at home and not out on calls. The doctor is just returned, Colonel Fitzwilliam, the housekeeper informed him. He's upstairs changing. Is it Mr Burke, then? She gave him a concerned look. Mindful of his sweating, coatless state, Fitzwilliam steadied himself before shaking his head. No, ma'am. It's Miss Elizabeth Bennet, one of Mrs. Collins' guests at the parsonage. She's suffered a nasty accident. Oh, not that nice young lady. The housekeeper was moved to instant action. I'll have the doctor there directly, sir. Reassured by her concern, Fitzwilliam returned to the parsonage, but found himself pacing the parlour, irritated that he could not be of more use. The doctor came in a few moments later. Dr. Trent, thank God. He shook the man's hand. Miss Bennet has suffered a nasty accident. I found her fallen in a stream along one of Rosings' paths. She suffered a head wound. I shall go up directly, Trent promised with a nod, following an anxiously hovering Maria Lucas up the stairs. Wringing his hands, Fitzwilliam resumed his pacing. Darcy will be devastated, he could not help but think. His cousin was a reticent man, but Fitzwilliam hadn't missed the symptoms of regard Darcy had tried so hard to hide evidently for fear their aunt's eagle eye would light upon Miss Bennet as a target for her wrath. Really, he should go to him at once, but to go without any positive news, or at least a report from the doctor, would likely lead to unnecessarily great suffering for Darcy. Thus he would wait. "'How else may I be of service, Mrs Collins?' he begged Charlotte when she came downstairs to give instructions to her maid. "'Elizabeth is injured, and her family will wish to know at once. Her sister is in London and could be here quickest.' Can I beg you to dispatch two expresses for me if I write down the directions? At once, of course. She directed him into Mr. Collins' study, where fortunately there was a goodly supply of paper, pens and ink upon the desk, so that he did not have to go rifling through the man's papers. Charlotte plucked a pencil from a pocket of her apron. Mr. Bennet is Elizabeth's father, of course, she said, writing a Hertfordshire address on a scrap of paper but I cannot help but think that her sister Jane will want to be by her side as fast as possible, and she is much closer, visiting with their London relatives. I shall send them both as expeditiously as I am able, Mrs Collins, Fitzwilliam promised, and she gave him a tight little smile before hurrying out again. Bending to his task, the Colonel wrote swiftly and succinctly, trying not to be alarmist, but doing his best to convey the urgency he felt that Miss Elizabeth should have family by her side at this time. He had seen men die from lesser wounds than she had sustained. Head wounds were not to be taken lightly. He soon had the letters done and sealed, hurried out to get to the post office. Lady Catherine's name and a handful of coins soon impressed upon the clerk the urgency of the errand, and two fast riders were swiftly on their way. Chapter 3 Mrs Collins Dr Trent turned to Charlotte with a serious look as she re-entered Elizabeth's room. Miss Bennet will be well, I'm sure. She's taken a nasty knock to the head, but with proper care I hope she will recover fully. Oh, thank God! Charlotte sagged against the door, and Maria, who had stayed with the doctor and Elizabeth, ran to her for a reassuring hug. Could Miss Lucas remain with her for a moment while I speak to you privately? The doctor requested politely. Charlotte blinked. Yes, of course, she said uncertainly. 
though I wish to get Lizzie changed to make her more comfortable. She's wet through. One minute is all. Perhaps Miss Lucas could begin making her comfortable. Anything for poor Lizzie, and Maria at once began to unlace her friend's shoes. Come this way, Dr. Trent. Charlotte led him to her little above-stairs parlour. I pray you will tell me quickly whatever it was that you felt you could not say in front of my sister, she said, holding his eyes with her steady grey ones, and Trent tried unsuccessfully to suppress a sigh. This woman, this amazing woman, was utterly wasted in that sycophantic little idiot Collins. What he would only give to have met her first. Not all of Miss Bennet's injuries are consistent with her taking a tumble down a bank into a stream, Mrs. Collins, he said slowly. I have not the pleasure of understanding you, Dr. Trent, Charlotte replied, her brow furrowing. Looking at the floor, the doctor sighed. Dear God, this does not get any easier. He took off his glasses, wiped them on his handkerchief, looked at Charlotte and looked away. She was struck suddenly that Dr. Trent was quite a handsome man. He wasn't particularly tall, but he was lean and well-built, and his sandy brown hair and squarish face were rather pleasing to the eye, especially when he took off his glasses and revealed a remarkable pair of eyes, grass-green in colour. He must be about thirty-five or thereabout, Charlotte thought, and wondered why such a handsome, well-set-up man had not married. And then she despised herself for thinking such thoughts when her friend lay injured and in need of her. Just say it, Doctor, I have no time for this. I believe Miss Bennet was injured before she fell in the stream, Mrs. Collins, he said bluntly. The top of her gown was ripped, nay, shredded. The Colonel had wrapped her in his coat, and I have left her in it, but it looks very much as though she was assaulted. There are bruises forming on her upper body. He blushed, unable to say the words bosom or chest to this lady he admired so strongly. Her face, too, appears bruised. For fully half a minute Charlotte stood, mouth agape, unable to comprehend the possibility of what she had just been told. And then she said, "'My God, Lizzie!' and bolted. Charlotte sent Maria to get more hot water, not wanting her to see the state of Elizabeth's gown. She looked up to see the doctor standing in the doorway, watching her seriously. "'Was she... was she defiled?' Charlotte asked in a small voice. Elizabeth was so very still, so small and pale. Maria had only removed her shoes and stockings, had not yet unwrapped the coat around Lizzie's body. "'I could not check with your sister in the room, Mrs. Collins,' Dr. Trent said gently. "'Then we had best check now.' Charlotte closed her eyes momentarily, but made herself stand up and close the door. She slid the bolt across and looked at the doctor. "'Elizabeth is my friend, doctor. She, no matter what, I will do anything I can for her. Miss Bennet is lucky to have you for a friend, Mrs. Collins. Let us pray that she is no more hurt than I have already ascertained.' I will look. You shall advise me, Charlotte determined. If she's not, well, whether she has been or not, I do not think any man should look on her so. As you wish, Mrs. Collins. I pray you, describe anything you see on Miss Bennet's form that looks unusual, that you do not see on yourself, for example. Dr. Trent politely turned his back and stared at the wall. Charlotte bent to Elizabeth, lifted off the blanket Maria had placed over her legs, and raised her skirt. I see no blood on her legs, she said after a moment. There would be blood, wouldn't there? Assuming that Miss Bennet was a maiden before, Dr. Trent glanced over his shoulder and then held his hands up as Charlotte rounded on him, her eyes full of fire. Yes, yes, Mrs. Collins, certainly, there would be blood. Well, I see none. Charlotte bit her lip and folded the gown carefully to cover Elizabeth's groin but show the length of her legs. Nor bruises. Any scratches or scrapes, Anything that might indicate violence to her legs or hips or her stomach? Nothing, Charlotte said after a moment. She unwrapped the coat tangled around Elizabeth's upper body and sucked in a breath. The top of her dress was, as the doctor had said, shredded. Livid bruises were forming on her breasts, her neck and around her mouth. What is it? Are the signs of a man's uh, emissions? Dr. Trent asked, thinking that was something he had not warned Charlotte to look for. What? No! I've just... the bruises on her chest. Oh, Lizzie! Charlotte burst into tears. Calm yourself, Mrs. Collins. Dr. Trent turned around, cast one comprehensive look over Lizzie's legs, and swept the blanket over her body. 
Mrs. Collins, they're only bruises. They will heal. I'm sure she has escaped the worst, but your friend needs you now. I told her, Charlotte sobbed, turning to him and burying her face in his shoulder. I told her, walking alone like she does, one day something would happen. Dr. Trent allowed his arms to close around her, for one blissful moment allowing himself to hold her close. And then he took her shoulders in his hands gently and made her look at him. Mrs. Collins, you must pull yourself together. Miss Bennet has escaped the worst. I am sure she has not been violated, but she needs you now. While I do not believe her skull to be fractured, she has some nasty bruising that needs to be minimised. She woke briefly but spoke incoherently, so I suspect she may have a concussion. Cool cloths on that lump on her head must be applied constantly. I will go directly to Rosings and apply to Lady Catherine to have some ice sent down to you. His practical, no-nonsense tone made Charlotte pull herself together. She nodded against his shoulder and stepped back. I will take care of her. Her family's been sent for too. Charlotte? Mariah's voice sounded outside the door. Charlotte, I have the hot water. Can I come in? Find an errand and send Miss Lucas away, Dr. Trent said in a low voice. You want as few people as possible to see Miss Bennet's true state and burn her dress. Charlotte took a deep breath and nodded, taking a handkerchief from her pocket and wiping her eyes briskly with it. Yes, you're quite right, Doctor. I'll send Mariah. I will send her around to my housekeeper with a list of things to collect. Mrs. Thomas will keep her busy for a little while. I shall go on up to Rosings and return directly, Mrs. Collins. Thank you, she said, deeply grateful, and he opened the door to Mariah. Good girl, Miss Lucas, admirable work. Now, I have an important task for you. His voice trailed off as he led Mariah away. Charlotte had to take a few more deep breaths to collect herself, and then she closed and bolted the door again and bent to Elizabeth. Who did this to you, my dearest friend? She said softly beginning swiftly to unbutton Elizabeth's dress. Whoever did this, rest assured they will not go unpunished, and you, I vow you will not suffer any more than I have in my power to prevent. Tears still ran down her cheeks, and dripped on to Elizabeth's motionless form, because Charlotte knew that even though Elizabeth did not appear to have been ravished, should word get out of this, she would be just as surely ruined in the eyes of polite society. Chapter four. Darcy strode briskly down the lane, his thoughts dark. It was only his cousin's gentle reprimand that it would be only good manners to take his leave of the Collinses and their guests that had made him change his wet clothes and walk on out again. Elizabeth thought him entirely devoid of manners. Well, he would rectify that impression, as he had rectified Wickham's charges against him in the letter. The letter! By God, had she even read it? His hands clenched, and he gritted his teeth. She would have been well within her rights to throw it back in his face. He had behaved like an utter ass the previous evening, his wits destroyed as usual merely by being in her presence. Had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner? He winced at the memory of her chilly tones as she spoke the words. Your arrogance, your conceit, your selfish disdain for the feelings of others. While Wickham's charges against him were false, and he still could not entirely regret separating Bingley from Miss Bennet, Elizabeth's words had cut him to the quick. It had been a long, sleepless night looking into the darkness of his own soul, and Darcy had not much cared for what he found there. He had been so angry with Lady Catherine for her rude condescension to Elizabeth, but he had behaved even more disgracefully towards the Bennet family, and with less cause. At least Lady Catherine actually paid Elizabeth attention. What had he done but look down his nose and sneer, and laugh behind his hand with Caroline Bingley on occasion. He shuddered to think on it now. His behaviour had been nothing short of despicable. It was no wonder that Elizabeth hated him so. There was no possible way to make amends. Elizabeth would surely never want to see him again. At least he could hold the knowledge to himself that she would be safe from Wickham. If she had read the letter. He had to know if she had read the letter, because if she had not, she would be as vulnerable to the scoundrel as ever. More so if Wickham should somehow discern how precious she was to Darcy. He quickened his pace. He had to see her. Just one more time. Parsonage door stood wide open. Puzzled, Darcy stood upon the threshold, looking into the hall. Hello, he called, removing his hat. Mr. Collins? Mrs. Collins? 
There was no reply, and he stood undecided for several moments before realising that it would be the height of rudeness to enter the house without invitation. After a minute of hesitation, Darcy decided that he would walk around the house, perhaps see if anyone was in the garden. He had circumnavigated the house entirely, stood at the open front door again, hat in his hands, when quick footsteps on the path behind him made him turn his head. "'Cousin, it is most odd the door is open but nobody is home. Why, Richard, whatever is the matter?' He saw his cousin's grave expression as the other man removed his hat. "'Come inside, Darcy.' "'But—' Darcy glanced around the hall. "'Just come inside.' A firm hand on his elbow propelled him into the house, and, bemused, Darcy let Fitzwilliam guide him into the parlour. "'What is going on?' he demanded as the Colonel closed the door. Fitzwilliam glanced around, but saw no brandy decanter. He took a deep breath. "'You'd better sit down.' I have some distressing news to impart. Out with it, man, for God's sake! Darcy barked impatiently. Darcy, Miss Bennet has been in an accident. He was watching for it, saw Darcy sway on his feet and grabbed his elbow to guide him into a chair. I told you to sit down, you fool! Elizabeth! Darcy whispered, and the look he turned on his cousin was agonised. Is she... is she... He couldn't bear to say the word. She lives but she's gravely wounded. I'm just returned from sending expresses to her family, summoning them to her side. I found her, Darcy, fallen in a stream along one of the lanes, bleeding from a nasty head wound. Darcy had gone very white about the lips. He lifted his fingers to his eyes, pressed on his closed eyelids for a moment. What? What has been done? I brought her here for Mrs. Collins to attend to and summon the doctor. I dare say Dr. Trent is with her now. This is my fault, Darcy said despairingly. Do not be ridiculous. How could it possibly be your fault? Fitzwilliam scoffed. She must have been distracted after seeing me. Perhaps she was reading the letter, Darcy thought, but he did not speak of the letter aloud. Doing so would irrevocably compromise Elizabeth in Fitzwilliam's eyes, and he would demand Darcy marry her. Elizabeth would be put in an untenable situation, and he would not do that to her. Colonel Fitzwilliam shook his head impatiently, and just then Maria Lucas came hurrying back into the house, a basket in her hands. "'Miss Lucas!' he hailed her as she passed the parlour door. "'Oh, Colonel and Mr Darcy!' Maria startled to see them both there, bobbed a hasty curtsy. "'Have you news of Miss Bennet?' Fitzwilliam asked. "'Not yet, sir. I have not seen her since the doctor went up to Rosings to get ice. I have here ointments and medicine he sent me for.' "'Quickly, then. Go on up. And I pray you, let us know if there is any news, Fitzwilliam requested, and Maria nodded nervously. I will come back down directly to report to you on her condition, sir, she promised, hurrying towards the stairs. Darcy dropped his head into his hands, and Fitzwilliam turned to see him tearing at his hair. Hesitating only a moment, he crossed swiftly to his cousin and put a hand on Darcy's shoulder. She will be well, Darcy, I'm sure of it. Mrs. Collins is a fine, competent woman who will no doubt nurse her friend devotedly, and you know well how good a Dr. Trent is. You pay the man a very fine salary to ensure he stays here close to Anne, as we both know. What shall I do if she dies? Darcy said brokenly into his hands. None of that now, Fitzwilliam said bracingly, his heart breaking for the cousin who was also his closest friend. Miss Bennet shall be perfectly fine, and tramping the lanes again as is her wont very soon, I do not doubt it. Come now, Darcy, buck up. Mrs. Collins may have need of us, and you will do Miss Bennet no good to sit here and go into a decline over her, no matter how much you love her. I'm very obvious, am I not? Darcy sighed and looked up at his cousin. I'm afraid so, but I must commend you on your excellent taste, the Colonel said, straight-faced. She will make a very fine mistress of Pemberley. Darcy's mouth tightened, and he was about to tell Fitzwilliam that could never be, no matter how much he wished for it, that his own selfish, boorish behaviour had forever set Elizabeth against him, when light feet pattered down the stairs and Mrs Collins entered the parlour. Chapter 5 Charlotte! Maria scratched at the bedchamber door. One moment, Charlotte called, hastily checked Elizabeth over again. She had dressed her friend in a warm nightgown that buttoned right up under her chin, swathed her in blankets. The bruising around her mouth could not be hidden, but surely that could be attributed to her fall, just as easily as the cut on her head. 
still bleeding sluggishly under the wet cloth Charlotte had placed over it. Yes, Maria? Charlotte opened the chamber door, nodded as Maria thrust the basket forward. Thank you, my dear. She had already burned Elizabeth's dress on the fire. It had served to warm the room nicely. Oh, good, this is the ointment for her head. It will stem the bleeding, though Dr. Trent advised me to wait until he returned to apply it. Poor Lizzie. Maria approached the bed anxiously. And both the gentlemen so worried about her. Both gentlemen? Charlotte queried. Yes, the Colonel and Mr. Darcy are both downstairs in the parlour. Colonel Fitzwilliam asked me to go down directly with a report on how Lizzie does. What should I say, Charlotte? Oh, she looks so dreadfully pale. Maria wrung her hands. Charlotte stood frowning, bemused. She did not know what to think. She was quite confident Colonel Fitzwilliam had not been the one to assault Elizabeth. He had, after all, brought her back to the parsonage and had evidently been most concerned for her welfare. But Charlotte had long suspected Mr. Darcy of having a tendre for Lizzie. Could it be possible? Could they have quarrelled? Might Lizzie have somehow provoked him? Knowing her friend's tendency for unguarded speech, Charlotte could well believe that. But surely Mr. Darcy would not have... No, surely not. Although, what if Charlotte was not mistaken in his regard, but in what he planned to do about it? They knew, after all, that the master of Pemberley was as far above an Elizabeth Bennet as she was above a common chimney sweep. What if Darcy had not proposed marriage to Lizzie, but a rather less honourable arrangement? Lizzie could well have lost her temper and screamed like a fishwife. Charlotte knew her to be capable of it. And Darcy might have become enraged, inflamed beyond reason. She closed her eyes and shook her head. Mr. Darcy was not capable of such an awful act. She was sure of it. I will go down and speak to them, Maria, she said. Will you sit with Lizzie? She's resting quietly, and I'm sure Dr. Trent will return at any moment. I must find out where Mr. Collins has gone as well. I cannot think where he might be. Maria gulped nervously, but she nodded. I'll stay with her, she said bravely, taking a seat by the bed and Elizabeth's hand in hers. Charlotte rested a reassuring hand on her shoulder for a moment before taking her leave. Mrs. Collins! Both men turned to her as she entered the parlour, and she looked from one to the other of them. Darcy was very pale, she could not help but notice, his hands shaking as he grasped the mantelpiece. Mrs. Collins, how does Miss Bennet? I pray you do not keep us in suspense, he rasped out, and she gave him a small, reassuring nod. I believe she will be well, sir. She is comfortable for now, and we await Dr. Trent's return to treat her head wound. He has gone to Rosings to fetch ice, which I understand is most beneficial in cases such as this, to prevent the wound from swelling and placing pressure on the brain. Has Miss Bennet aroused from her stupor yet? Does the doctor think she will do so soon? Colonel Fitzwilliam asked. She has not, and he did not say, sir. I hope it will be soon. The colonel frowned to himself, falling silent. Darcy released the mantelpiece, paced a few steps back and forth, clearly distressed. Poor Miss Bennet. Please, Mrs Collins, is there anything that we can do? Anything in my power, you need only name it. I can go to town, fetch another doctor, more medicines. Anything, if Elizabeth will only be well again. He was so distraught that Charlotte forgave him the slip regarding Elizabeth's name, though she saw the colonel's eyes flick over to his cousin. Reassured that Mr. Darcy could not possibly be Elizabeth's attacker, she smiled gently at him. Everything that can be done is being done, Mr. Darcy. Your offer does you great credit, and I will ensure that Lizzie's family is apprised of it. Poor Miss Bennet, that such a thing should happen to her. I thought it better to bring her here than Rosings, Mrs. Collins, for fear Lady Catherine would not have her nurse within the house, and might insist on having her moved, though it be detrimental to her recovery. Fitzwilliam shook his head sadly. He knew Lady Catherine all too well, knew that his aunt would have been shrilly insisting that Elizabeth was faking her injury to get under the same roof as Darcy. The old lady's sharp eyes hadn't missed how often Darcy's eyes rested on Miss Bennet's pretty face. Of that Fitzwilliam was sure. Charlotte stared at the Colonel curiously. Why would Lady Catherine out so? she wondered. How should she know the nature of Elizabeth's injury? If she did, certainly she would be claiming Elizabeth to be a fallen woman and demanding her out of the house at once. But only Charlotte and Dr. Trent knew what had happened to Elizabeth, and Charlotte was very sure that the doctor would not speak of it and most certainly not to Lady Catherine. 
Of course, there was one other person who knew what had happened. Elizabeth's attacker. Charlotte drew in a slow breath, her eyes still on Colonel Fitzwilliam. It is well that you brought Elizabeth here, she said finally. She is my dearest friend, and until her family arrive, I promise there can be no one more devoted to ensuring her recovery than myself. You cannot imagine how glad I am to hear that, Mrs. Collins, Darcy said a little hoarsely. And much to Charlotte's surprise, he seized her hand and kissed it. She blushed a little, stunned. Come, Darcy, Fitzwilliam said then. The greatest service we can do for Miss Bennet at this moment is to leave Mrs. Collins to care for her, I believe. I pray that you will send to us if there is anything, anything at all, that we may do to assist you, ma'am, for we are entirely at your disposal, he bowed to Charlotte. Indeed, I shall not leave Rosings until I am assured of Miss Bennet's recovery, Darcy vowed vehemently, and Charlotte smiled slightly at him again. You are too good, sir. And I pray, if it is not too much trouble, may I call each day to beg news? I would not for a moment take you from Miss Bennet's side, but I will make sure that either my husband or my sister is available to speak with you, sir, Charlotte said kindly. I thank you. Darcy stood staring longingly up the stairs for a moment, until Fitzwilliam nudged him in the back. Come, Darcy, let us be away. They made their farewells with great civility, and shaking her head, still confused over her thoughts, Charlotte hurried back up the stairs, eager to return to Elizabeth's side. Perhaps we could hire a nurse to assist Mrs. Collins, Darcy said as they walked back along the lane towards Rosings. I doubt it will be necessary. Miss Lucas is there to assist as well, and no doubt they will soon have a full house. I sent expresses to Miss Bennet's father and to her sister in London at Mrs. Collins' behest. Darcy paled, thinking of Jane Bennet. Elizabeth's anger towards him on her sister's behalf. I do not know how I am to face Miss Bennet, he said guiltily. Fitzwilliam looked at him curiously, but said nothing as they walked onwards. Chapter 6 Mr. Collins, meanwhile, had not been idle. He had briefly debated following Elizabeth out into the storm, but a few drops of rain upon his head had rapidly cooled his ardour. Instead, he walked back into the house and stood in the parlour breathing heavily for a moment, before spotting upon the floor the letter that had caused him to lose his head. Stooping heavily to pick it up, he weighed it in his hand for a moment, debating whether or not to read it. "'She should not be receiving letters from gentlemen. Disgraceful hussy!' he muttered darkly to himself, easing a finger under the already broken seal. Flipping it back, he saw written at the bottom of the page, "'God bless you, Fitzwilliam Darcy.' Ugh! Mr. Collins closed up the letter again thought of casting it upon the fire. But no. No, Miss Bennet was not the only one whose shameful behaviour the letter exposed. Mr. Darcy's actions were despicable. To cavort so with Elizabeth under the very nose of his betrothed. Poor Mr. Burr! Her mother would be appalled. Yes, Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine must be apprised of this shocking turn of events as soon as possible. She would know what to do. Lady Catherine always knew how to act. It was still raining, though, but peering from the window he could see blue sky in the distance. The rain would stop soon. He would just wait a little longer before setting out. Indeed. Perhaps Elizabeth would reconsider, would return and accept his very generous offer. She was hopelessly compromised now that he had discovered her secret, after all. Mr. Collins is here, now. But I did not summon him, Lady Catherine said, quite astounded, as her butler announced the parson's arrival. Anne, seated close by the fire, watched curiously as her mother seemed to waver for a moment before waving an imperious hand. "'Very well, very well. I am persuaded that the man is not so foolish as to impose himself upon me uninvited for anything less than an urgent matter. Show him in.' A moment later, the obsequious parson was bowing and scraping before Lady Catherine. Unnoticed by the fire, Anne watched with repugnance as her mother accepted the civility as nothing more than her due— Mrs. Jenkinson had gone to visit her sister, and Anne did not wish to be alone. Even her mother's company was better than none today, she had thought. And this impromptu visit promised to be entertaining, at the very least. "'Do pardon me, Lady Catherine, for my unheralded visit, but there is a matter of the utmost importance that I have to bring to your ladyship's attention,' Mr. Collins grovelled. It was quite remarkable, Anne thought, for how a tall man Mr. Collins could contort himself so small— 
he bore a distinct resemblance to a toad in his current attitude. She suppressed an unladylike giggle, lest her mother be recalled to her presence and sent her from the room before she heard any interesting gossip. "'Pray enlighten me, Mr. Collins. What urgent matter has caused you to see fit to disturb my morning?' Lady Catherine said frostily. "'Disturb what?' Anne thought. Lady Catherine had been doing nothing of note, merely flicking desultorily through a lady's magazine lately delivered, and making disparaging remarks about how true ladies would not waste their time with such nonsense. Anne wanted to ask why Lady Catherine continued her subscription, but did not quite dare. Mr. Collins was still grovelling, blithering on about nothing in his wordy, nonsensical way, until finally he produced a letter and offered it up to Lady Catherine. "'And what is this?' Lady Catherine said frostily, looking at the direction. "'Do you read your cousin's mail, then, sir? That is rather intrusive of you.' Anne bit her lip. She had never received a letter that her mother had not first read. Not even from Georgiana or her aunt Lady Matlock. Of course, those were the only two correspondents she had. And what they could possibly say to her that her mother might take offence at, Anne could not imagine. Still, it would be nice to have a little privacy. But apparently that was not something that young ladies might be allowed. Poor Miss Elizabeth, that Mr Collins should insist on reading her private correspondence. "'But your ladyship,' Mr Collins said anxiously, "'I pray you, look at the seal!' Lady Catherine frowned at him and turned the letter over. Her mouth fell open, and she gaped, Anne thought, very much like a carp for several moments. And then she almost ripped the letter in her haste to unfold and read it. It was a long letter, several pages, all folded together. Anne would have loved to move closer, to see what had Lady Catherine turning first puce and then white, and then finally puce again, before taking a deep breath and addressing her parson. "'You did well to bring me this, Mr Collins,' she said finally. "'Very well. Did you read it?' There was a note in her voice that Anne had never heard before. She did not understand it, but she did recognise the look of triumph that now suffused her mother's features. "'I did not, Your Ladyship,' Only I did unfold the last page and saw the signature. You will speak of this to no one. No one, do you understand? Lady Catherine stood and crossed the room with quick steps, throwing the letter into the fire. No one must ever know that my nephew has been corresponding with Miss Bennet. Of course, your ladyship, Collins grovelled. Anne was close enough to the fire to see the writing on the paper as it burned up. To recognise it as being Darcy's firm, close-written hand not Fitzwilliam's loose scrawl. It seemed her suspicions were correct. Anne smiled to herself slightly. One learned much if one simply sat quietly and observed. Darcy had been most agitated whenever in Miss Elizabeth Bennet's company, and highly distracted whenever she was absent. The man was deeply, completely in love. And Lady Catherine and Mr Collins were hell-bent on ruining everything. "'Lady Catherine, I cannot tell you how deeply I regret bringing Miss Bennet into your august presence,' Mr Collins cried. "'I should never have permitted Mrs Collins to invite her. I suspected when I met her in Hertfordshire what she was, for what decent woman would refuse a proposal such as mine? She has cast her allurements for your nephew, the shameless hussy, and surely Mr Darcy cannot be blamed for falling victim to her wiles, for such are the arts of wanton women. "'Indeed, Mr Collins!' Lady Catherine cut him off mid-rant. "'Your cousin brings shame upon her family, "'and will bring shame upon yours too if you do not act swiftly. "'You must have her out of your house to-day. "'Nightfall, no later, "'or your reputation as a clergyman will be irrevocably damaged.' "'Of course, Lady Catherine. "'You are quite correct, Lady Catherine, as always.' "'Anne closed her eyes in horror. "'Poor Miss Bennet, "'though she was most curious to know what the letter was all about.' "'Dishonourable, Darcy,' she thought at her cousin, shaking her head. "'Unless the pair were already secretly engaged, "'and Darcy was only waiting for Miss Bennet to leave, "'to have his beloved safely out of range of Lady Catherine's wrath "'before breaking the news. "'That must be it,' Anne decided. "'Darcy would surely never jeopardise Elizabeth's reputation "'unless they already had an understanding. "'Well, she would do her best to intercept and warn him "'before Lady Catherine set about him.' There was nothing she could do for Elizabeth at this moment but find Darcy and trust in him to set things right. She was about to rise when the butler entered and coughed politely. Dr. Trent to see you, your ladyship. It can wait, 
Lady Catherine was in the midst of a vitriolic harangue against Elizabeth Bennet, and all conniving hussies of her ilk, and did not care to be interrupted. The butler coughed. "'I do beg your pardon, your ladyship, but it is an urgent matter.' "'Oh, very well,' Lady Catherine said petulantly, thinking that she would have plenty of time over the coming days to abuse Elizabeth into Mr. Collins' willing ear. "'Go, Mr. Collins, and send that shameless trollop packing at once.' "'Yes, your ladyship.' Anne hadn't thought the heavy-set clergyman could move so fast as he did then, for he fairly bolted from the room. She was about to rise to follow him, to go looking for her cousins, when it occurred to her that the doctor might be there to see her. She remained in her seat for the time being. The doctor entered, spotted Anne at once beside the fire, and gave her a reassuring smile and a nod. She smiled back at him. They were good friends, she and Dr. Trent, of necessity. Anne's health was truly poor, and she was fairly sure she would not have survived the last few winters without the good doctor's excellent efforts and constant, careful attention. Lady Catherine. Trent came to the point quickly after giving only a brief, though deeply courteous bow. Your butler and housekeeper have informed me that you must give approval for any ice from Rosings Ice House to be used, so I have come to apply to you directly. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, with whom I know you are acquainted, has sustained a nasty head wound and requires ice to succour her. "'Certainly not,' Lady Catherine said coldly. Dr. Trent blinked. "'I beg your pardon?' "'Certainly not, Doctor. I will not permit it. "'In fact, I forbid you to treat her. "'Let her bleed to death.' "'Mother!' Anne cried, truly shocked. "'Shocked, Dr. Trent stared at the lady, "'who glared back at him with her head held high. "'Your ladyship, I cannot obey that command. "'The Hippocratic Oath forbids it, "'even if Christian charity would permit me,' he said slowly. "'I beg you to reconsider.' "'I will not.' Leave my house this instant, and you will reconsider that choice if you wish to remain in my employ. Lady Catherine yanked the bell pull. Dr. Trent is leaving, she said icily when the butler entered. Chapter 7 There's Trent now, Fitzwilliam said to Darcy as they neared the house. The doctor was striding swiftly down the steps, cramming his hat onto his head. Doctor! They both hurried towards him. I beg of you, sirs, Trent said quickly as they reached him. You must persuade your aunt to reconsider. Reconsider what? Darcy blinked. She will not grant permission for ice to be taken from the ice house to succour Miss Bennet. I did my best, but she would not be moved. She is... Enraged and bemused by Lady Catherine's attitude, he shook his head, frustrated. She would not be reasoned with. She demanded that I not even treat Miss Bennet, threatened to dismiss me. "'She cannot do that since you are in my employ, not hers!' Darcy snapped, furious. "'I shall see to the ice, Doctor, never fear!' He took the steps to the front door three at a time and strode inside. "'Colonel, I beg of you, what is going on?' Trent asked, utterly confused. "'Why does Lady Catherine despise Miss Bennet so?' Fitzwilliam blew out his cheeks. "'My cousin Darcy admires Miss Bennet,' he admitted. "'Very greatly, I believe.' Lady Catherine, of course, intends that he should marry Mr. Burke, and obviously she has somehow perceived Darcy's regard. He shook his head. Darcy is devastated that Miss Bennet has been injured in this grievous way, Doctor. Oh! Assuming from his words that Charlotte must, in her distress, have let slip that Elizabeth had been assaulted, Trent nodded. Well, of course, in the circumstances. You found her, did you not, Colonel? Can you tell me how, exactly? Of course, anything to help Miss Bennet. I was on my way to the parsonage from Rosings, taking the path through the beech woods, when I found her. She was lying in the stream, her head fortunately out of the water. From the marks on the bank, I surmised she had slipped in the mud and fallen. Were there any signs of a struggle? Did you see anyone else on your route? Fitzwilliam blinked. No. Trent chewed on his lower lip. The Colonel had just admitted that Darcy admired Miss Bennet. Surely Mr. Darcy could not have. But he had best asked the question. Did you see Mr. Darcy before you left the house? Colonel Fitzwilliam was no fool. He very rapidly added two and two together and made four. He had, after all, seen Miss Bennet's torn bodice, but had put it down to her fall down the bank. But considering the questions the doctor had just asked... My God, man, you're saying she was attacked? 
he retained just enough presence of mind to keep his voice down. Such shock could not possibly be feigned. Trent nodded slowly. I'm afraid so. There was bruising on her, uh, upper body. He gestured vaguely at his chest. Mrs. Collins examined her, and we do not fear that the worst happened. Still, Fitzwilliam was just recalling with horror that Darcy had come in soaked from the storm just as he was on his way out, which meant that Darcy could very well have met with Miss Bennet out there somewhere before Fitzwilliam found her. Unwillingly, he remembered the look of guilt on Darcy's face when he said that he did not know how he was to face the elder Miss Bennet upon her arrival. In his concern for Elizabeth, Fitzwilliam had not thought at the time about his meaning. He did so now. Surely not. Never. He shook off the unworthy thought. Darcy would never, could never hurt any woman so, least of all Elizabeth Bennet. Dr. Trent, this is most shocking, he said, and the culprit must be apprehended. Have you any idea who it might be? Trent shook his head. I fear we will have to wait for Miss Elizabeth to wake to tell us herself. Well, if I can be of any service to you, I am an investigator with the army, you may be aware. Please, I am at your service. He spied from the corner of his eye, Darcy striding back down rosing steps towards them. For God's sake, do not mention this to Darcy, Fitzwilliam said urgently, keeping his voice low. Have you told Lady Catherine? It is not my business to tell anyone, Trent said quickly, though I had been wondering if I should approach the local magistrate. I should be grateful for your guidance and assistance on the matter, Colonel. You shall have it, the Colonel promised immediately. I will consult with you tomorrow. Hopefully Miss Elizabeth will have awakened and will be able to tell us more. The two men shared a determined look. The matter is resolved, Doctor, Darcy said imperiously, approaching them. The housekeeper is going now to open the ice house, and the ice will be carried directly to the parsonage. I have also instructed the assistant housekeeper, Mrs. Soward, to go and assist in any way she can while Mrs. Collins is occupied nursing Miss Elizabeth. Thank you, Mr. Darcy, Trent said gratefully. That is very good of you. Did you, um, ask Lady Catherine? I did not, Darcy's mouth tightened. I will be speaking to her, though, about her ungenerous, indeed unchristian attitude. Until her family arrive, he concluded, it is incumbent upon us as her friends to do all that is within our power to provide ease to Miss Elizabeth. Well said, sir, Trent said approvingly, certain now that neither man had anything to do with the attack on Elizabeth Bennet. I must be on my way. Indeed, we shall not delay you, Darcy said quickly. But I request that you will keep us informed of any developments, and pray, send to us at once if there is any way at all in which we may assist. We shall call to see how Miss Bennet does in the morning. The doctor nodded agreeably, shook both their hands, and set off at a brisk pace. Darcy and Fitzwilliam looked at each other for a moment. Well, I dare say our departure will be delayed by a few days at least, Fitzwilliam said finally. I had best go and tell Hodges to unpack again. Indeed, and I must needs write to Georgiana. I shall not tell her why we are delayed, though. She would be distressed to hear of Miss Bennet's injury. Darcy looked away from Fitzwilliam's quizzical looks. I um, may have made mention of Miss Bennet a few times in my letters, he mumbled sheepishly. Georgiana has become quite curious about her. I see, Colonel Fitzwilliam said, and he did indeed see quite a lot. Well, and it appears we must confront Lady Catherine, and ask what the devil has possessed her to act so uncharitably as to refuse aid to Miss Bennet. Darcy shook his head, his face dropping into a frown. I shall do that, Fitzwilliam, if you will go and ask Hodges and Burnett to unpack again. Fitzwilliam shrugged. If Darcy was in enough of a mood to beard the dragon in her den, he was certainly not inclined to argue the point. He headed for the stairs as Darcy stalked towards the parlour. Chapter 8 Still in shock from Lady Catherine's dreadful words to Dr. Trent, Anne sat paralysed by the fire, staring at her mother as Lady Catherine stalked back and forth, muttering under her breath, a gleeful light in her eye. Mother? she attempted to interject. Hush, Anne! We have him now! Oh, yes, we do! Lady Catherine actually rubbed her hands together gleefully. She looked quite mad, Anne thought in horror, like a Shakespearean villain upon the stage. Have who? Mother, I do not like this. You will be quiet, 
Lady Catherine snapped, whirling to point a finger at her, and Anne shrank back, mentally berating herself for her timidity, but unable to help it. I know what's best. Me, your mother. You will do as I say, and so will Darcy. She chuckled. Indeed he will. Utterly confused, Anne could only sit in miserable silence until the door swung open and Darcy strode in. She pushed herself to her feet, opening her mouth to address her cousin, but Darcy was already speaking, his tone stern. Lady Catherine, what is the meaning of this? Dr Trent informed me that you have denied aid to Miss Bennet in her hour of need. I certainly did, Lady Catherine sneered. And I tell you, Darcy, I am deeply ashamed of you. Your mother would turn over in her grave if she knew of your disgraceful behaviour. Darcy went first white, then red. Do not dare to speak of my mother, he said in a low, dangerous voice. She would have liked Elizabeth very much. Do not you dare to speak that name in Anne's presence ever again, Lady Catherine barked, before lowering her voice, her tone turning conciliatory, honey-sweet. Come, Darcy, you have sown your wild oats. It is time to set this woman aside. Do your duty to your family and marry Anne. Darcy cast a glance at Anne, who shook her head and rolled her eyes at him. He did not smile, only nodded briskly. It is time for you to set aside this delusion that Anne and I will some day marry, Aunt Catherine. Neither of us wish for it. We are fond of each other, but... Then that is far more than most have as a basis for marriage, Lady Catherine snapped back at him. You will marry Anne, Darcy. She walked closer to him, her smile sharp. I shall have the bands called beginning next Sunday. Mr Collins will be delighted to oblige. You shall do no such thing because I am not marrying Anne. Darcy's voice rose. Oh, yes, you are, Lady Catherine said. You must. How else shall you save Georgiana's reputation? Darcy froze. I beg your pardon. The two protagonists were so focused on each other that neither noticed the colonel enter the room. He looked at the tableau, at Darcy and Lady Catherine glaring at each other silently, looked over at Anne with raised eyebrows. She shook her head despairingly. You had best make your meaning clear, Lady Catherine, Darcy said sharply at last. Not only have you been dallying with your trollop under my very nose, Darcy cut her off. You will not call Miss Bennet such names, Lady Catherine, or it will go very ill for you. He glared at her. She did not back down so much as an inch, glaring right back at him. You have also shown yourself to be a most unfit guardian for Georgiana. Your judgment is appalling, Darcy. How dare you! He was shouting now. Easy, Das. Aunt Catherine is disappointed, that is all. Carefully, Fitzwilliam approached his cousin, placed a conciliatory hand on his shoulder. I am disappointed in both of you. She folded her arms and smiled. You both showed very poor judgment, in my opinion. In innocently enjoying the company of a charming gentlewoman? I think not, madam, Fitzwilliam said coolly. Miss Bennet does not deserve your censure. Oh, that is not what I am referring to. Her smile was quite evil. I am talking about your decision to employ Mrs. Young without properly checking her references. To allow Georgiana to set up a household at the tender age of fifteen, to go to Ramsgate with naught but a paid companion to watch over her, and to educate her so poorly she thought nothing of agreeing to an elopement with the son of a steward. Darcy and Fitzwilliam were both so shocked they could only gape. Sensing victory, Lady Catherine barrelled on. You were both unfit guardians. I can't imagine what your father was thinking, Darcy, to set two young men to watch over my niece. I shall set all to rights, believe me. When you and Anne are married at Pemberley, Georgiana shall come here to me. I shall soon have these nonsensical notions of love out of her foolish head. Unable to speak, utterly horrified by what they were hearing, both men stood frozen. It was Anne's voice that broke the ringing silence. You will do no such thing, mother, she said quite placidly, because if you even think again of blackening Georgiana's name, I will claim that I have already witnessed Darcy compromising Elizabeth, and I will tell my uncle how twice now you have attempted to place Darcy in a compromising situation with me, only to be foiled when I refuse to do your bidding. You will be the laughing stock of the ton. And no, 
I do not care that my good name might be ruined. I do not ever wish to marry. Startled, they all looked at Anne. Colonel Fitzwilliam, rather more accustomed to being ambushed than Darcy, was the first to recover his wits and to support Anne's statements. Madam, do not think you will find an ally in my father if you seek to remove Georgiana from her brother's custody. He is well aware of the situation and fully supportive of our actions in the matter. And if you should attempt to blackmail Darcy in this matter by threatening to destroy Georgiana's reputation, know one thing. He loomed over her, glaring straight into her eyes. If you do, I will see you ruined. I will have you consigned to Bedlam. And do not think that I cannot, madam. Darcy and I have friends in very high circles. Darcy had been standing, quietly putting puzzle pieces together in his mind, and finally spoke up. There is only one possible way in which you could have come into possession of this information, Lady Catherine, he said in a quiet yet lethal tone. How did you gain sight of my letter? Letter? What letter? Colonel Fitzwilliam gave him a confused look. I wrote Elizabeth a letter, explaining certain things, including my animosity for Wickham. She's met him, you see, and had been inveigled into believing his side of the story. She's whoring herself for a steward's son, too, and still you want to defend her. You shared the news of Georgiana's disaster with such a person, Lady Catherine harumphed. Lady Catherine, I have never in my life struck a woman. That record may be blemished unless you tell me right now how you came to have sight of that letter, and where is it now? Darcy clenched his jaw with rage. She burned it, Anne said helpfully, when Lady Catherine did not seem inclined to speak. Mr Collins gave it to her. And how did he come into possession of it? Fitzwilliam looked at Darcy, who could only shake his head. Thank you, Anne. Lady Catherine, I take no leave of you. After your actions this day, you deserve none. Come, Richard, we shall depart today instead of tomorrow. I dare say our bags are still mostly packed. Your pardon, Anne, but I cannot stay another night under a roof where Lady Catherine believes herself to be in authority. We shall put up at the inn in Sevenoaks for tonight. We should be there by dinner time, and we can come to the parsonage tomorrow to check on Miss Elizabeth and see if we may offer her any assistance. As always, I am at your disposal, cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam said dryly, but he was quite in agreement with Darcy. They both bowed over Anne's hand and walked out of the room without acknowledging Lady Catherine, who scowled, enraged at being thwarted, but could not think of anything to say. In the end, she shouted at the door as it closed behind them. I am most seriously displeased. The door opened again, and Darcy looked back at her. Frankly, dear aunt, I don't give a damn. Chapter 9 Hurrying away from Rosings, Mr Collins was caught in a dilemma. He had to obey Lady Catherine's directive, of course. Elizabeth must be gone from his house as soon as possible. He did not want her there, indeed not, the ungrateful wretch. He had best confront her as soon as possible, order her gone from his house directly. The only problem was, what if she should say something to Charlotte? He wrung his hands anxiously, feeling a cold sweat spring up on the back of his neck. Outside of his own volition, his steps slowed, and he diverted onto a path which would take almost twice as long to return him to the parsonage. He needed time to think. On his eventual return to the parsonage, Mr Collins was most annoyed to find the front door standing wide open and unattended. "'What is this?' he cried in annoyance, but there was no one there to hear him. Shedding his coat and hat, he checked swiftly in the parlour and in his study. Finding them unoccupied, he proceeded up the stairs and encountered Charlotte coming out of Elizabeth's room. "'Where is Miss Bennet?' he snapped, panicking instantly that the two ladies should have been talking to each other. Charlotte shook her head. "'It is too awful, husband. Poor Lizzie took a fall while out on her walk.' fell into the stream and hit her head. Mr. Collins' mouth gaped wide. For one blissful moment, he thought Charlotte was about to tell him Elizabeth had died. Then all his troubles should be over, and Lady Catherine would be quite pleased indeed. But she continued. She lies unconscious yet. Dr. Trent has been to Rosings to fetch some ice for her poor head. You have just missed him, and Maria is next door helping his housekeeper make up an ointment for her wounds. But... Mr. Collins said, after a moment of attempting to gather his scattered wits. This cannot be. She has to leave at once. Lady Catherine has commanded it. Charlotte stared at him, her eyes narrowing. 
Mr. Collins, what Lady Catherine commands is neither here nor there in this situation. Did you not hear me? Elizabeth is gravely wounded. She cannot be moved. Angered and frustrated, Mr. Collins actually stamped his foot like a petulant child. She has behaved disgracefully. Lady Catherine has decreed that she cannot stay a moment longer. I must insist that you pack her bags at once. I will not. Charlotte folded her arms and glared at him. This is unchristian behaviour, Mr. Collins. You cannot demand such a thing. I will not have her beneath my roof, Mr. Collins shouted. I cannot sleep in the same house as that woman any longer. Mr. Collins, Charlotte said icily, in that case you had best pack your own bag. If you are unable to find rest in the same house as someone of whom Lady Catherine so heartily disapproves, then I recommend you find somewhere else to spend the night. No doubt Lady Catherine will be able to find a room for you at Rosings. Shocked and furious as Charlotte turned her back on him, Mr. Collins stormed away, going into his room and slamming the door in a huff. Incredulous, Charlotte returned to Elizabeth's side, checking the ice wrapped in cloth upon her brow. Fool of a man, she muttered under her breath, sitting down and taking Elizabeth's hand in hers. After a long few moments, Charlotte sighed. I will take care of you, Lizzie, she promised finally, no matter what. About half an hour later, there was a tap at the door. Charlotte got up wearily and went to see who it was, hoping for Maria returning. She was in desperate need of a cup of tea, and the promised help from Rosings had not yet arrived. It was Mr. Collins. Charlotte sighed again, stepped outside the door and closed it behind her, confronting him on the landing. What is it, Mr. Collins? Charlotte, my dear. He gave her a greasy smile, dry washing his hands. I know, having had time to think things over, you will have come to understand what an untenable situation this is. Lady Catherine has ordered that Miss Bennet be gone from our home by nightfall. Lady Catherine presumably did not know of Elizabeth's injuries when she made such a preposterous demand, Charlotte said firmly. Charlotte, my dear, you do not know what she has done. She has disgraced herself. Disgraced the family name. Oh, I knew those Bennets were a bad lot. Mr. Collins, you do yourself no honour with such remarks. Charlotte's voice cracked like a whip. I do not know if such talk comes from your spite after Elizabeth rejected you, but I will have none of it in my house. He cringed for a moment, and then straightened up suddenly. May I remind you, madam, that it is my house, and in our marriage vows you promise to love, honour, and obey me. Now you will pack my cousin's bags immediately. Charlotte stared at him for a long, silent moment, and then she curtsied mockingly. I pray you give me leave now, then, Mr. Collins. If I must pack Elizabeth's bags, I must needs also pack my own. For if Elizabeth shall no longer be welcome in this house, then neither shall I be. I will return to Hertfordshire at her side. After a few moments of tense silence as they stared at each other, Charlotte nodded slowly. So be it. No! Mr. Collins cried out as Charlotte began to turn around, reach for the door handle. My dear Charlotte, I beg of you, do not leave me. It is your decision to make, Mr. Collins. You must cease at once demanding that Elizabeth be removed from this house while she is so desperately ill. Her family have been alerted by express, and will no doubt be on their way as soon as may be. They may even arrive tonight. You may take your grievances with Elizabeth up with Mr. Bennet upon his arrival. She turned away abruptly and went back into Elizabeth's room, shutting the door firmly in his face. She did not see how ashen his complexion had turned at her words. He will kill me, Mr. Collins croaked out, stumbling around the corner and leaning against the wall, putting his hands over his face. O oh Lord, what have I done? Why hast thou forsaken me? Why didst thou put such temptation in my way, in the perfectly luscious, sensual form of my cousin, and then make her proud and foolish enough to refuse me? He had been standing there a moment or two, thinking angry thoughts of blame at everyone save for himself, when he heard Elizabeth's door open again. Charlotte had found the ice almost completely melted on Elizabeth's hot brow when she returned to her side. I'll run down and fetch more ice, she said softly, speaking to her friend even though she knew Elizabeth could not hear her. And a cup of tea for my poor throat. I'm sure Maria must be back by now. I shall send her to sit with you for a little while, Lizzie, my dear. She gathered a few things to take downstairs, placed the screen before the fire, and left the room with quick, determined steps, 
unaware that her husband watched as she walked down the stairs. Mr Collins stood staring at Elizabeth's door as Charlotte's footsteps faded away. How convenient it would be if my cousin simply never awoke, he murmured quietly to himself, before tiptoeing across the landing and very quietly easing open the door. For a long moment, he stood looking down at the lovely young woman in the bed, at her long dark eyelashes resting serenely on her cheeks, dark curls tumbling around her, at her full red lips, swollen and bruised. How foolish you have been, Elizabeth, he said softly. You brought this on yourself, you know, with your excessive pride, when you refused me. I, who enjoy the great condescension and patronage of Lady Catherine de Bourgh. And with that, he picked up a pillow that had fallen to the floor, put it over Elizabeth's face, and pressed down with both hands. Chapter 10 Oh, where is Charlotte, Mr Collins? Mariah's innocent voice at the door made him jump, and he quickly tucked the pillow behind Elizabeth's head, making it seem that he was just seeing to her comfort. "'Gone downstairs for a few moments, sister,' he said. "'Oh, I see. I'm sure that you have more important things to do than keep Elizabeth company, Mr Collins. Will you not let me sit with her?' "'You have such a fine understanding for one so young, dear sister.' Mr Collins bowed to her and swiftly departed. Mariah took the seat by Lizzie and lifted her hand, stroking her fingers gently. "'Dear Lizzie, I do not think it would be quite proper for us to let Mr Collins sit with you alone,' she murmured. "'I dare not say anything to Charlotte, but I cannot quite like the way that he looks at you, or me. Very young and quite silly, Mariah had been badly frightened by Elizabeth's accident. Seeing the older girl, who she greatly respected and admired, so still and silent, when Elizabeth was always so vibrantly alive, shocked her beyond measure. She was weeping a few silent, frightened tears into her handkerchief when Charlotte returned. Hush, Maria. Charlotte's gentle hand on her shoulder stiffened Maria's spine. It's all right. Lizzie will be well again soon. Pray do not distress yourself so. She felt by no means as confident as she made herself sound, but her sister needed the reassurance just then. I will sit with her, but please... I am sure that her family will soon descend upon us. Can I trouble you to check over the room that father used when he was here and ensure that it is ready to receive guests? Of course. Glad to be of use, Maria scrambled to her feet. And my room too, Charlotte, for I am sure that Jane will come. Shall I prepare to share it with her? I dare say Jane will wish to stay with Lizzie, Charlotte said gently. But we do not know who will come from Longbourn. Maria bit her lip. I hope Kitty and Lydia don't come, she said very quickly, feeling disloyal to her friends. I cannot think that either of them would be of much use. Charlotte looked at her little sister with pride. Unlike you, dear Maria, she said tenderly, kissing Maria's cheek and embracing her. You have been a very great deal of use. That made Maria blush before she scurried out to do Charlotte's bidding. Charlotte smiled before turning back to Elizabeth, taking the cloth from her brow and wrapping it around the ice she had brought up from the kitchen. "'Dear Lizzie,' she murmured softly. Carefully, she took another cloth, dampened it with a little fresh water, and wet her friend's lips, hoping to get her to drink a little at least. Disheartened when Elizabeth did not lick at the moisture, she did not give up, but tried again and again, forgetting about her own tea until it was quite cold. At last she was rewarded, as Elizabeth let out a slight sigh and licked at the water, her eyes opening briefly. "'Lizzie! Lizzie, can you hear me? To Charlotte! Oh, Lizzie, please speak to me!' Elizabeth's eyes opened again, but they were unfocused, unaware of her surroundings. She closed them, not even turning her head to the side, and did not move again despite Charlotte's urgings. Dr Trent, when he returned a little while later, was encouraging nevertheless, and full of praise for Charlotte's efforts. "'You have done magnificently well, Mrs Collins,' That she is even slightly responsive at this early stage is a wonderful sign. It is quite common for a stupor to ensue for a full twenty-four hours or more after a head wound of this magnitude has been sustained. Well done indeed, madam. Delighted at such happy news, Charlotte redoubled her efforts, changing to a healing tea instead of water at Dr. Trent's recommendation. She was rewarded by Elizabeth opening her eyes again, indeed looking around, though she did not seem to see Charlotte or the doctor sitting beside her. Where am I? 
she asked, in a slow voice quite unlike her normal tones. Lizzie, it is I, Charlotte. I am with you, Charlotte told her. Lizzie? Lizzie! But her friend's eyes had closed again. Hush, Mrs. Collins, Dr. Trent soothed, when the tears began to trickle down Charlotte's cheeks. She does very well. Some confusion is inevitable. I do not doubt that by tomorrow she shall seem quite her old self again, though she must take care to avoid exertion for some time yet. Gently he took the wet cloth from Charlotte's slack fingers and set it aside. Please sit down. You must get some rest and nourishment yourself. He tested Charlotte's untouched cup of tea, found it stone cold and shook his head. I will have Miss Lucas bring you some more tea and something to eat. Oh, of course. Charlotte fished her handkerchief from her apron pocket, blotted her eyes. I do not know how to thank you, Dr. Trent. You have been quite wonderful. He shook his head bashfully, cheeks colouring slightly. I am only doing my job, Mrs. Collins. Time and again I have seen that devoted nursing may effect a cure that the most skilled physicians in the world could not. Miss Bennet improves thanks to your efforts. It was Charlotte's turn to blush, and Trent left the room hastily, castigating himself. It was most inappropriate for him to be having tender feelings for a married woman, even if she was married to a complete poltroon. He found Mr. Collins downstairs castigating the tearful cook because dinner was not ready to be served at precisely five o'clock. The assistant housekeeper from Rosings, Mrs. Soward, had finally arrived, but was doing nothing to assist the cook, simply standing by watching the poor woman be browbeaten by her employer. Mr. Collins! Trent interrupted the tirade. If I might have a word with you? No doubt your dinner will arrive on the table far more expeditiously if you allow your staff to proceed in preparing it. He nodded to the cook, who gave him a tearful smile, and gave Mrs. Soward a hard stare. The woman jumped and hurried away, making herself busy quickly. "'What is it, Dr. Trent?' Mr. Collins said irritably, deprived of a victim for his annoyance. "'In your study, if you would, sir?' Trent gestured politely. Mr. Collins firmed his lips, but stalked ahead, leaving Trent to enter behind him and close the door. Trent watched with some distaste as Collins opened a concealed wall panel withdrew a decanter, and poured himself a hefty glass of brandy. Trent? Collins waved the decanter in his direction. Thank you, but no. I wish to discuss Miss Bennet's care. How soon can she be out of this house? Mr. Collins interrupted him to demand. Trent's eyebrows climbed almost to his hairline. I have not the pleasure of understanding you, Mr. Collins. Miss Bennet has behaved in a matter quite unbefitting a gentlewoman, and I will not have her in this house a moment longer than need be. Lady Catherine insisted that she be gone from under this roof by nightfall. Mr. Collins paused to look out of the window at the rapidly darkening sky and scowled. My lady wife declared it to be impossible since Miss Bennet is injured, but I am quite sure that the brazen hussy is not so wounded as all that. So I ask you again, Doctor, how soon can she be removed from my house? Utterly shocked, Dr. Trent had to fumble for a seat. "'What is wrong with you, man?' he expostulated, when he finally found his tongue again. "'Miss Bennet is grievously injured. Had not Colonel Fitzwilliam found her when he did, she might, probably would, have died. Your attitude, and that of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, towards a poor young lady who was an innocent victim of—' He paused suddenly, realised that Mr. Collins could be no more aware of the true nature of Elizabeth's injuries than his patroness— a most terrible accident, whose greatest sin is to be so charming and virtuous that she garners the admiration of all whom she encounters, is frankly disgusting. And you, sir, you call yourself a man of God? Disgusted, he stood up and moved to the door, turning only to say, Were it not a greater risk to move Miss Bennet now than not, I should have her removed to my own house for recuperation. She has bewitched you too, Mr. Collins shouted, quite beyond reason. Dr. Trent's face flushed and he clenched his fists. "'Not every person thinks only of the most disgusting possible motives, Mr. Collins,' he said coldly. "'I would gladly sleep outside upon the cold ground, in full view of every person who should pass my door, rather than for one moment risk the slightest stain upon a lady's reputation. It is a disgrace upon you and upon your profession that apparently you cannot feel the same way.' The door slammed behind him as he walked out. Chapter 11 Darcy and Fitzwilliam's valets were both rather exasperated to discover that their respective masters had changed their minds yet again, but being efficient servants, soon had their employer's bags packed ready for departure. The horses were harnessed to Darcy's carriage, 
the trunks loaded aboard, and the two gentlemen mounted their riding horses ready for departure. Neither of them wished to take any further leave of Lady Catherine, so they departed without fanfare, traversing the five miles to the town of Sevenoaks without needing to pass the Hunsford Parsonage, leaving the residents of that house quite unaware of their departure. Arriving at the inn at about five in the afternoon, they found the innkeeper rather confused as to why such important guests should wish to stay at his humble establishment, but very eager to please. The inn's best rooms were soon put at their disposal, and an admirable meal of pigeon pie, roasted pork and cheeses set before them in a private parlour. After their meal, Fitzwilliam stood and stretched. "'I had best go write some letters, Darcy, old chap. Let the Major General know I will be delayed a few days. Would you like me to write to father?' "'Inform him that Lady Catherine is likely to be impossible for a while "'now that you have finally told her you won't marry Anne?' "'Darcy nodded, eyes on the empty plate before him. "'Thank you, Richard. "'I take it you will write to Georgie "'and let her know that we will not be arriving in London as planned?' "'Of course. "'I will see you in the morning, then.' "'Going into his room, Darcy looked around. "'His man had set out his writing desk, "'well aware that he would probably have letters to write, "'and he should indeed send a note to Georgiana,' as well as her companion Mrs. Annesley, and probably to his London man of business. Standing looking down at the paper laid out neatly in readiness for him, though, he could not help but think of the last letter he wrote. An oath escaped his lips, and he spun on his heel. In the morning would do. He could not face that taunting, mocking, blank paper tonight. Could not stand to be alone with the little voice in the back of his head mocking him, telling him that it was all his fault that Elizabeth had been hurt, that she must have been distressed, looking at his letter although he still couldn't understand how Mr. Collins had come into possession of it. Surely Elizabeth would not have given it to him. Darcy thought about going into the tap room and ordering a pint of ale, but the room was noisy and smoky, and he did not wish for people to begin speculating about him. Instead, he walked out into the inn's courtyard, taking a few breaths of the crisp evening air. It was still light, though barely, the sky fading to a deep lavender colour as he looked up. The post-coach came in just then, in a great clatter of hooves and wheels, men shouting. Darcy retreated to a quiet spot beside the door and stood still, watching the disturbance of folks rushing about, bags being hauled off, a young lady getting out and going over to the innkeeper. She seemed somehow familiar. Perhaps it was just her bonnet. He had seen one in that exact shade of blue not so long ago. The lady turned to walk away from the departing coach, and he saw her face. Darcy rushed forward. "'Miss Bennet!' Jane was just speaking to the innkeeper, asking directions to Hunsford, when Darcy came dashing up to them. Her mouth fell open in surprise. "'Mr. Darcy! "'Miss Bennet, no doubt you were seeking to get to your sister. "'You came post... alone?' He looked a bit shocked, but not entirely disapproving. Jane shrugged, looking up at him. "'My aunt and uncle were from home when the express arrived, "'not expected back until the evening. "'I could not wait.' So I checked the post-coach timetable, gathered a few things, and took a hackney cab to the Bolton Tun on Fleet Street. I was able to get a ticket on the three o'clock coach, but no one could tell me how far it is from Sevenoaks to Hunsford exactly. Is it far? Shall I be able to walk the distance? Certainly not, Darcy exclaimed in horror. It is almost five miles to the parsonage, Miss Bennet. Even your sister would balk at walking so far, and at night it should surely not be attempted. Pray, allow me to send you in my carriage— I'm sure the innkeeper can provide a maid to attend you, and the carriage will bring her back afterwards. My cousin and I intend to visit in the morning. You know, then, about Elizabeth? Jane gulped, and he could see that she was barely holding in tears. How badly, how badly is she hurt? I have spoken to the doctor who treated her, and he is confident she will recover, Darcy said kindly, seeing her obvious distress and fear for Elizabeth. He was painfully reminded of the way that Elizabeth had rushed to Netherfield to nurse Jane when she was ill, of the deep and loving bond between the two sisters. Taking a deep breath, he offered Jane his arm. "'Now, I pray you come inside, Miss Bennet. I will procure you a private parlour and a maid while my carriage is readied, and something to eat, I think. You must be hungry, and I think the parsonage will be in an uproar. You would be lucky to get a meal tonight.' Jane was quite happy to let Mr. Darcy take charge. She had never heard him speak so many words together before, but he was being most excessively kind and considerate. Within five minutes, she found herself seated in a comfy little parlour, a maid bringing her tea to drink, and a very tasty bowl of hot soup with crusty bread and a pat of fresh butter. Just as Jane finished her meal, 
Mr. Darcy re-entered the room and bowed to her. Miss Bennet, my carriage is ready to take you on to Hunsford. I have arranged for the maid Susan who brought your dinner to accompany you there, and of course my trusted driver Jakes and two footmen to ensure your safety. I hope you find your sister improved, and I will call in the morning with my cousin to see how she does. Jane smiled up at him with great relief. Oh, Mr. Darcy, you have been so very kind. I owe you a great debt. It is the least I can do, Miss Bennet, he said, seeming embarrassed, and escorted her out to a very fine carriage. You must take prodigious care of Miss Bennet, and escort her to the Hunsford Parsonage as swiftly as you can, he instructed his driver, while handing Jane up inside. Then return here with Miss Susan. The Colonel and I will go to Hunsford in the morning, be ready to depart at nine, I think? Then we will arrive there around ten, which should give the Miss Bennets and Mrs Collins time to prepare for the day. He smiled kindly at Jane, nodded at the inmate who was sitting quietly in a corner of the carriage, and closed the door. Bemused by such extraordinary kindness on Mr Darcy's part, Jane leaned back against the almost sinfully comfortable seat and tried to relax. She hoped her aunt and uncle were not too worried about her. She left them a note clearly stating what she intended to do. No doubt they would be following on tomorrow in her uncle's carriage, but Jane, on receipt of the express just after noon, had decided there was not a minute to lose. She had not even packed, just grabbed her reticule and put all of the money she had into it, silently thankful that her father had been so generous with her allowance and that she had been feeling too heartsick to want to spend it. Checking the itinerary of post-coaches which her uncle kept in his office, she had found one which departed for Sevenoaks at three every afternoon, from an inn not too far away from Gracechurch Street. Lizzie's last letter to her had mentioned that they went to market at Sevenoaks one day, so it could not be too far from Hunsford, Jane reasoned. She was quite decided. One way or another, she would be with Elizabeth tonight. Jane wrote a note for her aunt and uncle and left it on her uncle's desk. And then she put on her pelisse and bonnet, laced on her sturdiest boots, collected her reticule and asked the footman to hail her a hackney cab. He was reluctant to let her go out alone, but she claimed she was only going a few streets to visit a friend and had left a note for her aunt, so he eventually agreed. And now, here she was, in a plush carriage owned by Mr Darcy. Mr Darcy! Rushing through the darkness to get to Lizzie. Thank goodness she had found him. Jane could not have imagined any way quicker to get to her sister. It still seemed to be taking an interminably long time, for all she could tell that they were travelling fast. The carriage lamps cast little glow outside, but she could see trees and hedges rushing past and hear the thunder of the horse's hooves. At long last the carriage slowed, and Jane peered out of the window, trying to see. She made out a house, but they kept going, and finally stopped in front of the gate of the next house along the lane. The door swung open, and the footman put down the step, then extended a gloved hand. Hunsford Parsonage, Miss Bennet. Thank you, Jane said, stepping down gracefully. Your reticule, miss, the inmaid spoke, the first words Jane had heard from her yet. Oh, thank you. Susan, is it? Jane dug in her reticule and found a sixpence. Here, I pray you have this. I am very grateful that you accompanied me. Oh, no, miss, I couldn't thank you so much. The fine gentleman already paid me handsomely. The girl put her hands behind her back and refused obstinately. So Jane sighed and put her money away. Well, it is yet one more thing that I shall have to thank Mr Darcy for, I suppose. She thanked the coach driver and footman prettily too, and by that time the parsonage door had opened, and Mr Collins was hurrying down the path, holding a lantern high. What is it? What calamity? Is Lady Catherine taken ill? He stopped at the sight of Jane. Miss Bennet, what are you doing here? I am here to attend my sister, Mr Collins. I am sorry to trespass upon your hospitality without notice, Jane said, dipping him a small curtsy, and then, since he did not seem inclined to escort her inside, she stepped around him and walked determinedly towards the Chapter door. Chapter 12 Jane, thank God you are come! Jane's eyes welled with tears as she saw Charlotte hurrying down the stairs. She put her arms around her friend and hugged her tight. Tell me quickly, how is Lizzie? she begged desperately. I came as fast as I could. I did not dare to hope that you should be here so soon, Jane. It is truly wonderful. Charlotte squeezed her hand. Lizzie is a little better. The doctor just left a few minutes ago. He has been marvellous. But he was up all night birthing Mrs Gorman's new babe and had no sleep. I made him go home to rest and eat. Jane did not care. She only wanted to get to her Lizzie. 
Almost tearing her bonnet ribbons in her haste to remove it, she dragged it from her head and rushed after Charlotte, disregarding Mr. Collins' petulant voice downstairs, remarking about late-arriving guests being a sign of great ill-breeding. "'Oh, Lizzie!' Jane whispered, when finally she came into her sister's presence. Elizabeth looked so pale, so small and frail. Sinking to sit on the bed beside her, Jane seized Elizabeth's hands in hers, chafed them gently. "'I am here now, Lizzie. Your Jane is here. I will not leave you day or night until you are well again. I want only to nurse you with the loving devotion you showed me at Netherfield.' Tears trickling down her cheeks, she kissed Elizabeth's hands, reached to caress her cheek. "'She does not wake, Charlotte?' "'She has roused, but she did not seem to know me. Her eyes did not see me. The doctor said that she has done very well to rouse so quickly at all, and he hopes that she will do better tomorrow.' Jane reached carefully to lift the cloth, the very cold cloth, she found, on Elizabeth's brow, sucked in a sharply horrified breath at the colour and size of the contusion beneath it. "'Lizzie! Oh, dear Lord!' She firmed her lips, wiped away the tears on her cheeks. "'You have been icing this, Charlotte? Do you have any fresh ice?' "'Maria has just gone down to get some,' Charlotte nodded, and at that moment Maria scratched at the door. Soon they had a fresh ice pack prepared. Charlotte sent Maria to her room for a while and went to get fresh tea. "'Thank you, Charlotte,' Jane said softly as Charlotte handed her a cup. "'I do not know what we should do without your kindness.' Charlotte only shook her head, wondering if she should tell Jane the truth. It was an unbearable burden for her to carry alone, and one person in Elizabeth's family should surely know. Charlotte did not think she could quite bear to speak to Mr. Bennet of it, and any of the other Bennet ladies were quite out of the question— even if they were here. Jane, though, would never tell the secret, would never judge Elizabeth. And while most people thought Jane Bennet soft and weak, Charlotte knew the strength of the other woman's character. Taking a deep breath, Charlotte said softly, Jane, there is something I must tell you. Poor Jane, who until that moment had not suspected that such wickedness existed in the world. She listened with an incredulous expression, with mounting disbelief to Charlotte's account until, as she finished speaking, Charlotte stood, drew back the blanket covering Elizabeth, and gently unlaced the neck of her nightgown to show the bruises and scrapes upon her bosom. Charlotte had expected more tears, had expected anguish. She hadn't expected Jane's exquisite face to grow as still and cold as though she had been carved from finest marble. "'Who would dare touch my sister so?' Jane snapped, enraged. "'She is by no means unprotected!' My father and uncle will see that whoever has done this suffers to the end of his days. She retied Elizabeth's nightgown with fingers that shook with rage, covered her sister gently. We will find the miscreant who has done this foul deed, she said, her voice ringing with righteous rage. And we will make him pay. Mr. Collins, preparing for bed in his own room nearby, heard Jane's raised voice, her angry vow, and began to tremble. Crawling under the bed covers, he closed his eyes tight, but sleep did not come to him that night. Jane ground her teeth, slowly stilling her rage. In all her life, she had never been one fraction so angry as she felt in that moment. If she could only lay her hands on the fiend who had so injured her Lizzie, she thought that she might have torn him limb from limb her own self. Charlotte spoke to her, asking how she came to arrive so fast, and Jane managed to gather her wits enough to respond tolerably, explaining how she had caught the post and fortuitously met with Mr. Darcy at Sevenoaks. "'Mr. Darcy was at Sevenoaks?' Charlotte asked in confusion. "'Indeed, which seems odd indeed. He said that he should call here tomorrow morning. But has he not been staying with his aunt? In her last letter, Lizzie wrote that you had all dined at Rosings Park with Mr. Darcy and his cousin, a Colonel something or other. Colonel Fitzwilliam, indeed.' Puzzled, Charlotte shook her head. Well, I dare say that shall be explained tomorrow. Looking at Elizabeth, resting quietly just now, she reached out and touched Jane's hand. Come, we must pass the time somehow. Will you not tell me of what you have been doing in London? They talked until very late, until Charlotte's eyes grew heavy and she struggled to stay awake. Jane reached out and grasped her shoulder lightly. Please, Charlotte, go and get some rest. Jane roused her friend gently. I will stay with Lizzie. Weary? But unutterably glad to no longer be bearing the burden of her secret alone, Charlotte stood and hugged Jane. 
Bolt the door behind me, dear Jane, she murmured quietly before taking her leave. Obeying Charlotte's directive, Jane paused to look around the room. The fire was burning low, so she added another log, checked Elizabeth's brow. It was too warm, but considering what Charlotte had told her, it would be no surprise if Lizzie was to suffer at least a little fever, lying in a cold stream for who knew how long. Gently, Jane dampened a cloth and wiped her sister's face and hands, seeking to cool her. Elizabeth woke a few times in the night, mumbling and tossing about, her eyes opening, but as Charlotte had said, she did not seem truly aware of her surroundings. She quieted again when Jane spoke to her gently and stroked her brow, and once she whispered Jane's name. A little after dawn, Elizabeth's fever broke, and her skin once again felt cool. Sighing with relief, Jane stood and stretched wearily, going to peer out of the window. Exhausted herself, Jane thought that she might just lie down beside Elizabeth for a little while. Curling a protective arm around her sister, she fell asleep within moments. Jane woke to find Lizzie muttering in her sleep. No! Mr. Darcy, no! Tears leaked from beneath her closed eyelids. Hush, Lizzie, hush! Jane soothed gently, stroking Elizabeth's hair. It is all right. Your Jane is here with you. "'You must not, Mr. Darcy,' Elizabeth sobbed, and Jane redoubled her efforts to soothe her. Finally, Elizabeth quieted and drifted back into a deeper sleep, leaving Jane unnerved and jittery. "'Surely not,' she thought, gazing at the slowly brightening window. "'Surely Mr. Darcy could not possibly have done this.' But Charlotte had, after all, said that he had been in their company several times, and she believed he admired Lizzie. Had he perhaps made a less than honourable offer?' and become angry when Lizzie refused him? Jane did not want to believe it. But the inescapable fact was that somebody had done this terrible thing to Elizabeth, and Lizzie herself was the only person who could tell them who. Chapter 13 Darcy was up before dawn, pacing impatiently until his cousin hammered on the door of his room. Will you stop that infernal pacing, Darcy? I could have had another hour of sleep had your great boots clomping on the floor not drummed me out of bed. His eyes twinkled with humour, and Darcy managed a small smile. "'Sorry, Richard. I could sleep no longer. I am too concerned for Miss Elizabeth.' "'Have you slept at all?' Richard looked at the dark circles beneath Darcy's eyes, had his suspicions confirmed when his cousin shrugged and looked away. "'Well, at least I can make sure you are fed. Come, Darcy, we can't go anywhere for some while yet. Let us give Mrs Collins time to start the day. Time for Dr Trent to attend to Miss Bennet again, too.' Darcy heaved a deep breath. "'You're quite correct, damn you.' Weary and saddened, he didn't resist his cousin when Richard put a strong arm around his shoulders and towed him off to find breakfast. His thoughts full of Elizabeth, he did not think to mention Jane's arrival and subsequent departure for the parsonage the previous evening. The two cousins arrived at the parsonage promptly at ten in the morning. Charlotte came down to speak with them and was able to tell them that Lizzie passed a restless night with fever but now seemed to be resting comfortably. Dr. Trent had already called to see her, and pronounced himself cautiously pleased that the contusion on her head was less swollen and a better colour today. He expected to call back a little later, and they should try to wake her then, if Elizabeth did not show any signs of activity beforehand. After hearing their grateful expressions of relief, Charlotte excused herself for a few moments to go up and speak with Jane and get the latest news. Jane, seeing the gentleman arrive from the window, seated herself beside Elizabeth and took her hand gently. "'Darling sister,' she said softly, "'I cannot believe that Mr. Darcy would have done this to you. "'Oh, dear Lizzie, will you not now wake? "'Your Jane is here to care for you. "'I want so much for you to be well again, "'so that we may go back to Longbourn, "'and all will be as it was before.' "'Charlotte came into the room then, saying, "'Jane, Mr. Darcy and his cousin Colonel Fitzwilliam are here "'to inquire after Lizzie. "'Pray, is there any news I might share with them?' Does she yet show signs of awakening? The doctor will be here soon. Jane, look! Lizzie's eyelids fluttered, and she looked up at Jane from eyes that were finally focusing properly. Jane? Lizzie! Oh, Lizzie, thank God! Jane struggled not to cry. Dearest, you are back with us. Do you know where you are? She blinked and looked around the room, moving only her eyes because of the pain in her head, spotting Charlotte standing near the door. I am still in Hunsford, am I not? Why are you here, Jane? Oh, Lizzie, you've been hurt. Who did this to you, Lizzie? Who hurt you? T. 
tears began to slip down Elizabeth's cheeks as she remembered the awful fight, the callous things she had said, the dreadful way in which Mr. Darcy had insulted her family while smugly expecting her to accept his proposal. He had hurt Jane, the best, the sweetest, kindest person on the face of the earth, with his officious interference. "'Oh, Jane!' she sobbed. "'Mr. Darcy, you know not what he has done!' Jane's face hardened, and she stood up. "'Mr. Darcy!' It was not a question. She could see the distress on her sister's face, Elizabeth, who hardly ever cried. Jane turned and walked out of the room, almost in a trance. Charlotte, torn between not wanting to leave Elizabeth alone and thinking that she should go after Jane, looked from one to the other in an agony of indecision. Her mind was made up when Elizabeth whispered, "'Charlotte, my head hurts so!' The doctor has left something for that, but he cautioned us not to give it until you are lucid, Charlotte said, coming to the bed and lifting her bottle and spoon. Oh, Lizzie, I can hardly believe it, that Mr. Darcy would do this to you. Elizabeth frowned, fighting the agony in her head. Do what? He was very rude, but he has injured Jane more than I. Charlotte blinked. Lizzie, what is the last thing that you remember? Another tear slipped down Elizabeth's cheek. Mr. Darcy came to see me. I pretended I had a headache so I didn't have to go to Rosings. He told me that he deliberately separated Jane from Mr. Bingley. Oh, dear Lord! Charlotte grabbed her hand. He didn't touch you? He didn't hurt you? Who was it, Lizzie? Elizabeth only stared blankly at her, and Charlotte realised she had no more time to ask questions. She turned and ran after Jane. Downstairs, both Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam were wearing a path in the rug, pacing with anxiety, though on opposite sides of the room so they did not collide. The door opened, and the colonel turned, but it was not Mrs. Collins who walked in. It was a tall, stunningly beautiful blonde lady, who spared him a single dismissive glance. He had been given the cut direct less thoroughly by duchesses, walked across the room to Darcy, drew back her arm, and slapped him as hard as she possibly could across the face. Darcy's head snapped to one side with the force of the blow, and then he looked back at the blonde beauty. Fitzwilliam was already calling her Freya, the Viking goddess of battle, in his mind, and said, I dare say I deserve that, Miss Bennet. You dare say? You dare say? You despicable monster! Fitzwilliam might have expected a Valkyrie screech, but no, her voice came out soft and sweet, tremulous with tears. I will see you suffer for this if it is the last thing I do. She slapped him again on the other cheek. That is all the punishment I can give on my poor sister's behalf, but be assured that she is by no means unprotected. Wait a minute, Fitzwilliam moved forward. Darcy didn't hurt Miss Elizabeth. I heard it from her own lips, sir, the goddess turned on him. Wait, what? Darcy exclaimed, bemused. Darcy would never seek to impose himself on a woman in such a way. Fitzwilliam was absolutely sure of that. Darcy was too concerned for Miss Elizabeth anyway. Only after he had already said the words did he realise that Darcy was not yet aware the extent of Elizabeth's injuries. What? Darcy staggered. Impose myself? On Miss Elizabeth? What do you mean? Darcy. Fitzwilliam sought to mitigate the damage by telling him straight. It appears that someone may have taken advantage of Miss Elizabeth. Her injuries suggest it. Darcy fell to his knees, his hands coming up to his face. No, he choked out. No, not her, not Elizabeth. Jane stood staring uncertainly from the suddenly shocked, collapsed Mr. Darcy to the tall man who she had ignored on entering the room. He was a very big man, she thought suddenly, not quite so tall as Mr. Darcy, but even broader of frame. He had neatly cut brown hair, dark blue eyes that seemed to pierce right through her, and a squarish, not quite handsome face. He wore an air of command like a cloak, and Jane realised that this must be the cousin Elizabeth had mentioned in her letters, and Charlotte had talked about the previous evening. "'Colonel Fitzwilliam,' she said warily. "'At your service,' he bowed automatically. "'And you are a Miss Bennet?' "'The Miss Bennet,' she corrected, also reverting to politesse. "'I am Elizabeth's eldest sister. "'It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, albeit under such trying circumstances. "'Miss Bennet, you must allow me to assure you that my cousin Darcy would never harm any woman, 
and most particularly not Miss Elizabeth. I have reason to believe that he holds her in very great regard. Richard glanced at Darcy, who was crouched, his hands over his eyes, holding in wrenching sobs. My sister named Mr. Darcy as her attacker, sir, Jane said, though she glanced uncertainly at Mr. Darcy. At that very moment, Charlotte came rushing into the room. Jane, don't! Oh, dear Lord, as she saw the keening Darcy. Colonel, it is a misunderstanding. Elizabeth does not remember being attacked. She remembers nothing since seeing Mr. Darcy the night before last and arguing with him. Oh! Jane stared in horror at Mr. Darcy. Oh, my God, what I accused him of! He will never forgive me! And I struck him! She brought her hands to her face and began to tremble. What have I done? Miss Bennet. Suddenly she was transformed from the magnificent Valkyrie into a distraught young girl. Fitzwilliam wanted nothing more than to take her into his arms and comfort her, but all he could do was offer his handkerchief as tears began to slip down her cheeks. I do not doubt my cousin will forgive you. He seemed to think perhaps he had committed some offence against you, which might have justified your actions anyway, but as you can see he is deeply distraught at the discovery of Miss Elizabeth's... accident. I must beg for a few moments alone with him, so that I may help him regain his equanimity, and then I promise that we will both help you see that the miscreant responsible is brought to justice. I will do anything in my power to aid you, Miss Bennet. I swear my oath upon it. She nodded mutely, and Charlotte caught her arm. Come, Jane, we must go back to Lizzie. I left her very confused. And we shall leave the Colonel and Mr. Darcy together. No one will disturb you here, sir she assured Fitzwilliam as she pulled the door shut behind Chapter her. Chapter 14 Where is Mr. Collins? Jane asked wearily as she and Charlotte ascended the stairs. I sent him over to the church. Today is Saturday, and as I cannot help with the flowers and arrangements for tomorrow, I sent him with Maria to consult with the verger and his wife. Charlotte compressed her lips. Mr. Collins said some rather unchristian things about Lizzie yesterday, and I made it clear that I felt the sentiments unworthy of him, and that he should spend his time today in church consulting the Lord and meditating on God's love for all mankind and willingness to forgive, rather than Lady Catherine's intolerance for anything which does not precisely suit her wishes. "'I say, well done, Charlotte,' Elizabeth said weakly, overhearing the last of that little speech as they re-entered her room. "'It is about time someone pointed out to Mr. Collins that Lady Catherine, benevolent and omniscient as he believes her to be, is a poor substitute for the Almighty.' Both Jane and Charlotte smiled to hear Elizabeth sounding so much like her usual pert self. Hurrying to her sister's side, Jane clutched her hand. Oh, Lizzie, dearest, you have given us all such a fright. Elizabeth's smile was bemused. Jane, I cannot understand. Why are you here? Jane looked at Charlotte, unsure what to say. Charlotte seated herself on the other side of the bed and reached out to take Elizabeth's other hand in hers. What do you remember, dearest? Elizabeth's head still hurt abominably, though the small dose of laudanum Charlotte had administered was dulling the pain to a slow thump instead of frantic drumming. She frowned, glanced at Jane. "'I remember Mr. Darcy coming to see me,' she said haltingly. "'When you were all gone to dinner at Rosings. We argued, and he left. I was upset, and I went to bed before you returned.' Charlotte shook her head. "'That was the day before yesterday.' Do you remember anything of yesterday at all? Wide-eyed, Elizabeth started to shake her head, grimaced, and said, No! Why, what happened? You suffered a nasty fall, Charlotte said, after another speaking glance at Jane. Colonel Fitzwilliam found you fallen down a bank into the stream that runs along the eastern lane. Your head was bleeding. Oh! Elizabeth blinked a few times. Well, that explains why my head feels as though it is cracked open. It is! Do not joke about it, Lizzie, Jane said fiercely, clutching at her handkerchief and blotting her eyes. I have had the fright of my life. But do you truly not remember what happened before your fall? You should rest now, Lizzie, Charlotte said, cutting her eyes meaningfully at Jane. Dr. Trent will be back to see you soon, and I do not doubt he will have a lot more questions for you. Elizabeth sighed, her eyes closing. I feel so very tired. Her fingers tightened around Jane's for a moment. I am glad you are here, Jane. I am so sorry about Mr. Bingley. Her voice trailed off to a whisper, her fingers going lax. I care nothing for Mr. Bingley, Jane cried out, very much overwrought. 
only that you should be well again, Lizzie. But Elizabeth had once again lapsed into unconsciousness. Jane covered her face with her hands and sighed raggedly, rubbing hard at her cheeks. Moving behind her, Charlotte laid her hands on Jane's shoulders gently and rubbed, trying to ease her. Breathe, dear Jane. All will be well. Mr Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam will help us to find whoever did this terrible thing and bring him to justice. But Lizzie, Jane said into her hands, Lizzie's reputation, she will be ruined, Charlotte. I am assured of the gentleman's discretion, Charlotte said quietly. And other than the two of them, only you, I and the doctor are apprised of the truth of the situation. We will endeavour to limit the knowledge to that group only. Jane only shook her head. The truth will out, Charlotte. You know it as well as I. The truth is that nothing happened, Charlotte said fiercely. At least as far as Elizabeth remembers. Someone knows, Charlotte, Jane said quietly but coldly. The man who did this to her knows. They looked at each other for a moment. The man who did this to her knows, Jane repeated slowly. And only we two, the doctor, and the two gentlemen besides? That's right, Charlotte nodded. So if we hear anyone else speak of it, we could trace the rumour back to its source and find the culprit. Jane brightened excitedly. I do not think that should be our task, dear Jane, Charlotte managed a small chuckle. Colonel Fitzwilliam offered his services to track down the miscreant, and I have no doubt that Mr Darcy will be just as eager to help. Who is this Colonel Fitzwilliam you keep speaking of? Jane asked in confusion. Why, you met him downstairs. Oh, I dare say you did not, Charlotte said, and Jane blushed. No, I fear I was too agitated. Oh dear, I believe I must go and apologise to Mr Darcy. Jane touched her fingers to her brow agitatedly. I struck him. Whatever must he think of me? He will think that you were quite rightly inflamed with rage on Elizabeth's behalf and think the more of you for it. Charlotte embraced her warmly. But I'm afraid you really should apologise to him anyway. Will you stay with Lizzie? Of course I shall. We shall not leave her alone for a moment between the two of us, Jane, Charlotte vowed. Jane smiled wearily and kissed her cheek before straightening her spine and descending the stairs again. Mr Darcy was hunched over in an armchair, hands pressed to his eyes, when Jane re-entered the parlour. A tall, handsome, brown-haired man, who she recalled now had indeed been present before he had given her his handkerchief, which she still held clutched tightly in her hand, rose from a kneeling position at Mr Darcy's side and made her a graceful bow. Miss Bennet, she glanced at Darcy, who seemed unaware of her presence, lost in his own distress, and shrugged mentally. Dropping a slight curtsy, she managed a small smile. Colonel Fitzwilliam? At your service, Miss Bennet. I regret our lack of formal introduction, but... He gestured a little helplessly at his cousin. I'm afraid Darcy is in no fit state to be of assistance. He seems uncommonly distressed, Colonel. Jane could not help but say queryingly. Of course he... He stopped, peered at her. You do not know, he said, enlightened. Darcy must have hidden his feelings very well while in Hertfordshire, but considering how much Miss Elizabeth told me of you and how close the two of you are, I would have thought that she would have written to you about their courtship here. Their what? Jane blanched with shock, found the colonel suddenly at her side, taking her elbow and guiding her to a chair clear across the room from the distraught, oblivious Darcy. Darcy has been courting Miss Elizabeth ever since we arrived in Kent some weeks hence, the colonel explained quietly, kneeling before her, in his own inimitably useless way. I do not understand, Jane said plaintively. Elizabeth? Glancing at Darcy, she lowered her voice to a whisper. The very first time they saw each other, Mr Darcy said to his friend that he found Lizzie tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt him. She overheard, and... And she was thoroughly offended, the colonel murmured, beginning to add things up in his head. And being Miss Elizabeth, she probably said something pert and not a little rude to try and gain some measure of revenge. Darcy was intrigued, and has quite failed to realise that she has never forgiven him, even while he fell in love with her for the way she refused to swoon over him like every other woman he knows. Jane stared, her eyes as wide as saucers. My cousin is an absolute idiot! Fitzwilliam said with great feeling, and Jane had to clap her hand over her mouth in order not to laugh out loud. 
If she began, she felt that she might never stop. Perhaps, perhaps we might take a turn about the garden so that we can discuss these developments without distressing him further, she whispered at last. I owe him a very great apology, but I do think that I would like to understand better what has gone on these last weeks. It is never a hardship to escort a lady as lovely as yourself around a garden on a fine spring day, Fitzwilliam said charmingly, and not at all untruthfully, standing and offering Chapter his arm. Chapter 15 Jane collected her bonnet in the hall, and they proceeded out into the garden. The colonel offered his arm gallantly, and she accepted, weary from the panic dash to Kent and the long night spent at Elizabeth's side. They walked for a few moments while Jane gathered her thoughts into some sort of order, Fitzwilliam remaining quiet while she mused, though he had a number of questions he dearly wished to ask her. At last Jane spoke. "'You are quite certain of Mr. Darcy's feelings, Colonel?' "'I could not be more so, Miss Bennet. Darcy and I are cousins, less than a year apart in age. He is my closest friend, and has been so for my entire life.' Fitzwilliam smiled. "'I had not seen him in Miss Elizabeth's presence for above five minutes, before I was well aware of his feelings.' his extraordinary jealousy that she laughed and smiled as I spoke with her, his... he swallowed the word desire, very great admiration of her person and her wit. I cannot fathom it. Jane shook her head. Lizzie is convinced he looks at her only to find fault, and he has made his opinion of our family quite clear. Why, Lizzie is so set against him that she is convinced that it was his persuasion that has kept Mr. Bingley away from Netherfield Park. Fitzwilliam started looked closely at Jane for a moment. "'You are acquainted with Mr. Bingley?' "'He is the reason for our acquaintance with your cousin, sir.' Jane gave him a puzzled glance. "'Mr. Bingley leased Netherfield Park, a neighbouring estate to Longbourn, our home, this autumn past, and Mr. Darcy was his guest there for some weeks.' "'I think I may have made a rather egregious error,' Fitzwilliam said faintly. "'Sir?' Jane gazed up at him. "'The only question was—' Which of the Bennet sisters had Bingley been in love with? Elizabeth? No. Fitzwilliam could not believe that Darcy would have stooped so low as to discourage Bingley's courtship of Elizabeth solely because he wanted her for himself. Miss Bennet was the more likely prospect, and from what he knew of Bingley, very much the other man's type. There were objections to this beautiful, sweetly-mannered lady. Well, he had thought her a Valkyrie earlier, but she had just cause— Jane Bennet was unquestionably a gentlewoman, though, and given the Bingley family's background in trade, she would be an excellent match. What was it Darcy had said, though, that there were serious objections to the Bennet family? Elizabeth had talked of them with fondness a number of times, of her younger sisters, silly but growing yet, and her father, buried in his books, even her mother, sadly desperate to marry at least one of us off well, due to the unfortunate situation of the entail. She had laughed at her own descriptions, but Fitzwilliam had heard the love in her voice, and could not believe that any one who Elizabeth Bennet held in any esteem at all could be less than worthy of respect at the very least. Sir, Jane squeezed his arm lightly, and Fitzwilliam shook himself out of his reverie, though he could not help but remember the way that Elizabeth had excused herself so hastily after their conversation two days ago, how she had claimed a headache and not come to dinner at Rosings, how Darcy had disappeared. "'I am well, Miss Bennet, just struck by a sudden thought,' he said lightly. "'Here, step this way. "'Mr. Collins is very proud of his rose garden. "'I have heard him wax rhapsodic over it a number of times.' "'What went on between Darcy and Elizabeth that evening?' he wondered. "'Well, he would just have to pry it out of Darcy. "'If Fitzwilliam had made the situation worse with his disastrous remarks about Bingley "'and Darcy's efforts to take care of his friend, "'well, then it was incumbent on him to fix the situation.' Darcy took Bingley from Hertfordshire to remove himself from temptation, Fitzwilliam realised in a sudden burst of enlightenment. Of course! While the daughter of a mere country gentleman was a good match for Bingley, for the master of Pemberley to make such an alliance would cause quite a stir in society. I thought better of you than to care for the ton's opinion, Darcy, Fitzwilliam thought, his lips setting in a tight line. What a tangled web you have woven here! and in so doing you have probably broken this poor angel's heart. He'd heard Elizabeth speak a few times of her eldest sister's recent melancholy, though never of the reason for it. He cast a sideways look at Jane, leaning over to scent a rose, her delicate hand cupping the petals, 
a soft smile lighting her beautiful features briefly as she inhaled. Well, I certainly cannot fault Bingley's taste. The colonel seemed to have overcome his temporary distraction, his eyes thoughtful as he looked at her now. Jane straightened up from her inspection of the rose and turned back to look directly at him. Mrs Collins told me that you offered to assist in the investigation of what happened to Lizzie, sir. Jane kept her voice low, a murmur that could not possibly be overheard by anyone but the two of them. Indeed, Miss Bennet, Fitzwilliam agreed immediately, inclining his head, speaking quietly also. Such an attack cannot be permitted to go unpunished. Who knows but that next time the victim might not be able to escape? You think that Elizabeth escaped? Jane asked, curious at his choice of words. I do. Darcy and I returned to the spot where I found her before we came here this morning. There had been a storm just before the incident, and the ground was muddied, but the weather has been dry since. We were clearly able to discern the prints of a lady's half-boots, the spacing too wide for the pace to be a walk, and the marks where I believe Miss Elizabeth slipped and fell down the stream bank. She was running, Miss Bennet, running from her attacker, and I found no sign of a man's boot prints other than my own on that path. She was attacked somewhere else and ran that way, Jane concluded, puzzled. But why? Charlotte told me that you found her while walking from Rosings to the parsonage. Would Lizzie not have run here to safety? Why run towards Rosings? Perhaps her attacker was between here and the place where the path starts, Fitzwilliam suggested. Here, if you walk this way with me, we can see. He accompanied her to the garden's side gate walked with her along the lane to where the path began. Jane turned and looked back. "'You think that she was attacked somewhere between here and there?' she said disbelievingly. "'But there are two other houses from which they might have been seen. The doctor's house there, and that cottage.' She was quite correct, Fitzwilliam realised. Not just a pretty face, this Miss Bennet. He castigated himself for even thinking such a thing. "'I found her not more than a couple of minutes' walk from this spot,' he said thoughtfully. Would you like to see the place? Jane hesitated, then shook her head. No, no, not today, sir. Please, may we go back? Of course. He mentally kicked himself again. What a stupid thing to suggest. My apologies if my situation distressed you, Miss Bennet. It was in no way my intention. I fear I have spent too much time among soldiers and my manners have suffered for it. She bestowed a radiantly sweet smile upon him. Indeed not, sir. You must not think so. I only thought that we should perhaps see if your cousin is recovered enough to talk. Mrs. Collins and I realise something important, you see. Pray enlighten me, Fitzwilliam requested, returning her smile helplessly. No wonder Bingley fell for her. Who wouldn't? Well, Charlotte and I realise that there are only six people who know what really happened to Elizabeth, since she does not remember, and we have no intention of distressing her by telling her, Jane told him confidingly. Charlotte and myself, you and Mr. Darcy, and the doctor. That's five. Oh, I see. He looked at her admiringly. Clever, Miss Bennet. She blushed becomingly. If I may have your assurance. Not a word shall ever pass my lips or Darcy's, I promise you. Of course. And Charlotte assures me that Dr. Trent's discretion may also be trusted. So if we should hear anywhere a whisper that Elizabeth might have been compromised... Rather than merely that she took a tumble, then the rumour might perhaps be traced back to its source, do you not think? She looked at him appealingly, biting on her lower lip, anxious for his opinion. I think, Miss Bennet, that you are just as clever as you are beautiful. He lifted her hand to his lips for a gallant kiss, making her blush deepen even further. But I must impress on you that it might be dangerous for you if you should attempt to trace the source of such rumours. Please, I beg of you, Bring any information that you hear to me, and I shall undertake to investigate. I shall, I promise, sir, and thank you so very much for everything. Jane looked up at him earnestly. It might have been so very much worse for Lizzie if you had not come upon her, had not carried her back to the parsonage and summoned Dr. Trent so quickly. I cannot ever thank you enough. You have my eternal gratitude and friendship. Fitzwilliam found himself ducking his head bashfully at her praise. Any gentleman would have done the same thing. Any gentleman did not find my sister. You did. It was you, too, who wrote the notes to my family, so that Charlotte would be free to take care of Lizzie. You who delivered terrible news in the most gentle words possible. No, Colonel Fitzwilliam, I know nothing of your military career, but you will always be a hero to me anyway. He was glad he wasn't wearing his red coat, 
because he was fairly sure that his cheeks would have been redder than its fabric. They were almost back to the parsonage now, when the rattling of carriage wheels on the road made Jane look up, rescuing Fitzwilliam from the depths of his embarrassment. "'It is my uncle!' she cried, gathered her skirts and took off at a run, startling Fitzwilliam, who nonetheless lost no time in dashing after her. On meeting Mr Gardiner, Fitzwilliam's bemusement redoubled. How anyone could find this connection objectionable was beyond him. Yes, the man was in trade, but he was clearly a respectable man, well-dressed and intelligent, asking incisive questions of Jane at once. Fitzwilliam appreciated, too, that he did not reproach Jane for her reckless dash from London, other than saying, "'I wish you had waited for me, my dear. Whatever should I have told your father if some ill had befallen you?' which gentle reproof made Jane look guilty and apologise for her thoughtlessness. "'There, there. No harm done.' Mr. Gardiner patted her hand. "'I have no doubt Lizzie was glad to see you.' He turned an inquisitive glance on Fitzwilliam, nudged his niece gently to do her duty. "'Oh, Uncle, pray forgive me. This is Colonel Fitzwilliam, who is a cousin of Mr. Darcy and a friend of Lizzie's. He is the one who found her yesterday after she was injured and brought her to Charlotte.' "'Then I am very glad to make your acquaintance, sir.' Mr. Gardiner shook his hand heartily as Jane completed the introduction. Chapter 16 Darcy appeared to have gathered himself somewhat when they repaired inside, enough to be introduced to Mr. Gardiner without breaking down, at least. Jane escorted the newcomer upstairs to see his niece for himself, and Fitzwilliam was left staring at his cousin. "'You've made quite a pig's ear of this, Darcy,' he said finally, and Darcy looked up at him, hollow-eyed. "'What did Miss Bennet tell you?' "'It was more what she didn't say, actually. "'Separating Bingley from that angelic creature "'just to remove yourself from temptation, Darcy. "'I thought better of you. "'Especially since it seems the fates are conspiring "'to throw Miss Elizabeth in your path anyway.' "'I should have known that you'd put it together pretty quickly,' "'Darcy said glumly. "'I've made an utter fool of myself, "'and now Miss Elizabeth has paid the price for it. "'What am I going to do, Fitz?' "'With a despairing, anguished cry. "'There, there.' Fitzwilliam patted his shoulder consolingly. You just let Cousin Fitz sort it out. Do you even have a plan? Fitzwilliam considered, head cocked. Sort of. Part of a plan. Perhaps half a plan at most. But there are two very intelligent ladies above stairs who I have no doubt can help us refine it into a battle strategy worthy of Wellington himself. Miss Elizabeth and... Miss Bennet and Mrs Collins... For the sake of all concerned, it is probably best that Miss Elizabeth never recall what has happened, and therefore she should never become aware that there needs to be a plan. Fitzwilliam gave Darcy a warning stare, and then gestured. Come with me. I want you to look at something Miss Bennet just pointed out to me. They repaired to the lane, and Fitzwilliam pointed out what Jane had noted, that Elizabeth would more likely have run to the parsonage rather than Rosings, it being a good deal closer, unless her attacker had been between her and safety. Oh! Darcy looked at the lane between the parsonage and the start of the path to Rosings, looked at the houses overlooking the lane. Oh, I see. Let us walk back up the path, see if there is anything I missed, Fitzwilliam proposed. But at once they saw that the imprints of Elizabeth's running steps in the now dried ground started immediately at the beginning of the path, where its softer surface retained the impression. She was already running by the time she got here, Darcy said slowly. This makes no sense, Fitzwilliam. If the attack occurred in the lane, her screams would surely have been heard, because I am very sure that she would have screamed fit to wake the dead. And if it wasn't here in the lane, why did she not run to the parsonage instead? Fitzwilliam agreed. She was attacked at the parsonage, Darcy concluded finally. That's what I thought. I wanted to see if you came to the same conclusion. We will need to question the staff. I think we should leave that to Mrs Collins, actually. Fitzwilliam cut Darcy off sharply. We can ask her to do so, and I think we should then visit Dr Trent and speak with his housekeeper, and the Farleys who live at the other cottage along there. Mrs Farley has two very young children. She's home all day and might well have heard something. They walked back, quietly discussing how best to handle the matter without advising anyone that Elizabeth had been assaulted, and eventually concluded that it would be best to let Charlotte handle everything. They were pleased to find her waiting for them in the parlour with much the same ideas to propose. I think we should return to the inn, Fitzwilliam finally suggested, and Darcy reluctantly agreed, recognising that they were imposing on Charlotte's hospitality, and indeed impeding her ability to best care for Elizabeth. Before they could take their leave, though, another set of carriage wheels were heard in the lane, 
and within moments Mr. Bennet was entering the house. "'Where is she? Where is my Lizzie?' he demanded at once, and then saw Mr. Gardiner descending the stairs. "'Edward, what on earth has happened? Where is Elizabeth? Is Jane with you? Madeline? "'Please, brother, be at ease.' Mr. Gardiner took Mr. Bennet's shoulder and steered him into the parlour. Fitzwilliam and Darcy glanced at each other and made to follow, and Charlotte stepped gracefully into their path, her brows raised. "'Gentlemen, I do believe this is a family matter now.' It was undeniably true, and they had no choice but to gracefully concede the point and depart, thanking Charlotte, and imploring her to contact them immediately should she uncover any intelligence that might lead to the identification of Elizabeth's attacker. An hour later, sitting in a private room at the inn in Sevenoaks, discussing possible ways in which they might expose Elizabeth's attacker, they were somewhat surprised by a knock on the door and the innkeeper coming in, apologising profusely for the interruption. "'Excuse me, Mr Darcy, Colonel Fitzwilliam, but there is a Mr Gardiner here asking if he might have a moment of your time.' "'Absolutely. Pray show him in,' Fitzwilliam replied immediately, standing up to greet Mr Gardiner as he entered the room. "'I apologise for the intrusion,' Mr. Gardiner said, once the formalities of greeting had been observed. But I plan to stay here the night, since the parsonage lacks space, and I insisted that Mr. Bennet should be the one to remain with his daughters. Quite right, quite right, Darcy agreed, gesturing for Gardiner to pull up a chair. And you are not intruding. We are very glad to be in company with any family member of the Miss Bennets. Fitzwilliam glanced at him askance, thinking, That's not what I've heard. I've heard there are serious objections to their family but he could hardly call Darcy on his contradictory remark in front of Mr. Gardiner, so he too smiled welcomingly and offered their guest a glass of brandy, inviting him to share the meal the inn staff would be bringing them shortly. It wasn't until after they had dined that Mr. Gardiner settled back in his chair, eyed them both thoughtfully as he tamped a pipe and lit it, and finally said, "'My niece Jane told me that I should ask you for the real story.' Both younger men stared at him, then at each other. "'I thought so.' Mr. Gardiner said quietly and rather sadly. "'Do you know who the culprit is?' "'No, but pray do not think the worst,' Darcy said hastily. He and Fitzwilliam almost talked over each other, trying to reassure Elizabeth's uncle that she had escaped serious injury according to Charlotte and the doctor, that mercifully she wasn't even aware that she had been assaulted, and that the two of them intended to do everything they could to both protect her and to find and suitably punish the cur who had dared to lay hands on her. Mr. Gardiner listened, occasionally holding up a hand to slow them down when they were both talking at once, asking incisive questions to clarify certain points. At last they ran down, and just looked back at him as he considered them both silently. "'And which one of you is in love with Lizzie?' he asked at last. "'Him!' Fitzwilliam pointed at Darcy. "'I'm!' Darcy began, saw Mr Gardiner's eyebrows arch in exactly the same arch manner that Elizabeth had turned upon him so often and sighed. "'Yes, I am.' And are you willing to marry her anyway if this episode leads to her reputation being compromised, even though Elizabeth herself has not been? Darcy's eyes widened. Neither Mr. Gardiner nor Fitzwilliam could know the thoughts that ran through his mind. I would have Elizabeth under any circumstances, but she will not have me. Unless it is possible that with her memory loss she had forgotten my disastrous proposal. That would be the answer to many of my prayers, that I could have a second chance, that I could show her my true character— tell her of Georgiana's sorrow and Wickham's perfidy, gain the opportunity to change her mind about me. I would be very willing, yes. Should Elizabeth herself consent, of course. Mr Gardiner drew on his pipe, giving Darcy a long, thoughtful look, before asking, Is there some reason for her consent to be in any doubt? Perhaps I should tell you that my wife Madeline spent some years in Lambton in her youth, Mr Darcy. I am well aware of your situation, and that you could look far higher than my niece for a wife. Darcy's lips tightened, and he glanced at Colonel Fitzwilliam briefly before saying, Some members of my family would undoubtedly agree with you, sir, but for myself, I can think of no higher honour than to make Elizabeth my wife. That said, I would not have her under any circumstances other than with her own wholehearted consent. Shrewd brown eyes that very much resembled Elizabeth's own surveyed him for several moments more, before Mr. Gardiner cracked a smile. You'll do, son. Chapter 17 My dear Lizzie, Thomas Bennet's voice was quite broken as he sat down by her bedside, taking her hand in his and holding tightly to her hand. I should never have let you come here, never have permitted you out from under my roof. 
She gave him a weak smile that yet had some of her usual impishness in it. Oh, Papa, you cannot wrap us all up in swaddling blankets forever, you know. I should have made your life a misery if you had refused me permission to come. He chuckled ruefully at that. Do I not know it? Lydia even now is doing exactly that because I told her that she should not go to Brighton. Lydia in Brighton? Now there is a nightmare thought indeed. Elizabeth smiled, though it faded at her father's wry expression. Why on earth should she go to Brighton, Papa? Colonel Forster's wife has befriended her, and wishes Lydia to be her companion there for the summer. All Lydia can talk about is a whole camp full of soldiers. He mimicked his youngest daughter's excitable tones. Oh, Papa, no, Elizabeth said in horror. You cannot possibly consider it. I know well how badly she will behave if she does not get her way, but... Never fear, Lizzie. I have learned my lesson. Mr. Bennet shook his head. If you can suffer such a dreadful mishap when staying in a quiet country hamlet in the home of a clergyman relative, I shudder to think what might befall Lydia in Brighton. Jane, sitting quietly on Elizabeth's other side, placed her hand over her mouth and then had to turn away, feigning a cough while she regained control over her motions. Forcing herself to paste on a smile, she turned back to speak. I too am very glad that you will not permit Lydia to go to Brighton, Papa, Jane said softly. Even if she were of an age to be wed, I should fear for any personable young woman among so many men. Fathers were urged to keep their daughters closely watched when the regiment came to Meryton, as you no doubt recall. And that was but one regiment, Mr. Bennet agreed, smiling at Jane. Wise words, dear Jane, and ones I shall not forget, believe me. Why, when I have you all home safe again, I shall not permit any of you out of my sight for a twelve month at least. That made both Jane and Lizzie laugh. Oh, Papa, Lizzie squeezed on his hand gently. You should tire of our chattering and retreat to your library before twelve days had passed, never mind twelve months. Mr. Bennet squeezed back. It does my heart good to hear you sound so pert, Lizzie, he said a little huskily, and to hear such sweet and wise words from you, Jane. Smiling, Jane stood and came around the bed to kiss his cheek. It does our hearts good to see you again, Papa, she told him lovingly. Now, I shall go and fetch us all some tea, and you must tell us what has been happening in Meryton since we left. You are all such poor correspondents, save Mamma, And all she writes of is her nerves, Elizabeth said with a giggle. Genteelly suppressing her own chuckles, Jane left her father and Elizabeth and headed down the stairs. Passing the open parlour door, she glanced in and stopped, startled, as she saw Charlotte sitting on the lounge, wiping at her eyes with her apron. Charlotte, Jane gasped, hurrying to her friend and embracing her. Oh, my dear, whatever is the matter? Charlotte lifted teary eyes to Jane's face. Oh, Jane, it is too dreadful. In my own home. How can we ever feel safe again? She burst into distraught sobs, leaning on Jane's shoulder, and Jane could only smooth her hair and wonder what on earth had happened in the last half hour to bring Charlotte, cool, calm Charlotte, to such a pass. Charlotte stood undecided in the parlour for a few minutes after Mr. Gardner departed and Jane led Mr. Bennet upstairs. Finally, she squared her shoulders and made her decision. Life must go on, after all, and everyone would need to eat. Going out to the kitchen, she issued instructions to the cook before collecting a few things in her basket and leaving the parsonage by the kitchen door. It had taken Charlotte only a few days after arriving at Hunsford as Mrs. Collins to learn the name of every person in the village, and mere weeks before she knew all their ailments and troubles. Seeing it as her bounden duty to help those less fortunate than herself, Charlotte soon endeared herself to the entire neighbourhood with her firm but kind manner and her sensible ways. That Mrs. Collins is a much greater lady than Lady Catherine and no mistake, was uttered in many a household around Rosings, although never when anyone who might tattle such treason to Lady Catherine's ears might overhear. Hence, when she paid a call to her neighbour Mrs. Farley, carrying a basket of freshly grown vegetables from the parsonage garden, and spent twenty minutes rocking one of the colicky Farley baby twins to sleep, Mrs. Farley was more than forthcoming with information. Yesterday, ma'am? Why, yes. I did hear some strange noises yesterday morning, it were. I'd just got young Jimmy there off to sleep, and taken a step outside rocking Alicia, when I thought I heard shouts from the direction of the parsonage, and someone running down the lane. But I was in the garden, not the house, so I couldn't see them, whoever it was. She shook her head in sympathy. Dr. Trent's housekeeper told me Miss Elizabeth took a fall. What a terrible thing. 
My best wishes for your friend's recovery, Mrs Collins. I shall pray for her in church tomorrow. Charlotte managed a weak smile. Thank you, Mrs Farley. There, I think Alicia is asleep now. She settled the baby girl into the crib beside her brother. And I had best be getting back. Lizzie's family are with her, but I want to be sure to see to their comfort. Of course, Mrs Collins, and thank you for dropping by. Taking a deep breath as she left the Farley cottage, Charlotte turned back towards the parsonage, but she was not bound for her own home just yet. Instead, she pushed open the next little gate along the lane and made her way up the path towards Dr Trent's modest little house. The doctor's garden was prettier than hers, she thought, while she had to argue with Mr Collins for any flowers at all, other than roses which were approved by Lady Catherine, and they were kept strictly regimented in a small corner, the doctor's garden was a riot of colour. Yet, even with fewer vegetables, the garden was no less useful. All of the plants she recognised as having use for medicinal purposes. She paused to inhale by a particularly fragrant lavender bush, and was surprised by the doctor himself coming up the path. Mrs Collins, how do you do? Is it Miss Elizabeth? No, no. She smiled at his concerned expression. Indeed, she does so much better, Doctor. Her father and uncle have both arrived, and she is in safe hands in their care and that of Miss Bennet. Dr Trent's expression lightened. And how do you do with an unexpected house full of guests, Mrs Collins? You must take care of yourself too, you know. Charlotte blushed a little. Oh, I am well, Dr Trent. Very well. Pray do not be concerned on my behalf. Then what may I do for you? He gave her a puzzled frown and offered his arm to escort her to the door. Not that it is not always a pleasure to be in your company, of course. That made her laugh a little, but she sobered quickly. I was wondering, Dr Trent, if I might have a word with your housekeeper. She kept her voice very quiet as she entered the house. I am trying to retrace Lizzie's steps as of yesterday morning. Ah, Trent gave her an understanding look. I see. Well, perhaps we might go to the kitchen and trouble her for a cup of tea if you can take the time. I will reassure her that she will be quite right to answer your questions. Chapter 18 Mrs Thomas, Mr Trent's housekeeper, was a garrulous, friendly lady who was only too happy to brew a pot of tea and lay out thick slices of fruit cake. Invited to sit down with them by Dr Trent, she happily did so, looking inquiringly at Charlotte when informed that Charlotte wanted to ask her some questions. Anything I can do, Mrs Collins, anything at all. Miss Elizabeth is such a nice young lady. Shocked I was. Shocked to hear about her accident. Shocking! Yes, indeed, Charlotte said with a little smile. But as Dr Trent may have told you, poor Lizzie hit her head and doesn't remember it at all, and I'm just trying to puzzle out what on earth she was doing. Well, it's my belief she was quite upset, you see, Mrs Collins. Mrs Thomas leaned forward confidingly. I was just by the window here in the front parlour when I saw her hurrying along the lane. Pouring down it was. She must have been quite soaked. You saw her? Charlotte blinked, startled. Why, yes, but that must have been well before her fall, because she was headed for the parsonage, you see. Mrs Thomas nodded and took a sip of her tea. Confounded, Charlotte sat back. That was on the way back from her walk, she said slowly. But why do you think she was upset about more than just getting wet in the rain? Seen Miss Elizabeth wet in the rain before, haven't I? Mrs Thomas nodded wisely. She don't normally look so unhappy. White as a sheet she was, hugging her arms around herself. Looked like she'd just heard something dreadful. Charlotte and the doctor looked at each other with creased brows, wondering what that could possibly mean. But Mrs Thomas wasn't yet finished. And not ten minutes later, I saw her running back the other way. You saw her? Dr Trent gaped. That's right. Don't think I was slacking off, sir, I beg you. I was sitting polishing those brass candlesticks. She pointed at two shining candlesticks on the table by the window. But it's dull work, doesn't need my eyes, so I was looking out the window. I didn't see the good colonel come back with Miss Elizabeth, though, for not a minute passed after she ran by that you yourself arrived home all wet through, though not as wet as Miss Elizabeth would have been by that time, for the second time she went past she wasn't even wearing a spencer. But she was wearing it when you saw her the first time, Dr Trent queried. Oh yes, sir, I'm quite sure of it. That pretty grey one she has with the pink roses embroidered on it. Mrs Thomas sighed, shaking her head. Such a lovely young lady. I do hope she feels better soon. Well, I'd best get back to my duties, Mrs Collins, unless there's any more questions. But I don't think there's aught more I could tell you that would be of use. Thank you so much, Mrs Thomas, Dr Trent said, standing to usher her out. 
you've been of more use than you can possibly know. He closed the door behind the still chattering housekeeper and returned to sit opposite Charlotte. Well, he said. I do not know what to think, Charlotte said, a little stunned still. I don't think Mrs Thomas would make anything up. She does like to chatter on, but there's no unkindness in her. Indeed not. No, Dr Trent, I am just thinking that she must be correct. Lizzie was wearing that Spencer when I saw her leave for her walk yesterday morning, but it wasn't on her when Colonel Fitzwilliam brought her back. They stared at each other. So, Dr Trent said slowly, in the space of ten minutes, Elizabeth ran in the rain from here to the parsonage, and back again, having lost her Spencer somewhere along the way, and been attacked somewhere along the way, Charlotte said dismally. You're quite certain of that? Indeed, sir. She proceeded to tell him the information that the Colonel and Darcy had shared, that Elizabeth had already been running when she reached the path, and continued running until she fell into the stream. And Mrs Farley heard shouting, she finished, standing up and going to look out of the window. The doctor joined her after a moment. She ran that way, the doctor pointed. She would not have gone anywhere but the parsonage in the rain, surely. Indeed, Charlotte agreed. And a few minutes later she ran back, presumably after the shouting that Mrs Farley heard. But Mrs Thomas did not. She's a little deaf, the doctor confided, making Charlotte smile. That explains it, then. But where did she take her Spencer off? Or did she lose it in the struggle? If she took it off, it must be in the parsonage. Abruptly, Charlotte turned towards the door. I must find it. I must. Mrs Collins! Startled by her sudden movement, he reached out, put a hand on her arm. Do you not see, Doctor? She turned towards him, her eyes bright with tears. If it is in the parsonage, then that is where she was attacked. In my home! Shocked, he let her go. Charlotte hurried back to the parsonage, entering by the kitchen door. Mrs Shandy, she addressed her cook, ignoring Mrs Soward, the assistant housekeeper from Rosings, who stood by with pursed lips. Might I ask if you or Agnes happened to find Miss Elizabeth's grey Spencer about anywhere yesterday? No, Mum, Mrs Shandy shook her head. I didn't, and Agnes would have brought it to you to take back to Miss Elizabeth, I think. Yes, indeed, Charlotte murmured, leaving the two women and going out into the hall. Yes, she would. Stopping, she looked about, thinking. Where could it be? She went into the parlour. Lizzie would have come in here, probably, taken it off in front of the fire. Looking about, she checked everywhere, but there was no sign of the Spencer. Puzzled, she went back out into the hall and opened the hall closet, without any real expectation of finding the Spencer, because the ridiculous closet had shelves, as decreed by Lady Catherine, instead of pegs to hang things. But there, shoved to the back of a shelf, was a wadded ball of grey fabric. Horrified, Charlotte reached out and grabbed the cloth, pulling it out. It was still wet, but as she shook it out, she saw that it was quite undamaged. Bursting into tears, she ran into the parlour and sat down on the couch, clutching the wet spencer in her hands. Charlotte? a soft voice said uncertainly. Whatever is the matter? She looked up to find Jane just come into the room, coming to sit down beside her, placing a gentle, comforting arm around her. Oh, Jane! Charlotte sobbed in utter despair. Oh, Jane, it is all just too awful for words! Little by little, Charlotte managed to get across to Jane what she discovered. It must have been some tradesman, she sobbed. But I can't bear to think of it, Jane, in my own home! Hush, Jane soothed, stroking her hair. Hush, Charlotte, you've been wonderful, a real-life detective. The Bow Street runners should wish for someone half so clever. Charlotte hiccuped a little chuckle, before sitting back and wiping at her eyes, drying away her tears, determined that she would not feel sorry for herself any longer. Well, but the job is only half done, she said decisively. Now we must find out who came to the house. Who came to the house when, my dear? A voice said, and they both looked up, startled, to see Mr Collins standing in the doorway. Charlotte was just about to answer when Jane squeezed her hand warningly. A call we missed the other day, Mr Collins, Charlotte said quickly. Agnes didn't get the caller's name, the silly girl. Indeed, indeed, well. And when might we expect to dine today, Mrs Collins? 
Yesterday's dinner left much to be desired, I assure you. Charlotte suspected that she was looking at her husband with just as much distaste as Jane at that moment. Shortly, Mr. Collins, I was just in the kitchen and Mrs. Shandy has things well in hand. Why don't you go and wash up? Is Maria with you? Just gone above stairs herself, my dear Charlotte. Mr. Collins inclined his head to her, favoured Jane with an unctuous smile and departed. He cannot know, Charlotte whispered to Jane fiercely. If he even suspects, he will tell Lady Catherine, and she will tell the whole world. She's already been quite dreadful because she suspects Lizzie of seeking to entrap Mr. Darcy. Jane clutched at her head. What in the world has been going on between Lizzie and Mr. Darcy? she exclaimed plaintively. When last I heard, she hated the very sight of him, and he looked at her only to find fault. Now Colonel Fitzwilliam tells me that Darcy has been infatuated with her all along, and Lizzie... What has she been doing, Charlotte? Being willfully blind, as usual, Charlotte sighed. I tried to tell her, really I did, but all she could say is that he is more proud and arrogant than ever. However will this all turn out, I wonder, Jane said, shaking her head. He knows, Jane, Charlotte said bleakly. He would never marry her now in any case. The two friends looked sadly at each other wondering if there was any possible way that this disaster might come out all right. Jane convinced Mr. Bennet to go downstairs and eat dinner, while she sat with Elizabeth. Elizabeth felt able to take a little clear soup, which was all Dr. Trent recommended she have for now, but afterwards felt quite exhausted and took no convincing at all to lie down and close her eyes. She fell asleep in mere moments, leaving Jane to stare silently out of the window and wonder what the morrow might bring. Chapter 19 so let me get this straight, Mr. Gardner asked Colonel Fitzwilliam. This idiot boy encouraged his friend Bingley to abandon my niece Jane, all because he was panicked over his feelings for Elizabeth. He waved in the general direction of Darcy, who had fallen soundly asleep on a divan in the corner after consuming the best part of a bottle of rather good brandy. Fitzwilliam winced, topping up Mr. Gardner's glass. When you put it that way, it sounds quite appalling. I should say so. Poor Jane has been moping around my house these two months together, quite broken-hearted. Though, Mr. Gardiner paused with glass in hand, considering what my wife told me about the ill-bred behaviour of the sisters, it seems Jane might have had a lucky escape. They would have made her life a living hell. I've met them, Fitzwilliam shuddered, and I wouldn't inflict those two on any poor woman as a sister-in-law. They've set their sights on Darcy's younger sister Georgiana as a prospective bride for Bingley all part of Miss Bingley's plan to get Darcy for herself, and as Miss Darcy's co-guardian, I can tell you I'd never approve the match, for all Bingley himself is a decent enough chap. He lifted his own glass in a toast. To the divine Miss Bennet, who deserves better. He didn't notice Mr. Gardiner giving him a very shrewd look before tipping up his own glass. Miss Bennet! Darcy suddenly roused, making them both start. Yes, must make amends! And he scrambled to his feet and left the room, leaving the other two men looking at each other in bemused silence until Mr. Gardiner said, "'You'd better go and make sure he doesn't do something else idiotic to complicate this mess even further, Colonel.' Fitzwilliam found Darcy sealing a hastily scribbled note in his room. "'And what's that?' he asked as Darcy handed it to his valet. "'A letter for Bingley. "'I'm not so sure that's the best idea you've had lately, even for you.' "'And what's that supposed to mean?' Darcy demanded indignantly. I owe Bingley a debt, Fitz. I deliberately concealed Miss Bennet's being in town from him and denied him a chance at happiness. Jane Bennet is a truly good woman, and I have been unfairly cruel to both of them for no better reason than my own foolish pride. Pressing his fingertips to the bridge of his nose, Fitzwilliam realised ruefully that he had perhaps drunk one too many brandies to engage in debate with Darcy about the merits of his plan at the present time. Could this not wait until morning? he asked hopefully. Perhaps we could consult with Mr. Gardiner about the wisest course of action? You mean that you intend to argue me out of it, Darcy said astutely. And you will not, I will not have it. Off with you, if you please, he gestured to his man. Find an express rider. I want that in Charles Bingley's hands before midnight. Fitzwilliam watched dismally as the man departed. He had the terrible sinking feeling that Darcy had just set yet another series of events in chain that would prove to be utterly disastrous. With a demoralised sigh, he turned and headed for his own room. 
Fitzwilliam was awakened the following morning by his valet shaking him lightly. "'Begging your pardon, sir, but the doctor from Hunsford is here to see you. Says it's urgent-like,' his valet said when he roused. Five minutes,' Fitzwilliam muttered, shoving himself upright. He found Dr. Trent waiting for him in the private parlour downstairs, pacing back and forth, brow creased anxiously. "'Miss Elizabeth?' was Fitzwilliam's first question. "'Quite well, I assure you. She passed a restful night according to Mrs. Collins, who I spoke with before leaving Hunsford this morning. "'I am gladdened to hear it. What then brings you here so early, doctor?' He gestured the other man to a seat at the table. "'Yesterday Mrs. Collins and I spoke with a neighbour and with my housekeeper,' the doctor began, "'and I called at the parsonage yesterday evening to check up on Miss Bennet. "'He went on to tell Fitzwilliam about the missing Spencer "'and how Charlotte's finding it had solidified their suspicions "'that Elizabeth had been attacked at the parsonage. "'Fitzwilliam only nodded attentively as the doctor spoke. "'And are there any suspects?' he asked finally. "'The Collinses do not have a manservant, as you may know, Colonel. "'Lady Catherine sends down workmen from Rosings "'for any work that needs to be done, "'and Mr Collins keeps his pony and gig at the farm along the lane.' Mrs. Collins thought that it might be a tradesman who came to call. But I asked a few questions in the village yesterday afternoon, and everyone who I might have possibly suspected capable of such an act was accounted for at the time of the incident. Damn! Fitzwilliam blew out his cheeks and slumped back into his chair. Nobody saw anyone in the lane? Trent looked down, became very occupied with the brim of his hat held on his lap suddenly. Only Miss Bennet, and a little while later... When the rain had finished, Mr. Collins. Fitzwilliam froze, staring at Trent. What exactly are you saying, man? he asked carefully. That I myself saw Mr. Collins leaving the parsonage, and that it has to have been shortly after Miss Elizabeth was seen running towards Rosings, and before you returned with her. The two men looked at each other in silence for a long moment. Mr. Collins was in the parsonage when Miss Elizabeth was attacked, Fitzwilliam said hardly able to believe it himself. And the fact that Mrs. Collins found her wet Spencer undamaged also in the parsonage seems to indicate that Elizabeth arrived back there, removed it, was attacked and then fled, and that her attacker stuffed it in the hall cupboard in an attempt at concealment. He's a clergyman, Fitzwilliam said, in tones of utmost incredulity. A puffed-up, pompous bore of a clergyman, who listens far too much to the words of my aunt and pays too little heed to those of the Almighty, but a clergyman. Miss Elizabeth's cousin, no less. Dr. Trent looked no less repulsed than Fitzwilliam felt. But the facts are incontrovertible. I went through it again with my housekeeper once Mrs. Collins left. Elizabeth was seen hurrying to the parsonage in the rain. A few minutes later, shouts were heard and she was seen running from the parsonage without her Spencer. About ten minutes after that, I arrived home myself, having left the Saunders farm immediately the rain stopped. I saw Mr. Collins leaving the parsonage, heading for the western lane towards Rosings. The western lane, Fitzwilliam said thoughtfully. That is a slower route than the one I found Miss Elizabeth on. Much drier, though, with a stony base. Mr. Collins knows the lanes well, would know that the other would have been muddy after the rain. He's a fastidious sort. The letter, Fitzwilliam said suddenly. That's how he had Darcy's letter. Letter? Trent looked at him blankly, and Fitzwilliam realised he was treading on dangerous ground. He hesitated, before deciding that they already trusted Dr. Trent with several dangerous secrets. Mr. Darcy gave Miss Elizabeth a letter that contained some information known to very, very few people. Miss Elizabeth was somewhat distressed, and we believe she hurried straight back to the parsonage. Trent only looked puzzled. The letter we discovered came into the possession of Lady Catherine. My cousin Anne told us that Collins gave it to her. And he could only have come into possession of it if he saw Miss Elizabeth, Trent said with dawning realisation. That is damning evidence indeed. A clergyman, her cousin, a married man under whose protection she was residing, Fitzwilliam said with utter disgust. Under whose protection she is still residing, Trent pointed out. They looked at each other with sudden horror before both lunging to their feet and rushing for the door which opened just as they got there to reveal an unexpectedly furious Charles Bingley. Chapter 20 Where is he? Bingley demanded. Where is Darcy? Er... Fitzwilliam stopped in his tracks. Trent gave him an incredulous look. 
What are you about, man? We have no time to lose. Easy, easy. His brain had started working again. Miss Elizabeth is in no present danger, not with her sister and father by her side. We need to handle the situation carefully. What situation? Another voice asked, even as Bingley stared in confusion from Trent to Fitzwilliam, and they all turned to see Darcy coming down the stairs. You! Bingley started forward, fire in his eyes. Darcy held up a hand to stop him. I was wrong, and I apologise. What did you say? Startled, Bingley blinked. He wasn't the only one. Fitzwilliam, too, looked at his cousin in utter confusion. Darcy, I haven't heard you apologise for anything in years, and I don't think I've ever heard you admit that you were wrong. There is a first time for everything, Darcy said quietly. Especially when one has lately learned a lesson in the truism that pride goeth before a fall. I haven't the faintest idea what you are talking about, Bingley said after a moment. But I still think I want to hit you. Miss Bennet already gave me a very well-deserved slap, Bingley. I'd rather not take one from you too. Bingley blinked. Jane slapped you, he said in tones of utmost disbelief. She was a Valkyrie, Fitzwilliam said. His voice a little dreamy as he remembered his first sight of the beautiful eldest Miss Bennet. Magnificent! I cannot say I much appreciated it at the time, Darcy said dryly. But yes, Miss Bennet was very impressive. Her affection for her sister is commendable. Bingley looked more befuddled by the minute. Trent had folded his arms and was watching the byplay between the three men with some amusement. Good morning, Dr. Trent, Darcy turned to him then. Pray tell me that Miss Elizabeth fares well today. She did early this morning, yes, according to Mrs. Collins, who had just seen her, and indeed was just preparing her some tea, since Miss Elizabeth expressed a desire for some. You cannot know how glad I am to hear that, Darcy replied with a genuine smile. Would someone please tell me what the hell is going on? Bingley demanded, clutching at his head. I believe I should very much like to know that myself, a new voice declared, and they all turned to see Mr. Gardiner approaching. I believe I shall return to Hunsford, Trent said hurriedly. You have my news, Colonel, and I'm sure that I could be of more use there than here. He shared a significant look with Colonel Fitzwilliam, an exchange which did not escape Mr. Gardiner's notice, though the older man said nothing. I'm sure that we will be joining you there before long. You'll remain at the parsonage until our arrival? Fitzwilliam asked. My word on it. Trent held out his hand to shake before departing swiftly, calling for his horse. Bingley was still standing, looking utterly befuddled, so Mr. Gardiner took pity on him. Mr. Bingley, I collect, he held out a hand. I'm Edwin Gardiner. I believe you are acquainted with my nieces, the Mrs. Bennet? Bingley went alternately red and then white, before politely shaking Mr. Gardiner's hand. Yes, sir. Yes, indeed, that's quite correct. Miss Bennet and Miss Elizabeth and Miss Mary and Miss Kitty and Miss Lydia. Mr. Gardiner grimaced slightly, and, as Bingley moved past him into the private parlour as Darcy's urging, said in an undertone to Fitzwilliam, I suppose I can't blame the boy for getting cold feet, really. Lydia alone is the kind of relation any man would hesitate to acquire. Fitzwilliam gave him an incredulous look. Bingley is in no position to criticise anybody else's sisters, sir, believe me. We all have relations for whom we must blush. Darcy and I are saddled with Lady Catherine, after all. The Bennets with Mr. Collins. Mr. Gardiner smiled. I dare say they think the same of us, sir. That made Fitzwilliam chuckle as he stepped forward to take the seat at the table. Well, I dare say that we may as well order some food to break our fast. What do you say? he suggested. Capital idea, Colonel, Bingley enthused. I left London without so much as a bite, and I may fade away if I don't get something to eat soon. Jolly good to see you again, I must say. A shame it isn't under more convivial circumstances. What? Oh, yes. Well, I may be annoyed with Darcy for... Um... Bingley glanced at Mr. Gardiner a little warily before shrugging and saying, Well, for being impossibly Darcy-ish, but there's no reason for me to be annoyed with you, is there? Or were you in on this dastardly plan to keep me from my angel too? I shall thank you not to refer to my niece as your angel, Mr. Gardiner said in markedly cool tones, causing Bingley to flush dark red and stammer apologies, and Fitzwilliam to laugh under his breath. There was no dastardly plan, Bingley. Darcy said wearily. At least not on my part, though I cannot speak for your sister's motives. They were aware of Miss Bennet's presence in London long before I, I assure you. 
Bingley's flush darkened further. And I shall be taking that up with them, I assure you, when I see them next. We don't expect them, then? Darcy asked hopefully. Well, I didn't tell them where I was going, since I got your letter a little after midnight and left an hour later. Bingley gave him a glare. Although, he looked thoughtful, I did tell my man to pack my trunks and send the coach on down here, so it's possible they might find us that way. Oh, dear God help us, Darcy said, not at all under his breath, making Fitzwilliam choke on his laughter and Mr Gardiner's eyebrows fly up. Is there something of which I should be made aware, Mr Darcy? he asked. It was Bingley who replied when Darcy only sighed. My sister, my youngest sister, Miss Caroline Bingley, has, um, has rather set her sights on becoming Mrs Darcy. He flushed darkly red. She planned to advance her agenda by making a match between myself and Miss Darcy. Who is only sixteen years old, Fitzwilliam put in. And forgive me, Darcy, because your sister is a charming, sweet and beautiful young lady who any man would consider himself fortunate to marry, but... Bingley trailed off miserably. But not you, Mr Gardiner surmised correctly. Miss Darcy is very shy, Bingley said weakly. And Bingley here is the epitome of the social butterfly, Fitzwilliam said cheerfully. Georgiana would absolutely hate his lifestyle, even if the man isn't too objectionable. Bingley's expression was a picture, so much so that Mr Gardiner had to laugh. I see, he said at last. Anyway, Bingley said, giving Fitzwilliam a final glare. Caroline was quite determined to divert my attention from Miss Bennet. And Mr Darcy's away from Lizzie, Mr Gardiner murmured, enlightened. I begin to see. Darcy and Lizzie? You mean Miss Elizabeth? Bingley only looked all the more bemused. Shaking his head, he took a seat at the table. For God's sake, somebody ring for some food. I cannot possibly think so hard on an empty stomach. Chapter 21 Elizabeth awoke feeling vastly better than the previous day to see Jane lying asleep beside her, beautiful, serene face pillowed on her hand. Gingerly, Elizabeth raised her fingers to lightly brush the bump on her head. There was no pain until her fingertips touched it, and then she winced slightly, her breath hissing out. That hurt. Jane stirred as Elizabeth made a sound. Her cornflower blue eyes opened, widened to see Elizabeth sitting up in bed, fingers to her brow. Lizzie! She pushed herself upright, reached out. Oh, do lie down again. I will not. I am done with lying abed, pretending to be an invalid. Elizabeth smiled to take the sting from her words. Look, tis a beautiful day outside, and I would wish for some air. Lizzie, I cannot think that wise. Won't you at least wait until Dr. Trent comes by? Elizabeth sighed at that, and acquiesced to Jane's pleading, though she insisted that she would get up and dress. Jane went to fetch tea for them both, and they spent a quiet half-hour helping each other dress and brushing hair, Jane especially careful of Elizabeth's sore brow. No, I shall not pin it up she said in response to Elizabeth's request to do so. Nobody expects you to look picture-perfect, dearest. Not after... after what happened. She wove Elizabeth's long curls into a loose braid, tying the end off with a ribbon. There. Perfectly respectable for staying in your room. Which I'm not going to do. Lizzie. Jane sighed, shook her head fondly. You had a terrible accident. Do you even remember what happened yet? No. Elizabeth admitted a little sheepishly. I don't remember anything before waking up and seeing your face. Since when? Jane asked. Elizabeth frowned, not understanding the question. What's the last thing you remember from before? Do you remember anything at all from that day? Elizabeth sat back, sipped her tea and thought, eyeing her sister curiously. She had never seen Jane so vehement, so impassioned. What's going on, dearest? she asked finally. What are you keeping from me? Nothing, Jane said, far too quickly. She looked away, too, unable to meet Elizabeth's eyes. What is it that you want me to remember? Elizabeth said softly, racking her brain. There's something. Her fingers fluttered up to her breasts, and Jane gasped, tears standing in her eyes. Darcy, she cried out, her voice shaking. When you first spoke to me, when I asked you what had happened, you cried out and clutched at me, telling me that Darcy had done something terrible. What did you mean? Then it was Elizabeth's turn to cry out, reaching for Jane's hands. Oh, Jane, oh, I can hardly bear to think on it, even now. But you must. 
Jane sought to steady her voice. You must tell me. He told me that he aided Miss Bingley in separating you from your dear Bingley. He was proud of it, the foul creature, proud of wounding so grievously the dearest, sweetest girl who ever lived. Oh, Jane, I am so very, very sorry. Tears were pouring down Elizabeth's cheeks, but Jane only stared back at her, shaking her head slowly. I do not give a fig for Mr. Bingley. What? Shocked, Elizabeth's tears stopped. Lizzie, until two days ago, I never knew myself. It was only when word reached me of your accident, and I had to spend those long hours on the stagecoach coming to you, never knowing if you yet lived, that I came to a realisation. I cared more for the opinions of my family, even of our neighbours, than for Mr Bingley. I left Longbourn not because I was heartbroken, but because I was ashamed. Ashamed of what was being said about me. Poor Jane Bennet. For all her beauty, she cannot even tempt the first serious suitor she ever had, even to a proposal. Jane covered her eyes, breathing quickly from her sudden outburst. Elizabeth moved to sit beside her, putting her arm around her shoulders in a gesture of silent comfort. I have so many more reasons to be ashamed now of my own behaviour, Jane said quietly at last. For as much as we have both vowed only to marry for the deepest and truest love, I would have said yes to Charles Bingley if he had asked. And I do not love him. I see that now. I loved the idea of being mistress of Netherfield, first among the neighbourhood, accepted as an equal by such fashionable ladies as Miss Bingley and Mrs Hurst. Mr Bingley was an amiable means to that end. I think perhaps he was a little more than that to you, Jane, Elizabeth said gently. Perhaps he was once, but he did not return for me nor send any word. So either he does not love me, or he has placed the desires of others, his sisters, and yes, Mr Darcy, above his regard for me. If it is the first, then neither of us are truly injured. If the second, he was never the man for me anyway. I could not respect a man who is not strong enough to make such decisions for himself. Jane lowered her hands. Two spots of colour burned on her cheeks. She held her head high, blue eyes bright. So do not reproach Mr Darcy for keeping Mr Bingley away from me, Lizzie. When all's said and done, I am grateful for his actions. He still acted out of an abominable sense of pride. And if you could only have heard his opinions of our family, Jane! Elizabeth shook her head angrily. Mr Darcy was undoubtedly correct. Jane! Elizabeth gasped, shocked. Mr Darcy knows what true love is, Lizzie. I believe he knew quite well that he did not see it between Mr Bingley and myself. As for our family... Jane took a deep breath, looking down at her hands. Let us be honest with each other. Love them all dearly, though I do. I do not deny that their faults exist. I might not throw it in their faces, as you are sometimes wont to do, because I would not for the world hurt their feelings. Elizabeth opened her mouth, and then closed it again without speaking. I think it is your pride that was stung, dearest, to have Mr Darcy look down on us, Jane said perceptively. Your feelings that are hurt, far more than mine. Now that you know I am not truly injured, can you not find it in your heart to forgive him? Did you not, after all, warn Charlotte that she would be unhappy in marriage to Mr Collins, perhaps in very much the same way that Mr Darcy may have warned Mr Bingley that he would be unhappy in marriage to me? Elizabeth started with shock at Jane's question, her cheeks suddenly flushing. I never considered it so, she cried. And Charlotte seems content enough, she finished weakly. As I might have been content enough in marriage to Mr Bingley, Jane said remorselessly. But why is it wrong for Mr Darcy to want his friend to have love, not just mere contentment, when you only wanted that for Charlotte? Elizabeth dropped her face into her hands with a moan of shame. I did, did I not? I acted just as dreadfully as he did. You acted just as much out of love for your dear friend as he did, Jane corrected gently. And knowing that, perhaps you can find it in your heart to forgive him. You were too good, Jane, too good. Elizabeth was quiet for a moment, thinking. Still, there is the matter of Mr Wickham. They looked at each other for a long moment, and then Jane said, Lizzie, I'm sorry, but I just don't believe it. Don't believe what? I don't believe that Mr Darcy treated Mr Wickham as abominably as he says. I think that Mr Wickham recognised Mr Darcy's regard for you, possibly before Mr Darcy even knew it himself, and that he deliberately poured his poison into your ear 
to turn you against Mr. Darcy even before he had a chance to court you. Elizabeth froze, her eyes wide. You know? That Mr. Darcy is quite hopelessly in love with you? Oh, everybody knows that now, Lizzie, though he kept it very secret indeed, I believe. Jane sipped her tea and arched an eyebrow at Elizabeth. Even from you, though considering your animosity towards him, that is understandable, I suppose. What do you mean, everybody knows now? Elizabeth could hardly believe what she was hearing. Lizzie, I have never seen a man so distraught when he thought that you, that you might die. Jane caught herself at the last moment. He was near collapse. Colonel Fitzwilliam told me that he thinks Mr. Darcy fell in love with you at the very beginning, when you refused to be in the least impressed by his wealth and consequence. Elizabeth pressed her hands to her forehead, barely able to take in what Jane was saying. If he had begun by saying something like that when he proposed, instead of telling me how much against his inclination it was to like me at all, I might not have been quite so angry with him, she said quietly. When he what? Jane gaped. So you do not know everything, then? Yes, Mr. Darcy proposed to me, Jane, in a proposal which surpassed even Mr. Collins's for awfulness, and I turned him down flat while throwing every terrible thing I have ever thought of him in his face. So that was why he wrote you the letter, Jane said, understanding at last. Colonel Fitzwilliam did not tell me what was in it, but it must have been some vindication of the accusations you made against Mr. Darcy. What letter? Elizabeth said blankly. Jane's eyes widened, and she was about to make a reply, when both girls were startled by a man's voice shouting from outside. Standing, Jane peered out of the window. "'Why, it is Dr. Trent,' she said. "'And, dear God, Lizzie, I think something has happened to Charlotte!' They both leaped to their feet and raced for the stairs, Jane forgetting entirely that Elizabeth should not be out of bed. Chapter 22 Dr. Trent had not delayed in his journey back to Hunsford, Though he was reasonably confident that Elizabeth should be safe, the shocking likelihood of Mr. Collins being her attacker meant that the doctor felt there was not a minute to be lost before he warned Mr. Bennet, at the very least, that Elizabeth might still be in some considerable danger. Stopping at the parsonage gate, he dismounted his horse and pushed the gate open. He could, he supposed, have gone on to his own house and left his horse there, but a terrible feeling of premonition had him deciding that he did not care to delay the five minutes that would cost him. Leading his horse up the pathway, he chanced to glance across to one side and saw something dark lying crumpled upon the ground. For a brief moment, Dr. Trent could not believe what his eyes were showing him, and then he dropped his horse's reins with a shout of horror and sprang towards the body lying far too still. Dropping to his knees, he reached carefully to turn over the woman in the dark dress and gave a low cry of distress upon seeing that which he had most feared, the pale, serene face of Charlotte Collins. Dr. Trent! Female cries reached his ears. He looked up to see Jane and Elizabeth Bennet rushing towards him. Dr. Trent, what? Elizabeth had stopped abruptly. Two steps ahead of Jane, she had seen what Jane had not, the rapidly blackening bruises encircling Charlotte's pale throat. My God! Shocked, she swayed on her feet. What? What? Jane clutched at her arm. Don't look, Lizzie, don't look! Elizabeth turned a startled look on her sister. She had expected that Jane would have swooned at the sight, but her sister, though pale, looked quite steady. "'Does she yet live, Doctor?' Jane asked. "'I... I know not.' Trent's hands were shaking, as they had not in many years when examining a patient. Carefully, he leaned down and pressed his ear to Charlotte's chest, praying that he was not scandalising the Mrs. Bennet with his actions. When he looked up, though, they were both staring at him with only anxious hope on their faces. Her heart is beating, but her breath is very shallow. We must get her inside at once and make her comfortable. Carefully, he eased his hands beneath Charlotte's body and lifted her into his arms. She was lighter than he had expected, almost frail as he carried her into the house. I'll go and see if Mr. Collins is in his room. Jane hurried in behind him. No! Trent almost shouted, carrying Charlotte into the parlour. No, Miss Bennet he said more quietly. I... there is something I will need to discuss with you quite urgently. He flicked his eyes towards Elizabeth and back to Jane. Regarding Mr. Collins, Jane said, bemused. Trent ignored her, laying Charlotte gently down upon the couch. Please, Miss Bennett, do not question me now. I will need my doctor's bag from my house next door. I did not have it with me. Oh, and my horse. 
I will catch your horse and take him to your house and return with your bag, Jane said, recognising that he was not of a mind to speak to her right now. Lizzie, is there anything that I can do here to make Charlotte more comfortable? Elizabeth asked hopefully, giving Jane a gentle push towards the door. Please, Dr. Trent, she has done so much for me. If there is anything that I may do for her in her hour of need, I pray you will tell me. You should probably not be out of bed. Trent glanced up and gave her a wry look. But since you are, please go to the kitchen. We must make the swellings on her throat go down, or her breathing passages may become constricted. Cold cloths, ice if there was any more brought down from Rosings for your head. At once, Doctor, Elizabeth hurried out immediately. Oh, Charlotte, Trent whispered, allowing himself the small luxury of her name in this brief moment of being alone with the woman he loved. Do not die. Please do not die. I cannot bear to think of a world without you in it. She was so pale and small. How had he never noticed before how small she was? She was a woman of such strength of character, even in her quietness, that she seemed far bigger than her true size. Gently he unfastened the top button of her dress, examined the positioning of the bruises around her throat. He had not seen such marks since his training in London, but the signs of strangulation were unmistakable the imprints of a man's strong fingers clear, darkening on Charlotte's fair skin. "'I have some cloth soaked in cold well water, Doctor,' Elizabeth said, hurrying back into the room, and Trent startled back. "'Thank you, Miss Elizabeth.' He took them from her, placed them carefully over Charlotte's throat. "'I have some smelling salts here,' Elizabeth suggested tentatively. "'No, they will make her cough, and we must not risk any more strain on her throat. Have you ever had a putrid sore throat?' When I was, oh, ten, I think, yes, Elizabeth nodded. I was quite miserable with it. Mrs. Collins will feel very much like that for some few days, although hopefully she will escape a fever. Soothing drinks, chamomile tea with honey, chicken broth, that will be all she can ingest, along with an elixir I will give you for her. What is in it, may I ask? Elizabeth asked, seeing his anxious expression and seeking to distract him. My mother makes a recipe which tastes strongly of licorice, which I confess I despise. That made a small smile come to Dr. Trent's face. He nodded to her. Some elixirs do contain licorice, but I have found there are quite a number of my patients who cannot abide it. The one I prefer contains syrup of violets, oil of almonds, honey, and a very small amount of syrup of poppy. That is the same syrup of which laudanum is made, if you did not know. I did, Elizabeth nodded. Those sound very soothing and healing. Lozenges made with whorehound and oil of oranges are very beneficial too, I have found. Trent was talking for the sake of making conversation, he knew, but he couldn't seem to stop, his eyes on Charlotte's face, on the slow rise and fall of her chest. We must keep the bruising down as much as possible, or her breathing will become very difficult. Elizabeth hesitated before asking nervously, Have you cared for someone who has been strangled before? Trent's head snapped around, and she came a little closer. You recognise the marks? he asked quietly. She licked at her lips nervously. My father's library contains some works written by medical men. I confess I did not understand everything in them, but the pattern on the bruising does seem to be consistent with the description. I cannot think of an alternative explanation for such marks as that in any case. He wasn't sure what to say. She looked at him with wise, knowing eyes, and said, Do you think it was the same man who attacked me, whoever that was, Dr. Trent? You know? It seems fairly evident, considering the marks I myself bear. She raised her hand to her breast. Jane is clearly terrified that I will one day remember, and I am not entirely sure if I wish to myself, so I must throw myself on your mercy and ask if I was violated. Your courage humbles me, Trent managed to get out through the lump in his throat. But no. Mrs. Collins examined you under my direction, and we were able to determine that you apparently fought off an escape from your attacker before before he did any more than rip your dress. Elizabeth nodded thoughtfully, kneeling down beside Charlotte and taking her friend's limp hand in her own. Whoever he was, he did not seem to attack Charlotte in the same way. No. He only tried to kill her. Did she suspect who he was, do you think? Or perhaps you discovered him lurking about the place? I have your bag, Doctor. Jane came hurrying in just then, cutting off Elizabeth's musings for which Trent could only be thankful. He beckoned Jane over quickly, took the bag from her, and dug through it briefly before finding a vial, carefully parting Charlotte's lips with his finger and lightly tapping a single drop onto her tongue. 
Sitting back on his heels, he watched her face anxiously. It was only a few moments later that Charlotte's eyelids fluttered, her eyes opening slowly before fixing on Trent's face. Daniel, Charlotte whispered faintly. You must not try to talk, dear Charlotte. He answered with her name instinctively, before realising what he had just done, what she had just done. Neither Jane nor... Neither Jane nor Elizabeth looked remotely concerned, though, both only leaning closer to assure their friend that they were there for her, that she was safe. "'Twas William!" Charlotte waved aside their concern, her eyes fixed on Trent's face. "'My own husband! I'm so ashamed!' "'Shh!' Trent touched her hand gently. "'How could it be any fault of yours?' "'You knew!' It was not a question. Tears trembled on her lashes. The Colonel and I deduced it just a little while ago. I came straight here, hoping to protect all of you. I was too late, though, Charlotte, and I will regret to my dying day that I did not drive my horse harder coming home. She smiled, a twisted, mirthless little tug at her lips. My own fault. I found the Spencer, confronted him. Jane suddenly realised just what Charlotte was saying, gasped aloud. No! No, it cannot be! Charlotte looked up at Trent with a desperate, weary appeal. Lightly, he touched her lips with his finger. Do not try to talk any more, Charlotte. Not right now. Your throat is terribly bruised, and you may find that breathing becomes difficult. I will not leave you until I am sure you are out of danger. Elizabeth was standing close beside the fireplace, her own hand pressed to her throat, staring at Charlotte. Her face was quite white. I remember she whispered, causing Jane to turn to her. Oh, God, Jane, I remember. He said such terrible things, tried to... Oh, Jane! Tears began to trickle down her cheeks, and Jane instinctively opened her arms to her sister, held her close to comfort her. Our own cousin, Jane murmured, shaking her head, utterly confounded. She did not want to believe it, indeed could hardly conceive that it was a possibility, but Charlotte and Trent's words seemed to constitute incontrovertible proof. A sudden loud sound in the hallway inside made Jane look up. Trent was wrapped up in caring for Charlotte, and Elizabeth was crying and shaking in Jane's arms, so it was she who faced the four men who came barging into the room. Chapter 23 Mr Bingley! Jane's mouth fell open inelegantly with shock. What are you doing here? I came as soon as I discovered your presence, dearest Miss Bennet, Bingley declaimed with a broad smile. I say, he noticed Elizabeth then. Is Miss Elizabeth all right? I should say clearly not, young man, Mr Gardiner said dryly, taking a step forward. But Darcy was ahead of him, his hand hovering just above Elizabeth's hair. Eliz Miss Elizabeth, I beg you, please do not cry. Only tell me what I may do to ease your distress. Looking up at him, Jane marvelled that none of them had suspected Darcy's partiality to Elizabeth while they were yet in Hertfordshire. It was writ large on his face now, in the agonised expression he wore, clearly wanting to take Elizabeth in his arms to comfort her, though he had no right to do so. "'Mr. Collins,' Jane said clearly, fighting to keep her voice steady, looking past the utterly bemused Bingley at the Colonel, who met her gaze and nodded. "'It was Mr. Collins. I am afraid that Mrs. Collins guessed the truth,' and confronted her husband with it. He attacked her. He nearly killed her, Trent put in vehemently, from his position kneeling beside Charlotte. Fitzwilliam's face hardened. Where is he now? He ran off, Charlotte whispered weakly, before Trent hushed her again. Come, Darcy, we need to find him. He must have taken leave of his senses. Yes, Darcy stared at Elizabeth, whose sobs had eased. She kept her face turned away from him, though. He removed a handkerchief from his pocket and awkwardly offered it to Jane. We will find him, he promised, caught at Bingley's sleeve and dragged him from the room in the Colonel's determined wake. What in God's name is going on? Bingley demanded plaintively as the door closed. Why is Miss Elizabeth so distressed? Miss Bennet barely looked at me. For God's sake, man, Darcy said, exasperated. She hasn't seen you in six months ever since you apparently decided she didn't suit you after all. Did you expect her to fall at your feet? He regretted the snap almost at once, because Bingley drooped like a kicked puppy. No, I, I suppose not, he muttered. 
especially not after Caroline and Louisa were so unwelcoming when she came to visit. Bingley, Fitzwilliam said, exasperated, right now we have more things to worry about than your hopeless inability to manage your impossible sisters. Bingley's mouth opened and closed again. He looked at Darcy, who was already heading for the door. What in God's name is going on? Bingley asked again. Fitzwilliam hesitated, glanced at the closed parlour door. Right now, we need to find Mr. Collins. The man has run mad. He almost killed his wife. He can't be far away. Come on, Bingley, let's move. Given a clear direction and a clear target, Bingley could move quite quickly, it transpired. The three men hurried down the path to the gate together, looked up and down the lane. Where would he go? Bingley asked. Not the church, surely. Rosings, Darcy and Fitzwilliam said simultaneously. Trying to save his own skin by throwing Elizabeth to the wolves. Or to Lady Catherine, rather, Darcy surmised. You were right the first time when you said to the wolves, Fitzwilliam said grimly. Which way would he go, though? The eastern lane is quickest, Darcy said, but we already know he prefers to avoid getting his feet muddy. The western lane, then. Fitzwilliam and Darcy started running. Seeing no other option, Bingley ran along with them. They were about halfway to Rosings when the most ghastly sound made them all start to run faster. It was a sound all three of them had heard before, that of a horse in terrible pain. The sight that greeted them around the next bend of the lane was so shocking that all three men stopped in their tracks, staring with horror before hurrying forward again. A man dressed in the livery of Rosings lay still in the grass closest to them. Bingley stooped to check on him as the other two continued on. One horse stood shaking in the traces of an overturned carriage. The second lay squealing and thrashing on the ground, one foreleg dangling at a horrible angle. Fitzwilliam didn't even hesitate before drawing the small pistol he had in his coat pocket and putting the poor animal out of its suffering. A blissful silence fell, broken only by the distressed panting and occasional neigh from the other horse. Bingley came up then, reached to try and calm the unsettled animal. The coachman's alive. Looks like he was knocked out in the crash, but he's coming around now. What's happened? It's Lady Catherine's small carriage, Fitzwilliam said, staring at the overturned box. Looking back at the legs that he could see sticking out from underneath the horse he'd just shot. I suspect they hit Mr. Collins on his way to Rosings. Good God, is he dead? Bingley left the horse, hurried over to look. I bloody hope so, Darcy said vehemently, seeming to come out of his shock just then. Striding quickly forward, he said, Give me a hand here, Fitz. Fitzwilliam offered his cupped hands as a step, and Darcy hopped up onto the side of the coach, now the top, wrenched open the door. A few moments later he scrambled back down again, face grim, answered Fitzwilliam's questioning glance with a shake of his head. Lady Catherine, Fitzwilliam said in shock. And Mrs Jenkinson. Thank God Anne wasn't with them. Mr Collins is dead! Bingley turned to face them from where he'd been struggling to move the dead horse. He's not the only one, Darcy said grimly. What a god-awful mess! A mess, Darcy! A man is dead! Bingley cried, shocked. So is my aunt, and a poor woman whose only fault it was to be employed by her, Darcy shouted back at him. Enough! Fitzwilliam stepped in between them. That will be quite enough. We must act now. Bingley, will you release that horse? Walk him? Stay with him and the coachman for a while? Darcy, you go back to the parsonage and get help. See if you can get Trent to leave Mrs Collins for a little while. And you? Bingley asked as Darcy turned without a word and began to run back along the lane. I'll go on to Rosings, break the news there and send men to help. I have to break the news to my cousin Anne, too. Either way, help will be here in just a few minutes, Bingley. Darcy stood for a moment just outside the parlour door, wondering how on earth he was to break the news to those gathered inside. He could hear Mr Bennet's voice now, added to Mr Gardiner's, the two older men talking in urgent tones close to the door. Taking a deep breath, Darcy turned the handle and pushed the door open. Mr Darcy, Mr Bennet said in quite astonished tones, are you quite well? He realised that he must look a fright, his coat all askew from running, his hair ruffled sweat on his face. Everyone in the room turned to look at him, Dr Trent rising to his feet. Darcy met Trent's eyes, glanced at Charlotte, and shook his head slightly. Miss Bennet, Miss Elizabeth, can I ask you to stay with Mrs Collins for a few minutes, please? Trent said steadily, keeping his voice calm and even. 
Jane and Elizabeth agreed at once, though Elizabeth found that her eyes lingered on Darcy. She had never imagined seeing him anything less than immaculately attired, had only very briefly seen him discomposed the night he proposed to her and they fought. He was looking at her now with that same expression on his face, an almost desperate yearning combined with not a little self-loathing. "'He despises his own weakness, not me,' Elizabeth realised with a sudden flash of clarity. "'He despises that he cannot control his feelings for me.' It was quite a heady rush of power, to realise that she had the power to so discompose a man such as Mr Darcy. She offered him a tiny, tentative smile, and watched the shock spread across his face before he smiled back at her. It was only a brief expression, but it quite transformed his austere, concerned features. Trent reached him then, encouraged him towards the door along with her father and uncle, but Darcy kept his head turned towards Elizabeth, watching her as long as he possibly could. As the door closed behind the men, Elizabeth found her heart beating fast, her cheeks flushed. Behind her she heard a strange noise and turned to see Charlotte laughing, a husky, rasping sound. Now you notice him! The effort of speaking was too much for Charlotte, though, and she began to cough. Jane and Elizabeth at once hushed her, telling her that she must not exert herself, must not strain her throat. Elizabeth felt the cloths at Charlotte's throat and found them warmed. Jane offered to take them to the kitchen to get fresh cool ones, and also to get some soothing tea. An excellent idea, Elizabeth approved. I shall sit here quietly with Charlotte, and we shall both rest until your return. That satisfied Jane, and she went away quickly, leaving Charlotte and Elizabeth alone staring at each other. You remember, Charlotte said hoarsely. Yes, Elizabeth remembered all too well. The awful things that Mr Collins had said, his hot breath on her cheek, his hands tearing at her bodice. I am so sorry, Lizzie. A tear trickled down Charlotte's pale cheek. Hush, hush. At once Elizabeth seated herself, reached for Charlotte's hand. Dearest Charlotte, do not distress yourself. How could you possibly have known? No, no, none of this is your fault. Lizzie? Charlotte? A small voice said. Whatever is going on? They both looked up, and startled with horror to see Maria, Charlotte's sister, standing wide-eyed at the door, staring at them. Chapter 24 Maria, Mr Bennet said behind her then, and Elizabeth sighed with relief as her father, face drawn with shock, nevertheless put a gentle hand on the shoulder of the younger girl and gently pushed her forward. I'm so sorry, but we have some quite dreadful news. Charlotte had grabbed the shawl from the back of the sofa as Maria looked away, hastily swathed it around her chest and neck to conceal her bruising. One glance at Elizabeth, and it was silently communicated between the two. Maria never, ever needed to know the truth of what had happened here. Sit down. Mr. Bennet said quite gently to Maria, and then to Jane when she came back in, the tea tray in her hands. "'Papa, whatever has happened now?' Jane said a little plaintively, but she set the tray down and seated herself. The front door closed again just then, and Elizabeth, closest to the window, looked out to see Darcy, the doctor, and Mr. Gardiner hurrying down the path. "'Something terrible has happened,' she thought, and looked back at her father just as he began to speak. "'I'm very sorry to have to be the bearer of such news, Mrs. Collins,' Mr. Bennet said, and his voice was very gentle. "'Mr. Collins has met with a most terrible accident.' Charlotte just stared at him. Jane and Elizabeth looked at each other. Maria was the only one who reacted in a manner that Mr. Bennet, ignorant of Mr. Collins' crimes, thought appropriate. She put her hands to her mouth and let out a horrified cry. "'Oh, no! Oh, my poor brother! Say it is not so!' I am so sorry, my poor dear. Mr. Bennet, unnerved by the silent staring of the other three, turned to Maria in some relief. It appears that he was on his way to Rosings in some haste when he startled Lady Catherine de Bourgh's carriage horses. He did not suffer. Lady Catherine? Elizabeth asked, startled. Yes, the carriage overturned. It must have been quite a collision. Lady Catherine had a companion, a lady named Mrs. Johnson, I believe. Mrs. Jenkinson, Elizabeth corrected. Mrs. Jenkinson? Mr. Bennet gave her a stern look. Have both tragically perished also. Charlotte began to cough, covered her face with the shawl. Elizabeth hastily attended to her, found to her shock that Charlotte was actually laughing hysterically even as tears streamed down her cheeks. Maria was crying too, great gulping sobs of real grief. Jane looked at her father and saw him beginning to hastily retreat, 
which she thought was probably the best possible thing for him to do in the circumstances. "'Why don't you go to the library and pen a letter to Mamma? she suggested to him hastily. "'I will tend to Maria, and Lizzie will stay with Charlotte.' Hastily she urged him from the room, wrapped her arm around Maria's shoulders, and led her out. "'Charlotte, please, you must stop,' Elizabeth begged. "'This cannot be good for your throat.' She patted gently at her friend's back, not at all sure what to say to her, as Charlotte choked and wheezed, patting at her eyes with the shawl. "'Let me pour you some tea. You must try to take a sip.' She added several spoonfuls of honey, despite knowing Charlotte would despise the oversweetness. The honey would soothe her throat. It was several minutes before Charlotte was able to stop her hysterics and calm herself, taking sips of the tea as Elizabeth held the cup. "'Thank you, darling Lizzie.' Charlotte whispered at last, leaning back exhausted. "'You must rest. This is all so... so...' Elizabeth couldn't even think of a word that even began to describe the events of the last few days. "'Overwhelming,' she settled for at last. "'But you've been hurt. I know how frightened for your health Dr. Trent is. You must rest.' "'You too, dear one,' Charlotte tugged gently on her hand. "'Come sit with me.' "'Do not try to talk, then,' Elizabeth admonished and Charlotte nodded. Elizabeth sat down beside her, and they waited in silence, Charlotte's head resting on Elizabeth's shoulder, both wondering what the outcome would be from the day's extraordinary events. Anne's reaction was not at all what Fitzwilliam might have expected when he made her sit down and gently broke it to her that Lady Catherine had been killed, along with Mrs Jenkinson and Mr Collins. She just stared at him silently for several long minutes, her eyes dark, before nodding. I understand. Thank you. Anne, Fitzwilliam said, puzzled. Your mother. Do you expect me to weep and wail and gnash my teeth with grief? I'm afraid I will not do that, cousin. My mother was not a good person, and I will cry no crocodile tears for her. Her death sets me free for the first time in my life. Anne looked as though a great weight had been lifted from her shoulders, he realised. She smiled at him, her eyes bright. I will play the suitably grieving daughter in public, of course, I cannot bring shame upon the family. But cannot you be at least a little happy for me, Fitzwilliam? Dear one, he said fondly, crossing the room and kneeling to take her hands in his. To see that smile on your face, I would have gladly slain her myself, the old dragon. Anne shushed him with a scandalised giggle. I am truly sorry about Mrs Jenkinson, though, she said when she sobered. She did her best to be kind to me, despite Mother's directives. Mr Collins, well, I never liked him— but I am most grieved for Mrs. Collins. I must go to see her as soon as possible, assure her that she will not have to leave the parsonage at all if she does not wish to. I think that she will wish to, and likely as soon as possible, Fitzwilliam said, making the snap decision to trust Anne with everything. She knew about the letter, after all, had been witness to Mr. Collins and Lady Catherine conspiring to use it against Darcy, and had been brave enough to defy her mother to thwart their plans. Anne's expression when he finished was pure horror. "'Well, I never heard anything so terrible,' she said finally. "'What wickedness! "'I did not care for the man, "'but to think that anyone, "'much less someone who purported to be a man of God, "'could act so. "'It is almost beyond belief.' "'Her expression hardened. "'His behaviour here, and that Mother sanctioned it. "'No, no, she could not have known, could she? "'That, at least, is not a sin which can be placed at her door. "'I shall be grateful for small mercies.' I should return, Fitzwilliam said. They will want to bring her up to the house. Go, Anne said. I will go and find some black clothes and prepare to play the suitably grieving daughter in public. I shall depend on your and Darcy's advice in the days to come, though, cousin. Do not dare abandon me to the tender mercies of my de Burgh cousins. They will have me married off to one of them in a trice in order to control Rosings, and I cannot imagine anything worse. You will never have to marry anyone you do not want to, Anne. "'Darcy and I promised you that many years ago, "'and nothing has changed now,' Fitzwilliam reassured her. "'I have no wish to marry at all, thank you. "'My health will never improve enough for me to be able to bear a child, "'and I have no intention of living out a marriage "'being constantly reproached for my inability to have an heir for Rosings.' "'Anne's response was quite composed. "'That stopped Fitzwilliam dead, even on his way to the door. "'He was so accustomed to thinking of Anne as the heiress to Rosings,' The question of who was next in line to inherit had never occurred to him. Remaining unmarried will leave you open to potentially dangerous situations, he warned. There will always be the unscrupulous who will covet Rosings' wealth, 
and you are of age to be married without your guardian's consent. Anne's smile was curiously secretive. You are sweet to worry about me, cousin, but you need not. I have it all planned out. You shall see. Fitzwilliam arrived back at the scene of the accident a few minutes after Darcy, Trent and Mr Gardiner to find that everything was well in hand. The coachman was being examined by Dr Trent, who pronounced him concussed but likely to recover in a few days. A groom led the surviving carriage horse slowly back up the lane to Rosings, and the three deceased had been laid carefully on the verge and covered with cloths. "'Presumably we will need another parson to perform the necessary offices,' Mr Gardiner said, making Fitzwilliam and Darcy start and look at each other, slightly alarmed. "'There must be someone in Sevenoaks,' Fitzwilliam said after a moment. "'Might I suggest that you ask Bingley to go?' he suggested quietly to Darcy. "'I don't think that we necessarily want him to know everything that has happened here. The secret has spread too far already.' Darcy nodded, looked at where Bingley was assisting the injured coachman to take a few unsteady steps. "'You're quite correct. Such an errand will both give him something useful, nay, essential to do, while getting him out of the way for a few hours. I will ask him directly.' Clearly utterly bemused by the morning's events, Bingley agreed with alacrity when offered the chance to be useful. Darcy and Fitzwilliam felt it incumbent on themselves to return with Lady Catherine's body to Rosings. After only a brief debate, it was decided that Mr Collins should be taken there also, there being little space at the parsonage. Bingley agreed to escort whatever clergyman he was able to find directly to Rosings and set off to collect his horse. Mr Gardiner elected to return to the parsonage with Dr Trent for the time being. "'Will you be returning to the inn at Seven Oaks tonight?' he inquired of Darcy. "'We will have to stay at Rosings,' Darcy realised at once. "'We cannot possibly leave our cousin Anne unsupported at this time.' "'Why do you not bring your belongings and stay at Rosings also?' Fitzwilliam suggested. "'I could not possibly intrude on the grief of the household at this time,' Mr Gardiner said, shocked. "'Anne knows everything, Mr Gardiner.' "'Everything,' Fitzwilliam emphasised when Darcy turned to look at him. "'In addition,' She has suffered much over the years under Lady Catherine's oppressive hand. Her primary emotion right now is relief, I believe. Please, Darcy added, when Mr Gardiner still looked undecided. Our acquaintance is short as yet, but already I respect you as a gentleman of great wisdom. Your close presence and influence at this trying time for both our families can only be of benefit. Gratified by such praise from a gentleman of such substance as Mr Darcy of Pemberley, Mr Gardiner agreed to send his coach back to the inn to collect his belongings and to join Darcy and Fitzwilliam at Rosings later that day. Chapter 25 The calm presence of Mr Gardiner at the parsonage that afternoon provided some much-needed steadiness. Fully apprised of the situation, he settled Mr Bennet in the study to pen necessary letters to family and friends, sent Dr Trent about his other duties, determined that Jane, Elizabeth and Charlotte were very ably taking care of each other, and concluded that he himself would be of most use escorting Maria Lucas to church to pray for the souls of the departed. Charlotte decided that she wished to rest, and Jane elected to escort her upstairs, leaving Elizabeth alone in the parlour, staring out of the window, hugging her arms around herself. Two of the most terrible moments of my life have occurred in this room, she thought to herself. Two moments in which I most seriously misjudged two men, one fine man to his detriment, and one man whom I trusted to mine. Leaning her brow against the window, she wished, silently but fervently, that she could turn time back a few days, try once again. If only, she sighed, watching her breath huff against the pain, if only I had not been so judgmental, so prejudiced against Mr. Darcy, if only I had not spoken so harshly to him. Elizabeth could admit to herself now that at least part of her harshness to him had been motivated by her pricked pride but that a greater part had been caused simply by pure shock. Because she, who took such pride in her skill at making out the character of her acquaintances, she had not had the faintest idea that Mr Darcy had ever looked at her other than to find fault. His passion had come as a complete surprise, and she, unable to comprehend it, had lashed out. Movement in the front garden caused her eyes to lift, and she saw the object of her thoughts even then walking up the front path. Seeing her at the window, he halted in his brisk stride, staring at her. For a long moment they stared at each other, and then he bowed slightly, though he did not take another step forward. He awaits my invitation, Elizabeth realised. Slowly she nodded, and Mr Darcy proceeded to the front door. 
she had a few seconds to collect herself, to pat a little at her hair and smooth her skirt, before he entered the room, bowing again to her a little awkwardly. Miss Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy, she curtsied. He had a black ribbon bound around his sleeve already, she realised, and thought that she herself must do so as soon as possible, though her soul rebelled at showing even the slightest sign of mourning for Mr. Collins. For an extremely awkward moment there was only silent staring between them, and then Mr. Darcy gave a great sigh, took a step forward, and said, "'My actions caused irreparable harm to come to you and those you love, and I could never apologise to you enough. You, of all people in the world, are the last one whom I would ever have wished to see suffer.' "'Your actions?' she gasped, quite startled. "'Why, Mr. Darcy, whatever can you mean? You cannot possibly hold yourself responsible for Mr. Collins.' No, but I do hold myself responsible for the letter which seems to have been the cause of his dissent, perhaps we should call it, and for the way I reacted so angrily to your accusations, which necessitated my writing the letter in the first place, which I should not have done, it was quite inappropriate. Elizabeth found herself smiling, taking a small step towards him. You take a great deal of the blame upon yourself, Mr. Darcy. I feel that I must have my share in it, for I should not have taken the letter from your hand, nor should I have acted in the unconscionably rude manner which led to your having to write it. He matched her smile with a tentative one of his own. I must ask if you ever had the chance to read it. I did not, I'm afraid. Without hesitation, she gestured to a chair. But I must assume that it contained answers to the accusations I flung so unfairly at you. Pray, will you not sit with me and tell me what you wish to say to me? Mr. Darcy waited only for Elizabeth to seat herself before sitting where she had indicated placing his hands on his knees and looking at her earnestly. Your accusations were not entirely unfounded. I did act quite unconscionably in seeking to separate Mr. Bingley from your sister, and I am deeply sorry for it. I wrote to him in an effort to make amends, which resulted in his presence here today. Elizabeth smiled a little sheepishly. This may result in another problem in and of itself, I fear. It seems that I do not know Jane quite so well as I thought I did, but then I do not think that she knew herself until after I was hurt. I see, Darcy said, realising at once what had happened. Miss Bennet was a little more in love than the idea of being in love than with Charles. Please do not mistake me. I believe that she did and still does perhaps care for him, but she has realised that she cannot love a man who is so willing to let others determine the course of his happiness. Darcy nodded with a rueful little smile. Charles is still young, and he is definitely too much influenced by his sisters. And yes, by me when Elizabeth gave him an arch look. I hope that I have learned my lesson, though, and I shall leave Charles and Miss Bennet to make their own decisions in future. That caused Elizabeth to bestow an even more radiant smile upon him, causing him to stare at her in wonder for a moment before recalling himself, coughing briefly into his hand and turning a little pink. I must now address the more serious matter of which you accused me, that of my interference in the affairs of Mr. Wickham. Before you speak any further... Elizabeth said, holding up a hand to stay him. I must tell you that I no longer believe Mr. Wickham's accounts of your dealings with him. Why? Darcy asked, mystified. Because I believe I have learned more of the kind of man you are in the past two days than I had any idea of in all our acquaintance, despite the fact that we have spoken little in those days. I have heard a good deal of your actions from others, though, enough to know you a good deal better, I think, and the man I know now could not possibly have acted so. He gazed on her then with such adoration that she blushed, and looked at her hands shyly. "'You're quite correct,' Darcy said when he regained his voice. "'Jealousy, though, caused me to be quite severe upon you, and my hatred of George Wickham only exacerbated my reaction. The thought that he might have won your heart was so painful that I could barely comprehend it.' "'Oh, no,' Elizabeth said, startled. "'Although I liked him, and he flattered and paid a good deal of attention to me, I do not believe that I ever considered him seriously as a suitor. While my mother and my younger sisters cannot look beyond a red coat and a handsome face, I am not quite so shallow as that, I hope. Should I marry, it will be to a man of substance, in character, not necessarily in estate. I am certainly aware that the size of my estate was not a consideration in your rejection of me, Darcy said, trying to smile, though the memory of her harsh words still stung. You are correct in that though I believe that I was sadly mistaken as to the substance of your character. For a moment of shocked disbelief, he stared at her. The question was trembling on his lips again when the disastrous reality of the timing struck him. They were both in mourning, their relatives yet to be buried. 
He could not ask her now. Passing his hands over his face, Darcy sucked in a slow, deep breath before exhaling and looking again at Elizabeth. I still wish to tell you the truths of my dealings with Mr Wickham. I believe that he sensed my regard for you even before I was willing to acknowledge it to myself, and he might still target you or your family merely to spite me. Forewarned is forearmed, Miss Bennet, and when it comes to Mr Wickham, I have learned my lesson in that regard. Never again will a woman I care for be left ignorant of what exactly he is capable of. A becoming flush spread across Elizabeth's cheeks as he spoke plainly of his affection for her, but she met his eyes steadily. I will be glad to hear anything you have to tell me, Mr Darcy. I have known George Wickham my entire life, Darcy began. His father, as fine a man as I ever knew, was steward at Pemberley. George and I played together as boys. Elizabeth nodded. This much he told me. She gave Darcy an encouraging smile. The best lies hold a grain of truth, I believe, tis said. Wickham is an expert at seeding his tales with just enough truth to make his listeners believe him, as I have learned to my sorrow. The first indications I had of his true character came when we were at school together at Eton. At first I thought it just a natural jealousy. Natural? Elizabeth queried, wondering if Mr Darcy was again about to show some of his pride in his noble lineage. Indeed. We grew up together and were treated equally by my father. I loved George as the brother I never had. It was not until Eton and other boys treating us differently, because I was the heir to Pemberley and he naught but a favoured steward's son, that I believe George himself began to feel resentment. I see, Elizabeth said softly. I was welcomed, without effort, into the innermost circles at Eton, and George was left out. Despite my earnest efforts to include him, he was not of noble lineage, and he would never, could never be accepted. Darcy sighed, looked at his hands. George resented me for the actions of the other boys. He began then to try to turn my father and I against each other, and I regret that it is entirely my fault that he was able to partially succeed. My father could see no wrong in him, and would not listen to my words. At Cambridge, Wickham's depravities only increased. I knew then that he should never be a clergyman. Darcy looked around the room briefly, then back at Elizabeth. He would have been no better than Mr Collins, worse perhaps. Elizabeth only watched him with wide eyes, waiting for him to continue. Following the death of my beloved father some five years past, Wickham came to demand the living that was promised to him. Yes, it was indeed promised when Elizabeth's lips parted as though to speak. Written into my father's will, along with a very generous legacy of one thousand pounds. Wickham, however, told me that he had no intention of becoming a clergyman, and stated that he wished to study the law instead. I paid him the sum of three thousand pounds in return for his resigning any claim to the living, and thus, I hoped, our acquaintance was at an end. Four thousand pounds, Elizabeth thought. But that is a fortune! Worse was yet to come, though, she was quite sure of it. Darcy took a deep breath and continued. For about three years I heard little of him, until he wrote to me confiding that his study of the law had proved most unprofitable, and that he was now absolutely resolved upon being ordained, if I would but present him with the living in question. His circumstances, he assured me, were exceedingly bad, and I had no difficulty in believing it, for I knew that his life had been spent in idleness and dissipation. Elizabeth gaped. He spent four thousand pounds in three years, she said disbelievingly. He did. You will hardly blame me for refusing to comply with his entreaty and resisting every repetition of it. Mr Darcy smiled a little at her evident indignation. His resentment was in proportion to the distress of his circumstances, and I have certain knowledge that he was most violent in his abuse of me to others. Yourself being the most recent example. Horrified that she had been so taken in, Elizabeth nodded, shamefaced. Mr Darcy leaned towards her, rather daringly reached out to gently touch her hand. Pray, do not blame yourself, Miss Elizabeth. Wickham is the most talented liar it has ever been my misfortune to encounter, yet I thought it beneath my pride to publicly denounce him. Chapter 26 Elizabeth had the feeling that Darcy still had worse to tell her, something that he was struggling to make himself say aloud. Turning her hand beneath his, she pressed lightly on his fingers. There is more, isn't there? Something even worse, some direct harm he has done to you. Whatever it is, I promise that no other soul will ever hear of it from my lips. Astonished, Darcy stared at her. 
You are the most insightful soul. I was just about to ask you to hold what I must say next in the strictest confidence. You have no need to ask, she told him gently. You have no need to tell me if it is too painful to speak of. No, he said. No, I will keep no secrets from you. This secret is not mine alone, though, and its escape could imperil the future of the person who has always been the most dear to me, my sister Georgiana. Elizabeth could not help it. She fairly gaped. Darcy gathered himself and told her his darkest, deepest secret. Last summer, Mr Wickham again obtruded most painfully on my notice. My sister, who is more than ten years my junior, and who was left to the guardianship of Colonel Fitzwilliam and myself, went with her companion, Mrs Young, to Ramsgate. It transpired that the Colonel and myself were most unhappily deceived in the character of Mrs Young, for she had a prior acquaintance with Mr Wickham, and conspired to meet him there. Georgiana knew nothing of Mr Wickham's character. She remembered him only as one who had been kind to her as a child, and he convinced her to believe herself in love with him. Elizabeth's free hand lifted to cover her mouth in horror. Darcy looked at her with eyes full of remembered pain before continuing. It was purest chance that I joined them unexpectedly a day or two before the intended elopement. Georgiana, unable to bear the thought of grieving and offending me, acknowledged the whole to me. In her innocence, she believed that I would be happy for her, that I would consider the whole thing a delightful surprise to find my sister married to my childhood best friend. Oh, no! Indeed. You may imagine what I felt and how I acted. I could not publicly expose them for fear of Georgiana's reputation being ruined, but I dismissed Mrs Young at once and removed my sister to London. Wickham's chief objective was Georgiana's fortune, of course, which is £30,000, but I believe that revenging himself upon me by means of her destruction must have been a not insignificant inducement. Darcy bit down on his lip, looked down at Elizabeth's hand on his, before finally admitting, Georgiana was at the time just fifteen years old, which must be her chief excuse. Seeing the way your younger sisters acted made me understand a little better just how unformed her mind must have been, how little prepared she yet is for the wickedness of which some men are capable. Elizabeth could not help herself. She wrapped her fingers around his and squeezed gently, tears welling in her eyes. I am so sorry, she said, her voice choked. I think that you understand now. What I meant when I said never again will I let a woman I care for be left in ignorance of the wickedness of which George Wickham is capable. Oh, I do, I do understand so much more about you now, and I am so very sorry that I misjudged you so dreadfully. A tear slipped free and rolled down her cheek. I accuse you of excessive pride, but the fault was mine. No, dearest Elizabeth, it was not. Darcy squeezed gently on her hand, fished his handkerchief from his pocket, and reached to blot the tear tenderly from her cheek. The more I think on it, the more I realise that I gave you absolutely no reason to trust me. Neither did Mr Wickham, and I was stupid enough to believe in his lies, she sobbed. Oh, please, my dearest, do not weep. I behaved appallingly in Hertfordshire long before Wickham darkened the county with his presence. He blotted more tears away gently. I have yet one more apology to make to you in any case. The way in which I spoke of your family was unforgivable. Your younger sisters may be silly, but none of them have sought to elope with a man far below their station in life. Your mother may flutter and display an occasional want of propriety, but she is far less obnoxious in seeking to marry her daughters off well than my own aunt. And your father may sometimes fail to correct his daughters, but at least he is not sending them off unsupervised, save for a woman he barely knows, to be seduced by rogues. Elizabeth laughed through her tears. I think we can only say that neither of us have the most perfect of relations. I have my dear Jane. You have your cousin Colonel Fitzwilliam. We must count ourselves lucky and manage the rest as best we may. You are as wise as you are beautiful, Darcy chuckled a little. Please do not cry any more, my dearest. Nothing has happened between us that cannot be mended, I hope, with some more efforts to actually talk and listen to each other. He ended on a questioning note, looking at her hopefully. His large hand was still holding hers, his fingers warm and strong. Looking down at it, Elizabeth took a deep breath before looking at him. Nothing has happened between us that cannot be mended, Mr Darcy, but you know that I am ruined. You are not, he said indignantly, and so sternly that she blinked and the tears stopped. 
Mr. Collins was a disgusting excuse for a man, and though I never thought I would say this about another human being, I am glad he is dead. No matter what he did to you, though, his free hand, still holding the handkerchief, came up to cradle her cheek. It makes no difference to who you are. You are still Elizabeth Bennet, the most admirable, remarkable lady it has ever been my privilege to encounter. They stared at each other for a few moments in silence, before Elizabeth whispered, Oh, Mr. Darcy. My name is Fitzwilliam, he said, which I concede is rather confusing, so Georgiana and my closest friends and relatives call me Will. If you could possibly consider doing that in private. Will? Darcy had to close his eyes for a moment, overcome with emotion. When he opened them, all he could say was, Would that I had the courage in Hertfordshire to speak my heart. I do not think that I would have been any more prepared to hear it then than I was a few days ago, Elizabeth admitted. Another brief silence fell, but unlike every other that had fallen between them, there was no tension, only an ease in each other's company that had never been there before. My timing is, it seems, exceedingly bad, Darcy said finally. I want nothing more than to ask you if I may go to your father right now to seek his blessing. That is a truly terrible idea! Elizabeth could not help a small giggle at the thought of her father's outrage if Darcy did as he suggested. Darcy smiled back at her, a most unexpected dimple appearing in his cheek that she had previously had no idea he possessed. She stared at it in fascination. Elizabeth, he said, his voice softer, deeper than before. I think that you need to stop looking at me like that, or I will be the one to compromise you. Her breath came more quickly, her eyes widened, but she did not speak. Not until he leaned closer, his eyes locked on hers, and then only to whisper a soft, Will, as her eyes drifted closed. The kiss was the merest brush of lips, Darcy's fingers lightly caressing her cheek, twining one long dark curl around his finger. He still held on to it when he drew back, looking at her face, her closed eyes, the soft smile on her lips. Elizabeth, he said tenderly. She said nothing but she opened her eyes and smiled at him. We have to wait, Darcy said reluctantly. I know. Slowly he dropped his hand from her face. I am sure you will be returning to Hertfordshire soon, and regardless of my feelings for Lady Catherine, I must enter official mourning for three months at least. As must I for Mr Collins, Elizabeth said with a grimace. They shared a mutual glance of distaste before Darcy spoke again. Since Georgiana must also enter mourning, I will remove her to Pemberley for the duration of the summer. Bingley, I think, will likely return to Netherfield this autumn, and I shall come to visit him there. Elizabeth gave him an arch smile as he finally dropped his hand from her face. I am sure that many of your acquaintance in Hertfordshire will be delighted to see your return. You know well that there is only one of my Hertfordshire acquaintance whom I hope will be pleased to see me. I am sure that Sir William Lucas will be positively ecstatic to once again talk with you about his visits to St. James. Dear Minx, Darcy said fondly, lifting the hand he still held to his lips and lightly kissing her fingertips. For your sake, I will gladly discuss St. James with that old knight until we find some mutual acquaintance he can celebrate. But be assured that in return, I will be asking him for stories of the childhood exploits of a certain young lady I know. Elizabeth's eyes widened. Oh, dear! Her expression was so alarmed that Darcy began to laugh. Kissing her fingertips again, he chuckled. I begin to think that you were even more troublesome as a child than I feared. The sound of the front door opening and closing made Darcy sigh and let go of Elizabeth's hand. Standing, he moved away to a respectable distance and had assumed his usual pose standing stiffly by the window when the parlour door opened to admit Mr Gardiner and Maria Lucas. M Mr Darcy! Maria gasped, dropping a hasty curtsy. Miss Lucas. To Elizabeth's surprise, Mr Darcy unbent significantly, smiling gently and approaching Maria. He reached out to take her hands in his and spoke softly to her. I am so very sorry for the loss of your brother. I am sure that it will be a great comfort to Mrs Collins to have her dear sister close by at this trying time. Oh! Maria looked quite overcome. Thank you, she whispered shyly at last. Darcy pressed lightly on her hands again before releasing them, turning back to Elizabeth. I invited your uncle, Mr Gardiner, to stay at Rosings Park until he has to return to London, he told her. 
While social calls are of course out of the question, my cousin Anne has indicated to me that she would like to see you and to meet Miss Bennet before your return to Hertfordshire. Your uncle's residence at Rosings will provide an entirely unremarkable reason for your presence, therefore. May I tell Anne that she will see you on the morrow? Surprised, Elizabeth looked at Mr Gardiner, who gave her a benevolent nod. I, yes. Please tell Mr Berg that Jane and I will be delighted to attend Rosings tomorrow. Darcy took his leave with a handshake for Mr Gardiner and very correct bows to both Maria and Elizabeth. Only Elizabeth saw the smile he darted her before he exited the room, though. Or so she thought, until she turned to see her uncle's hastily hidden smirk. Chapter 27 Elizabeth was not at all surprised when Mr Darcy arrived at the parsonage a little before she and Jane planned to depart for Rosings the following morning. That he was accompanied by Colonel Fitzwilliam was rather less expected. "'Good morning, gentlemen,' she said with an arch little smile. "'We are much honoured by your escort.' Darcy bowed over Jane's hand, almost perfunctorily, before turning to Elizabeth and taking her hand to kiss. "'After what happened to you on your last walk to Rosings,' he said quietly, for her ears alone, "'it would have been unconscionable of me to allow you to make that walk without my escort. Never again, Elizabeth, will I put you at risk.' She looked up into his eyes and smiled, allowing him to retain possession of her hand, tuck it into the crook of his elbow. "'You did not put me at risk.' will. We may have to agree to disagree on that point. As on many others, no doubt. Her tone was pert, her eyes sparkling as she looked up at him. But then, you rather seem to enjoy it when I disagree with you. He smiled rather sheepishly at that, pressed his gloved fingers lightly atop hers. You are at your most fetching when you are passionate in defence of a point. Delighted to have discovered something else about him, Elizabeth tightened her hold on his arm and moved a little closer. "'I believe that I shall be sure to disagree with you regularly, Will, to ensure that your regard of me remains constant. "'You need have no fear of it diminishing, even if we in the future agree on every single topic, I assure you,' he said fervently. Walking in their wake at a slightly more sedate pace, Jane and Colonel Fitzwilliam both carefully averted their eyes. Colonel Fitzwilliam, though, could not resist asking the question— they seem to have um, settled any differences that may have previously existed between them. He made it a question. I believe that a very honest conversation yesterday cleared the air, rather, Jane said with a small smile. You and Miss Elizabeth are very close, are you not? As close as two sisters may be, Jane's smile was loving. She is the best of sisters. She says the same thing of you, Miss Bennet. Long before I laid eyes on you, Miss Elizabeth had regaled me with tales of your sweetness, your good nature. I half expected to see a halo atop your head, an angel wing sprouting from your shoulders. Her smile vanished. Pray do not call me an angel, sir. I am far from that. That was what Bingley called you, Fitzwilliam realised. His angel. He set me on a pedestal, and I think I might be afraid of heights, Jane whispered. Blue eyes lifted, looking into his beseechingly. I do not want to be admired only for how I look, sir. I want to be admired as Mr Darcy admires Elizabeth, for everything I am. For a few steps further they were silent, as Fitzwilliam gathered his thoughts. And then he smiled broadly and said, Do you realise, the first time I saw you, you were smacking Darcy across the face with every scrap of your strength? Jane's lips parted with shock. So I was, she gasped. I was quite sure that you were, in fact, a Valkyrie. Blushing, she began to giggle, her hand coming up to cover her mouth. Oh, dear! Should I never discover your name, I planned to regale my regiment with fantastic tales of having witnessed Freya, the Viking goddess of battle, in action. She had to stuff almost her whole hand in her mouth to stifle the peals of laughter that were trying to escape. It could not be more inappropriate. Shoulders shaking, she looked up at him from eyes bright with amusement, and Fitzwilliam realised to his despair that he, too, was quite lost to one of the remarkable Bennet sisters. Jane had thankfully collected herself by the time they arrived at Rosings. Darcy and Fitzwilliam escorted the two sisters into a small sitting room Elizabeth had not seen before, much more simply furnished than the grand, ornate rooms Lady Catherine had favoured. Anne was seated by the window, conversing quietly with Mr Gardiner. She turned her head and smiled as they entered. My dear Miss Elizabeth, 
What a treasure your uncle is. We are blessed to have both my uncle and my aunt in the family, Elizabeth agreed, moving forward, her hand falling from Darcy's arm. Mr. Berg, I do not wish for your condolences any more than you do for mine, Anne interrupted her. Elizabeth's brows crinkled and Anne smiled at her. I am sure that I do sound just like my mother, yes. Another reason why I have no intention of marrying and inflicting myself as a mother on some unfortunate child. Jane, still fighting down laughter from her conversation with the Colonel, let out a most unladylike snort. Anne smirked at her. You must be the famous Miss Bennet. I quite see why you are lauded as the beauty of Hertfordshire. Ah, but I see that you do not care for that description, any more than I care for being known as Lady Catherine's sickly daughter. Sensing a kindred spirit, Jane smiled and moved forward, extending her hands. Despite the circumstances, Mr. Berg, I am delighted to meet you. Accepting the friendly handclasp, Anne offered a genuine smile. And I you. Please, will you call me Anne? Turning her attention to the gentleman in the room, Anne waved her hands. Will you all leave us, please? I wish to confer with Jane and Elizabeth in private. Given such a request, there was little they could do but acquiesce and depart, though Darcy shot Elizabeth a concerned look before the door closed. She smiled reassuringly at him in return, before turning back to give Anne her full attention. Firstly, Anne said once they had seated themselves, and she had poured tea for Jane and Elizabeth from the tray set in front of her. I would like to offer you my apologies, Elizabeth, for my mother's appalling behaviour towards you. You owe me no apology, Mr. Berg, Anne. We cannot hold ourselves responsible for the actions of our relatives, certainly not those who are far beyond our control. I do hope so, else I will be paying for my mother's sins for a long time yet to come. But then, you only said that we cannot hold ourselves responsible. No doubt others who are less generous than you will still hold her actions against me. The truth of that will be known only by you and God come judgment day, Jane said gently. Anne smiled at her. Well, I will be glad to let him be my judge. Speaking of God, though, Elizabeth, I need to ask you something. About Charlotte, Elizabeth said astutely. Indeed. Charlotte, I will not call her Mrs. Collins, has been nothing but kind to me since the first day of her arrival, despite my mother demeaning and belittling her constantly. Indeed, I believe she has been the first friend I have ever had. Should she wish to remain at the parsonage, I shall be glad to permit her to do so for as long as she wishes, at no cost. I can easily provide a new house for the vicar I will request my cousins help me to select and appoint. That is a very generous offer, Anne, Elizabeth said sincerely. But, Anne heard the hesitation in her tone, I think we both believe that Charlotte was not entirely happy in her marriage. Nor is there a great deal for her to return to with her family in Hertfordshire, though I would be delighted to have my friend return to us. I thought you would say that. Consequently, I intend to ask her to come to live with me here at Rosings as my companion. Since she is widowed, she would be considered a quite unexceptionable chaperone. Do you think that she would accept, or would I cause offence by asking? Anne leaned forward, her expression a little anxious. Elizabeth realised just how much regard Anne held Charlotte in. Anne, she reached out, touched Anne's hand. I honestly believe that she would be both honoured and delighted by such a request. Anne's smile bloomed, wide and joyous. We will both be in mourning for quite some time, obviously, but I hope that as soon as it is possible, you will both come to visit us and stay for as long as you wish. Your younger sisters, too. I should like to meet them all. You may come to regret that offer, Elizabeth chuckled. Lizzie, Anne, that is a truly kind and generous invitation, and we will be delighted to accept as soon as we can. May we correspond in the meantime? Jane requested. I shall be quite downcast if I do not hear from both of you regularly. Anne stood to embrace them both. Charlotte and I shall be very quiet here. We shall depend upon you to keep us entertained with your letters. Anne requested that they not speak of her request to Charlotte yet, only to advise her that she should remain in the parsonage as long as she wished. Anne would visit once the funerals had passed. Sir William and Lady Lucas arrived on the morning of the funerals. Sir William would attend with Mr Bennet and the other gentlemen, and they would remain with Charlotte for a few days before returning home with Maria. Mr. Bennet and Mr. Gardiner left directly following Mr. Collins' funeral with Jane and Elizabeth. They would stop for a night at the Gardiner's home on Gracechurch Street before Mr. Bennet took his daughters home to Longbourn at last. Elizabeth had no opportunity to farewell Mr. Darcy without her father present. 
Cautious of raising Mr. Bennet's suspicions, she cast Darcy a pleading look when he bent to kiss her hand. He correctly interpreted the glance and reverted to his usual formality, though with a warmer attitude than Mr. Bennet was wont to expect. Peering thoughtfully from Darcy to Elizabeth, Mr. Bennet let out a small harumph. His eyes twinkled a little as he bade farewell to Darcy. "'Perhaps we shall see you at Netherfield again this autumn, sir?' "'Perhaps,' Darcy said blandly, wondering if Elizabeth's father had somehow seen through him, or if Mr. Gardiner had been talking. He could hardly ask, though he could at least hope that time and the opportunity to consider might bring Mr. Bennet to be pleased with the idea of Darcy courting Elizabeth. "'I shall be rather displeased if any of my daughters have their hearts broken again, though,' Mr. Bennet said sternly. "'I shall sincerely hope that they do not, sir.' Darcy glanced sideways, to where Colonel Fitzwilliam was staring at Jane with a foolishly lovesick expression on his face. She, in return, was blushing shyly and casting small smiles his way. "'I pray that you will take good care of all your daughters in the meantime. "'I believe that I have quite learned my lesson about letting any of them out of my sight,' Mr. Bennet replied dryly. "'Never fear, Mr. Darcy. Three months' morning will be quite enough time for them to drive me all to the point of wanting to banish at least some of them from the house permanently.' though it is likely that those who depart will be those I would wish to keep. He definitely knows, or at least strongly suspects. Darcy said no more, only bowed in polite farewell before turning to bid Mr. Gardiner a friendly adieu. Chapter 28 Mrs. Bennet fussed over Jane and Elizabeth on their return to Longbourn, though she spent more time mourning that both of them had come home unwed than showing concern over Elizabeth's accident. They were quite content not to have to discuss the matter anyway, since they had already agreed that no good could come of anyone else knowing the depths of Mr. Collins' wickedness, especially not Mrs. Bennet, who would never have been able to keep such a juicy secret to herself. Well, Mrs. Bennet threw up her hands, after several minutes of prying over their dinner failed to elicit any worthwhile gossip. I am glad that you are well, Lizzie, and that you are both come safely home again. Poor Charlotte! This was said with a great deal of insincerity, before Mrs. Bennet leaned forward and said in a loud whisper, I do not suppose you detected any signs that she was increasing, did you? Mamma! Jane gasped, utterly shocked. Well, but it is an important question, Jane, for you in particular. If there is no sun, then there is no entail. Beaming, Mrs. Bennet sat back in her chair. Longbourn will be saved. Astonished, Elizabeth and Jane stared at each other in silence. Elizabeth was the first to recover her voice. Are you sure, Mamma? Does not the entail devolve to the next male heir in line? There is none, Mrs. Bennet said with great satisfaction. My brother Phillips has investigated the matter thoroughly, and the terms of your great-grandfather's will are quite clear. With no living male heir after your father, the entail reverts to the eldest female in line. Yourself, Jane! Provided that Charlotte Collins is not enceinte with Mr. Collins' son, ghastly thought. Mamma, she has just lost her husband, Mary reproached. Surely a child would be a great comfort to her in this time of such terrible grief. Oh, what do you know about it? Mrs. Bennet flapped a dismissive hand at Mary. She only took him because she had her eyes on being mistress here after I am gone. Well, now she will have nothing. Mamma! Jane, Elizabeth and Mary cried in a chorus of disgust. Mrs. Bennet harumphed and tossed her head. Well, the timing is most inconvenient too. Your father was going to take us all to Brighton for the summer. I most certainly was not, my dear. Mr. Bennet lowered his newspaper for long enough to say. Nor did I plan to allow Lydia to go by herself, no matter how dear a friend she is to Mrs. Forster. Stupid, stupid Mr. Collins, Lydia burst out vehemently. Now we're in mourning. We can't even go to parties and meet the officers, and they're leaving in just a few days. I'll never see my dear Wickham again. Poor darling Lydia, Mrs. Bennet fluttered her handkerchief. If only you could go to Brighton, I am sure you should have caught him. Lydia promptly burst into noisy tears and was equally swiftly banished upstairs by Mr. Bennet, who would not tolerate such behaviour, not at mealtimes at any rate. Elizabeth could hardly wait to make her own escape with Jane, hurrying upstairs to their shared room and closing the door. Dear Lord, I think that this family may have had a lucky escape, she gasped. I know. Kitty whispered to me that Wickham has called regularly. "'Courting Lydia quite assiduously.' "'What a horrifying thought!' Elizabeth shivered. "'Well, we must keep a very close eye on Lydia until the regiment has departed.' 
You can't think that she would, Jane said, shocked. She has thought of nothing but officers and flirtations since the regiment first came to Meryton, and with their departure she is clearly cast into despair. Foolish girl that she is, I believe her quite capable of doing something that would cause irreparable damage to her reputation, if she thought that it might persuade Wickham to marry her. We must ensure that she does nothing of the sort, Jane said decisively, making Elizabeth blink at her uncharacteristic firmness. She has brought enough ridicule and shame upon this family, Lizzie. She almost cost you a chance at happiness with Mr Darcy, and I will tolerate no more of it. It is high time that she and Kitty both learned proper behaviour. Elizabeth sat back and stared at Jane admiringly. I have never seen you like this, Jane. Well, if I am one day to be mistress of Longbourn, it is high time that I started acting like it, is it not? Jane smiled back at her. I have done my best to lead by example for our younger sisters, Lizzie, as of you, I know. I believe that it is high time we admitted to ourselves that this strategy has failed us, and we must adopt new tactics. Strategy and tactics? You sound positively military, Jane, Elizabeth teased gently. She was a little surprised when Jane blushed. Colonel Fitzwilliam and I, we talked quite a bit while we were trying to work out who it was that attacked you. Jane's voice was soft, and she looked down at her fingers, twisting them together in her lap. He said that... that I was clever. Nobody ever called me clever, Lizzie, never in my life. Everyone just expects me to be pretty and nothing more than that. But Colonel Fitzwilliam... She chuckled surprisingly. His first sight of me was when I walked into the parlour and slapped Mr Darcy across the face. I don't believe that he ever thought of me as just a pretty face. Elizabeth stared at her astonished. You slapped Mr Darcy across the face? Realising that she'd never told Elizabeth about that incident, Jane began to laugh. Who are you and what have you done with my sister? Elizabeth exclaimed, before joining in with Jane's laughter. Chapter 29 Three months later. For once, Meryton's gossip mill did not provide the ladies of Longbourn with adequate warning of the arrival of the denizens of Netherfield. The first notice they received came when Kitty glanced out of the window one morning and said, Why, Mamma, that looks like Mr Bingley at the gate. And he is not alone. There are two other gentlemen with him. One of them looks like that tall, proud-looking man who was with him before. What was his name? Mr Darcy? Mrs Bennet said. Well, any friend of Mr Bingley's will always be welcome here, to be sure. He was very kind to both Jane and I in Kent, Mamma. Elizabeth cut off anything else her mother might have been about to say. Not at all proud. Mrs Bennet harumphed. Well, he is not here for any of you, that is for sure. Mr Collins was always quite certain that he would marry Mr Berg. I dare say he is only waiting until her mourning period is over, now that she is the sole owner of Rosings. Who is the third gentleman, Kitty? she called. Is it that Mr Hurst? No, Mamma. It is a gentleman I never saw before, Kitty replied. He is quite as tall as Mr Darcy and wears a soldier's red coat. Lydia looked up at this intelligence, but did not squeal with excitement as she might once have done. It was Jane whose reaction was telling. She dropped the handkerchief she was stitching on, her face turning quite pink. Mrs Bennet, of course, quite misunderstood the cause of Jane's reaction. Mr Bingley has returned for you, Jane, she cried triumphantly. Oh, I knew it. I knew you could not be so beautiful for nothing. And now that you will one day be mistress of Longbourn in your own right, there is nothing to give him pause. Mr Bingley, however, knew two steps into the room that his chance to win the heart of the eldest Miss Bennet had well and truly passed. For it was not him she looked at with her blue eyes shining, a soft smile on her lips, but the red-coated colonel at his side. A little alarmed by the way the colonel and Jane were gazing at each other, seeing her dreams of Jane as mistress of Netherfield, leaving Mrs Bennet to permanently rule the roost at Longbourn, going up in smoke, Mrs Bennet hastened to request an introduction. Mr Darcy lost no time in advising Mrs Bennet of his cousin's connections, guessing that the fact that Fitzwilliam was an earl's son in addition to a colonel would dazzle her entirely. He was quite correct in that assumption, and Fitzwilliam soon found himself seated in the place of honour between Mrs. Bennet and Jane, being plied with tea, cake, and Jane's smiles. Bingley found himself at somewhat of a loss until Kitty approached him with a sweet smile. "'It is a great pleasure to see you here in Hertfordshire again, Mr. Bingley. Please, will you not sit down? 
May I bring you some tea? I should very much like to hear how you've been spending your time since last we met. Mollified by Kitty's bright eagerness and evident delight in his presence, Bingley allowed himself to be drawn to a chair beside Lydia. Though he expected to take little pleasure in the visit now, he found himself pleasantly amused, both girls behaving in a much more mature and amicable manner than he had recalled they were wont to do. Having performed the necessary pleasantries, Darcy lost no time in making for Elizabeth's side, but was intercepted by Mary, who planted herself squarely in front of him. "'Miss Mary,' he said with a polite bow. "'Mr. Darcy, I wish to present my very great sympathies for your devastating loss.' Darcy paused, taking in Mary's dress. She, alone among the Bennets, still wore the severe black of mourning. The eyes she lifted to him, very similar eyes to Elizabeth's, he noted, were brimming with honest sympathy. Suppressing his first instinct to brush her off, he said, "'That is a very kind sentiment, Miss Mary, I thank you. I have lost quite a few close family members in my life, though. While we should continue to remember them with love, there comes a time when we must move on with our own lives and set our grieving behind us. That, after all, is what those who loved us would wish, for us to be happy, is it not?' Mary's mouth opened and closed a time or two, but she did not seem to have a ready answer for him. "'Your respect for the deceased does you credit, but I beg you, do not lose yourself to mourning, Miss Mary. Especially not now. I have a very particular reason for asking, you see.' A little stunned at Mr. Darcy taking so much time to speak to her, Mary stuttered out a, "'But why?' "'My sister Georgiana is at Netherfield with me this visit. Georgiana is shy, and I hope that the two of you might find something in common if you would consent to be introduced.' Mary looked around as though looking for someone else that Mr. Darcy might be speaking to. Me? she said finally. You want to introduce me to your sister? Why, yes. Georgiana is exceedingly fond of music, you see, and I have been reliably informed that you are by far the most diligent of the Mrs. Bennet when it comes to practising on the pianoforte. Or is my intelligence on the matter incorrect? Yes, I mean, no, I... I... Mary stuttered. Elizabeth kindly came to her rescue. "'You are quite correct, Mr. Darcy. Mary is indeed by far the most interested in music of my sisters. I am sure she would be most delighted to meet Miss Darcy, as would we all. Then I hope you will allow me to send my carriage to fetch all of you to Netherfield for tea tomorrow afternoon?' Mr. Darcy smiled down at Elizabeth. "'I believe Mr. Bingley has in hand an invitation from Mrs. Hurst, who is acting as his hostess on this occasion.' "'Miss Bingley?' Elizabeth queried with a glance in his direction. "'Has gone to visit relatives in Scarborough on this occasion?' Mr Darcy gave her a bland look, but she could see the laughter lurking in his eyes. "'I may have mentioned something to the effect that the house party could develop, shall we say, undesirable tensions, should she seek to interfere in the affairs of certain other guests again.' Deaf to the unspoken communication occurring between her sister and Mr Darcy, Mary waited impatiently for him to finish speaking before saying quickly, "'Mr. Darcy, we are all so very honoured by your invitation to meet your sister. By your leave, I shall go now and look through our music sheets. We have quite a collection, you know. It is possible we may have some that Miss Darcy has not seen.' Darcy gave her a paternal smile. "'That is a very kind thought, Miss Mary, and I know that Georgiana will surely appreciate it.' Smiling, Mary bobbed a quick curtsy before hurrying out leaving Elizabeth and Darcy standing alone by the window. "'Why do I have the feeling that Miss Darcy is very likely in possession of every music sheet ever printed, and probably has no need of anything from our poor collection?' Elizabeth asked archly. "'Are you implying, Miss Elizabeth, that I thoroughly spoil the people I love?' Darcy replied, a small smile playing about his lips. "'Because if so, you are quite correct. Even so, I assure you that Georgiana will be quite delighted by Miss Mary's having thought to share her music.' even if there is not one single new piece for her to exclaim over. That made Elizabeth smile. I am very much looking forward to meeting Miss Darcy, she admitted. She is most eager to make your acquaintance, I assure you. I have told her much of you. Elizabeth blushed a little at that and looked down. Darcy took pity on her, here in Longwood's parlour with her mother watching on with great interest. Georgiana and I spent a few days at Rosings before repairing to Netherfield, he changed the subject. "'You did? How are Anne and dear Charlotte? "'It is at least a fortnight since Charlotte's last letter,' Elizabeth said. "'The widow Collins tasked me with delivering her latest missive to you myself, 
since she knew I would see you soon, Darcy said, loudly enough for Mrs. Bennet to hear, before drawing a sealed envelope from inside his jacket. He held it up for Mrs. Bennet's inspection before handing it to Elizabeth. Oh, thank you! But I will not be so rude as to read it now when there are guests to be entertained, Elizabeth said with a smile, tucking it into the pocket of her dress. I am glad of that, because I wished to see your face when I told you a small part of the news it contains, and Charlotte herself tasked me to describe your expression when next I write to Anne, Darcy said mischievously. Intrigued, Elizabeth tilted her head. I cannot imagine what you mean, Mr. Darcy. Pray do tell. Dr. Trent proposed to Charlotte, and she accepted him. Darcy spoke quietly for her ears only. Elizabeth, though, could not possibly restrain her joy at such happy news. Clasping her hands together, her face shining with joy, she exclaimed, Is it true? Oh, my dearest Charlotte, how happy I am to hear of it! What's this? What's this? Mrs. Bennet cried immediately, not to be denied her right to share an interesting gossip. Mr. Darcy shared the news generally. The room rejoiced, and even Mrs. Bennet, in the face of such general happiness for a friend, was brought to say grudgingly that Charlotte would likely make a very good doctor's wife. Far better that than mistress of Longbourn, she muttered under her breath, casting a speculative glance at Colonel Fitzwilliam. Second son he might be, but surely the Earl had a number of properties, one of which might be bestowed upon a younger son on the occasion of marriage. Perhaps the Colonel might even buy Netherfield, and then Jane might have it after all, leaving Mrs. Bennet at her beloved Longbourn for her lifetime. With a little smile as she mentally arranged matters to her satisfaction, Mrs. Bennet settled back in her chair. Her gaze fell on Kitty then, talking earnestly to Mr. Bingley, who was listening with a smile on his face. Or perhaps Bingley will keep Netherfield, and the Colonel will purchase another local property. I shall begin looking about. Hay Park might do if the Gouldings would quit it, or even Ashworth. Lost in pleasant daydreams, Mrs. Bennet did not even notice when Mr. Darcy quietly invited Elizabeth to take a turn about the gardens, and she equally quietly accepted, smiling happily up at him. Chapter 30 Finale Lydia was the only one who saw them go. She put a hand to her mouth, eyes twinkling, but nodded at Elizabeth. Elizabeth smiled back at her in return as she and Darcy slipped out of the room. It was a warm day. She caught up her bonnet as they passed through the hall, but did not bother with the police. The moment they were out of sight of the house, Darcy took her hand in his, and Elizabeth was pleased to let him, smiling up at him with great joy. "'To see you smile so at me surpasses my greatest hopes,' he told her. "'My dear Will,' she told him, "'seeing you again brings me great joy, even without your having brought me such happy news. Charlotte is happy, is she not?' "'She is, and Anne is overjoyed for her. Charlotte does not intend to wait for a year of mourning to be over, it is now known around Hunsford that Collins was an abusive husband. It is, Elizabeth said, startled. The bruises on Charlotte's neck could not be completely hidden from all the people who came to pay their condolences, Elizabeth. There was talk, and Dr. Trent felt, rather understandably, disinclined to lie to protect the reputation of a dead man and one who had almost killed his own wife. I see. Your name has not been whispered, though, I am assured. Darcy squeezed her fingers gently. Your reputation is safe, and even Charlotte's decision to quickly remarry is considered above reproach, especially with Anne's blessing and that of the new parson. The new parson? A young man from Pemberley, as it happens, who has recently been ordained. All is arranged to Mr Darcy's satisfaction, Elizabeth said lightly. To yours too, I should hope, he bent an earnest glance upon her. Your fondness for Charlotte is evident, and I assure you that Dr Trent loves her deeply. If you wish it, you shall see for yourself. They plan to marry at the end of September, and Anne has charged me with making arrangements to convey the entire Lucas and Bennet families to Rosings, to stay there at her invitation, for the happy occasion. Astonished, Elizabeth gaped. That is extraordinarily generous of Anne. I suspect her of ulterior motives, actually. With Charlotte marrying, and of course moving to Dr Trent's home, I think Anne is a little concerned that she may be lonely. I believe she plans to possibly ask one, or more, of your sisters, or perhaps Miss Lucas, to go and reside with her for a while. Pleased at the idea, Elizabeth smiled up at him. I am sure that we should be delighted to attend Charlotte's wedding, and I shall be very glad to see Anne again, if she is sure that she is ready to be overwhelmed with a house full of Bennets and Lucases. 
Rosings is large enough to contain you all, Darcy said laughingly, and then with great daring. As would Pemberley be. Would it? Elizabeth asked softly. When might we all have occasion to see Pemberley, Mr Darcy? Why, on the momentous occasion of one of the Mrs Bennet becoming Pemberley's mistress, Darcy replied, his heart in his eyes as he stopped walking and turned to face Elizabeth, taking her other hand so that he held them both, before dropping to one knee before her. Dearest, loveliest Elizabeth, you are too generous to trifle with me. If you cannot come to feel for me as powerful a regard as I have held for you these many months, pray tell me so now, and I will forevermore be silent on the matter. Oh, no, Elizabeth cried. Be silent when you speak to me so? Never! Happy tears welled in her eyes. She drew his hands to her lips and kissed them. Keep speaking, my darling Will. Keep saying these wondrous things. Laughing with relief, he stood and drew her into his arms, lifting her off her feet and whirling her around. You will, my Lizzie? You truly will marry me? Yes, yes, a thousand times yes, she cried in return, and he set her down before taking her face gently between his hands and kissing her with the greatest tenderness and love imaginable. The End This has been Infamous Relations, written by Catherine Bilson, narrated by Catherine Bilson. Copyright 2016 by Catherine Bilson. Production Copyright 2019 by Catherine Bilson. If you have enjoyed this work, please check out more of my work at catherinebilson.com.